Presentation. Okay, good morning everybody. Thank you all for being here today. And uh, my name is Giovanni Punzi, who knows, doesn't know me. And on behalf of the organizers, I would like to welcome you to this workshop on uh, the landscape of uh, flavor physics towards the high intensity era. This is the tenth in a series of workshops that have been uh, initially uh, devoted to B physics, but then kind of enlarged to include uh, most of flavor physics essentially. But each of these meetings has been devoted to a specific topic. And uh, today, this topic we thought uh, it was appropriate uh, to the special time we are living here after the discovery of the Higgs and the uh, big discovery and uh, not having a clear named target to come afterwards. The only thing that is clear to most of us is that uh, uh, we are going to have, uh, after the step up in energy that we are going to have soon at LHC, we will have some, quite some time before there is an increase in energy, in the maximum energy reachable again. And so we expect there will be a period of time where high precision measurements and the high intensity beams will be important. And so this is uh, the reason that uh, motivated us to this, uh, this theme. And so we think that in this era, actually, flavor physics might become even more important than it has been in the past. So it's a good time to get together, experimentalists and theorists, and uh, think about what are the possible scenarios that we can have in future, and also scenarios we can create ourselves with what we do. So it's a very good uh, time to do these kind of things. And so this is why we are here this year. We are uh, in Pisa, and uh, thanks to the nice uh, hospitality of Scuola Normale, who hosted us in this place, and uh, to the persons from Scuola Normale who helped uh, having all of this work, which is Michael Morello, which is now will give you some uh, more information about uh, this meeting. Thanks, Giovanni. Uh, okay, many thanks and welcome to PISA, to Scuola Normale, uh, for coming here and joining us to this meeting, as Giovanni uh, explained very well the goal and the scope of the meeting. Just on. Okay, I just uh, prepared a couple of slides to give a short overview, very, very short, don't worry, overview about uh, the program of the workshop and uh, some logistic information, as you can imagine, they are important. <laughs> and uh, also I would expand a few words about uh, Scuola Normale and the connection of Scuola Normale with France. Uh, I remember this meeting is jointly organized by physicists from uh, French and uh, uh, Italy. And uh, maybe some of you already, knows that, uh, already know that Scuola Normale as formerly founded from, uh, by Napoleone, by Na Napoleon in October 1810, uh, two centuries uh, ago. And uh, at that time, the Tuscany was uh, a province of the French emperor. Uh, the Swan Normale was born as a, as a branch of the Paris Ecole Normale Supérieure. Uh, Okay, so maybe this is much better. And uh, okay, uh, I couldn't find better words to, to, to explain this concept, but uh, the, 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 as you can imagine, the, the name Normale, the word Normale derives directly from uh, Ecole Normale, from Paris, and uh, this refers to the mission, sorry if I read the slides, but uh, I couldn't find better words, and the mission of the school, which is was the trained middle and high school teachers able to convey norms, rules, in a context where the training teachers was still strongly connected to form citizen loyal the laws and the emperor. Let me uh, say that maybe the spirit is still the spirit of school and normale. Of course, things are a little bit different now because uh, today's uh, 
the two centuries uh, were done uh, and in particular nowadays the Scuola Normale is uh, a small institute uh, which accepts uh, about 30 students a year, uh, which uh, these students are selected with a very strong competition and we have uh, over, uh, on overall about 700 applications each year and at the end the aim is more or less the same which is the formation of scholars, professionals and citizens with wide cultural background and with strong critical attitude. And uh, just to give you an idea, former students from Suona Normale in high energy physics uh, were uh, Enrico Fermi and Carlo Rubia that we know uh, very well. Uh, okay, just a very short overview about the program, what uh, we are going to, to present in this uh, two days workshop. Okay, the first session, chaired by our colleagues and friend Luca Trentadue is uh, dedicated to the current status of flavor physics from the theoretical point and here you can see the list of speakers and title of the talks. Instead on the, in the afternoon, ses afternoon session we will have uh, the, the end of a short end of a view about uh, current experimental status and near-term prospect. Near-term prospect means uh, uh, everything uh, before 2025. Uh, sorry if I use this jargon, this means the phase one of LHC, but of course uh, this refers to whole experiments in heavy flavor physics. Uh, tomorrow morning we have a third session in which uh, we are going to give uh, uh, an overview uh, from uh, experimental point of view uh, on the long term uh, of flavor physics uh, and uh, this means after 2025 and uh, sorry if I use again this jargon this means phase 2 of LHC but of course it, it refers to uh, all experiment in heavy flavor physics and in the end our uh, friends theoretician will, will give us uh, an overview about uh, the guidelines for the future, for future flavor physics experiment. Uh, okay, of course I have to provide you some uh, logistic information. I would I invite you to give a, a, a uh, to take a look to the web page of the workshop, are important these two links. They are very important these two links here, in which you can find logistic information. In particular, in the first link, you can find the instruction to the web wireless connection. Uh, the SSID is SN meeting, and the password is meeting nine. There is no space here. Sorry for the. Uh, for these typos. Uh, of course there is also a DROM, uh, but I strongly suggest to use the first one. <laughs> and uh, uh, today the workshop will be held here in the Sala Azzurra with this amazing room. Uh, and tomorrow, mo tomorrow morning and afternoon the workshop will be held uh, just upstairs in uh, Aula, downstairs in the uh, Aula Bianchi, sorry. Uh, lunch will be served in the cafeteria of Scuola Normale. Here you can see uh, the map. And we will have a social dinner this evening at a uh, restaurant out of Pisa. Uh, okay, just the coffee break will be served on the third floor, the same floor of this room, uh, in the south side of Palazzo of Caravana. Here we are here. And uh, just uh, instruction for lunch, because the lunch will be served to the cafeteria and in the package you get to the registration desk, you'll find instruction and in particular the badge number and the pin number which are uh, which needed to enter in the cafeteria and the lunch with uh, us. Uh, okay, I've done and uh, enjoy, enjoy the meeting and uh, I will give the, the the word to Luca is going to chair the first session dedicated to the current uh, um, theoretical flavor physics overview. Okay. Let's start with uh, the first speaker, Giulia Ricciardi, University of Naples, who will tell us about the state of this AM paradigm. Le slides è qui. Sì, aspetta che devo chiamare. Sì, sì, vorrei solo vedere come funziona. Sì, sì, grazie. Sì, forse anche prima.
Cosa c'è messo? Va bene, questo qui. Ok. Ok, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this interesting workshop and uh, I feel home at Scuola Normale, which I'm very happy to be here also because I have very nice memory of my studies here and also connected to these events that happened in this room. And I will talk about the CKM matrix, and especially I will talk about a few parameters. The CKM matrix modulus is uh, um, more or less known with this percentage of er a relative error. The VUD is the modulus, the best known parameters in this matrix that I depicted here in the modulus matrix, 10 to the minus fourth, closely followed by VUS. All the other parameters are more or less known at the per different level or percentage, with the exception of VUB modules, which is the least known parameters reaching 1%. And in my talk, I will focus about the, these two modules where still we have a long-standing tension between the determination of these two parameters from inclusive and exclusive decays. VCB and VUB module are crucial, para crucial parameters of the CKM matrix. First of all, they are important parameters of the unitarity triangle, VCB, constitutes the normalization of the unitary triangle while one side is VUB, but they are also quite important for assessment of new physics scenarios. In fact, sometimes it's forgotten that even if VUB and VCB are extracted by three-level decays, which are generally considered not affected by new physics, they are really important in, other, in determination of other parameters like epsilon k or branch iteration of rare on Cowan decays, which are dependently, dependent strongly at the actual level of precision from the precise value of UB and VCB. And here you can see an example of how precision determination of this, some of these parameters <coughs> changes while changing VUB and VCB. So it's particularly important, I would like to stress, it's particularly important at the current level of precision to have also an adequate knowledge of UB and VCB module. The VCB determination has been performed from exclusive decays at the most precisely level from semi-leptonic decays in particular from B that goes into the D star, L nu. Exclusive decays are in the massless lepton limits, have a branch, uh, differential branching ratio which are proportional to the product of uh, the CKM matrix parameter and uh, form one single form factor. Here, omega is the momentum transferred to the leptonic pair, while eta EW is an electromagnetic correction, perturbative correction factor. Here C is a form factor, is a phase space factor, and you can see that these differential ratios are proportional to a difference of omega square and one, which means that they are vanishing at zero recoil point. 
This is unfortunately because this means that we can take a data in this region, but we would have preferred the zero recoil region where we have a heavy mass symmetry which allows us to say that in this limit the two four factor are equal and equal to the Isgur Y function which is normalized to one. So in this limit the new the non-perturbative correction are limited to one over m over the heavy mass correction, which in the case of B that goes into this star, starts by the Lux, the so-called the Lux theorem to one over m squared. And this introduces, of course, in determination of a, of a form factor at uh, zero recoil, another source of uncertainty, which is the extrapolation of the point where this product is experimental determined to the point where the form factor is theoretically calculated. Lattice calculation has been performed practically from the beginning from one, from one group, the Fermi Lab Milk Collaboration. The lattice unquenched result and f equal to 1 have given this value this year, is the mo most recent value from this collaboration, and doesn't differ too much from the previous value which was in 2009, the average value is more or less the same for the extraction of ECB, but the error is very, very small this year. On the error budget, you can see, which is reported here, that the lattice error for the first time is comparable to the experimental error, while other errors are negligible and the QED among the smaller error is the more determinant. In the QCD error, the largest error comes from discretization and they are estimated in this, by this collaboration by taking the difference between heavy quark effective theory, the extription of lattice gauge theory and QCD. An important progress is the inclusion of another determination in this, another collaboration in this business. Unfortunately, the results are only an FN equal to two and are still in preliminary. They are in agreement anyway with the Fermilab milk collaboration, but they are done in a different framework, trying to get the maths at a realistic finite value. This is, as I said, all these, are, these results are at a zero recoil point. And unfortunately, they are a no recoil point. There are only quenched results in a very, very, very old, the, done with a step scaling method, which is an alternative to heavy quark effective theory. <coughs> For B, that goes, that goes into D instead, unquenched calculation have been made available this year, also non zero recall. That means in the full kinematic region last year. As you can see, and as expected, a, a non-zero recoil, the errors are still quite large, but in agreement with results coming from the same collaboration for the B that goes into this star. You can see that the error is much larger and also has been tested against the zero recoil approximation and also the zero recoil result and also find in agreement. There are two ways to improve, two main ways to improve this error here. One is using world average of experimental data, they have used a limited set, and taking better care of larger systematic error at large omega. And another way, which is actually in progress as some preliminary result has been published, is to reduce the larger source of uncertainty that's given by heavy quark discretization error. So some work is in progress in this field. And also there are news from light constant rules. In B and D star, in the case of B that goes into D star, recent calculation incorporates now higher order effects and also estimate in elastic correction. They give a form factor at zero recoil, which is essentially compatible with the lattice but has a much larger theoretical error. It's more than twice theoretical error while projected on VCB. Another 
progress is the, uh, this last year, the last, this year is that uh, OPE power correction up to the order 1 over 5 neglecting QCD, co neglecting perturbative correction, the matrix element has been estimated by ground state saturation up to this order. On the contrary, in the case of B that goes into D, the calculation are stopped at 2004 when Ralsef and collaborators afterwards devised the so-called BPS limit where heavy flavor symmetry hold at whole orders. In this point, it was able to calculate it at zero recoil, the factor G1, the form factor G1, and this method allows to a much smaller uncertainty. Now experimental plus theoretical error is comparable with the lattice error. In the the light consum rules, the results are consistently lower than with the lattice, that means a higher VCB. The prospect lies on the experimental progress and a lot of hopes are put on Bell to estimate the average error on VCB that a 70, a 75 is about 1%. And, uh, I would like to underline, this is uh, an old question, that there is hard statistics for B that goes into this side, I always underline this, which is uh, a pity that we cannot exploit in, the, in its full glory because uh, of this neutrino here. A B factor is a fully reconstruction of B or conjugate helps measurement in presence of missing neutral particles. So this large amount of data is uh, actually not very useful for our determination, which is a pity. Another prospect is to use uh, the B sub S that goes into this S, because this is more affordable lattice, because the light spectator is, of course, fixed to his known mass, and no extrapolation in the light quark mass as needed. And this is already a process in course of study by a modification of step scaling method by ATM collaboration, which has given an agreement uh, results last year in agreement with some rule data. Let's pass to the determination of inclusive decays. B that goes into XCL new where the final state is an inclusive one. We adopt theoretically a completely different techniques is adopted and which is important because the techniques are to the highest stand uncorrelated, so understanding the difference between them gives a physical understanding of the theory. And it used a heavy quark expansion that works for sufficient inclusive quantities like a total width of first moment of kinematical distributions, of course away from perturbative singularities. Then we get a double series in the QCD parameter alpha s and inverse of heavy mass. And this expansion roughly delineated here, roughly sketched here, is, uh, allows uh, to separate short distance and long distance contribution. The short distance contribution are taken into account by the short distance effect are taken into account by coefficient, while the long range dynamics is encoded in the matrix element of the operators. This matrix element of operators in terms can be parametrized by universal non-perturbative parameters which have the disadvantage of growing at higher order of the inverse of the heavy mass. So after a certain extent you cannot calculate them but you have to estimate them Another thing I would like to underline is that when you go to higher order, you also need to take into account correction to the inverse of the MC mass. In fact, thanks to this roughly, this rough formula here, correction at higher order of MB dot MC becomes comparable to, to powers of MB. Which is the status? Summarizing, there have been completed alpha square correction to Leiden term that, as you can see here, is the Parton model, has been completed. But uh, the novelty or novelty of the last two years is that have been completed also the correction to the power suppressed coefficients. That means the alpha square lambda square over MB correction. As I said before, since you have to parametrize the, the non-perturbative parameters at higher order, there has been uh, 
novelty also in this, is, in this respect, working at three level has been computed and estimated the correction up to the order 1 over mp5 to the 5. Once we have all this theory, we put everything in a global fit, which is a simultaneous fit to these parameters, to these non-perturbative parameters, plus quark masses, plus VCB. And we measure about, with and all available hadron and lepton momentum, there are about 70 measurements available. Most of them are given by the B factories. And the latest fits, about a few years, like almost 10 years, are in the kinematic scheme now, and they incorporate, I cannot see the pointer anymore. Okay, I find it. I find it behind the, the, the screen, okay. But not on the screen. Anyway, they incorporated the six non-perturbative parameters, and uh, the latest HFAG fig includes next next to leading correction and giving this value here. Very, very recently, there is uh, another calculated, another um, estimated OVCB, which includes also the, the new calculated power corrected terms I said before, alpha s lambda square over mv square. The, uh, the tool results are compatible, but the errors is pushed below actually 2%. So this is my summary of VCB, and you can see several determination which I try to explain from the unquenched older determination to the very recent 2014 uh, lattice determination and this is the same for B that goes into D and these are the two h uh, uh, kinetic scheme determination I showed before and uh, we co can compare also with indirect fit by the two leading groups UT fit and CKM fitter which, as you can see, there is uh, this tension between inclusive and exclusive determination of ECB, which dies and resurrected in the last years, and this year has resurrected again, actually, it's up to 2.96 2 uh, disagreement. It depends, of course, on which value you take, but if you take the latest result in the inclusive and exclusive the case, you get 2.9 disagreement. Okay, now I would like to talk about uh, low mass open charm spectrum. Mm -hmm. This is important also in the view of what I said before, because higher mass charm scales are also background events for B that goes into this star. And the status, experimental status uh, is well known. You have the four status, you have a, a constituent quark models they can uh, described by L, by the angular momentum between the degrees of heavy and light degrees of freedom, and you have the zero and the star zero, which are well established, of course, by PDG, but also L will equal one. The two states with narrow widths are well established, but the two states with large widths have uh, created some problems. Recently, there have been also experimentally some candidates for radial excitation and L is equal to excited states. In the heavy quark limit, heavy and light degrees of freedom decouple, so the P-wave meson can be grouped into two doublets. This is uh, the degrees of freedom of light quarks. So you have a three-half and one-half doublet according to JL. Two are the one, as I said, with narrow width, about 20, 30, and the other one with too large width. And uh, the experimentally, the large width dominates over na narrow width states. But if you consider some roles plus heavy quark theory, quark models, a lot of most popular models, this is not confirmed. So theoretically, there is one problem as a first puzzle of this uh, high mass spectrum, the so-called one half versus three half puzzle. There have been devices in many, many ways to solve this problem. I would just mention that it could be potentially large contribution by the newly observed newly recognized these their states. And this is also important because assess the relevance of the infinite mass limit approach in BS because the CDK. In progress, there are lattice studies with early sick charm mass. Last two years have been already some preliminary result. Another puzzle for this kind of spectra is that the branching ratio for inclusive B that we see is not saturated by a sum of exclusive BF. This is the so-called gap puzzle. In fact, the decays into this star 
make up 70% of total inclusive and the case on to the star pi make up 15%, so it leaves a gap of about 15%. But the IHEP Bavaria has presented some preliminary result and assigning about 0.7% to be the star pi pi L new production, the significance of this gap reduced from seven sigma to three sigma, so probably this gap is also with the definitive experimental result is probably destined to be closed experimentally. Another tension I would like to underline that I'm discussing today is the tension that uh, for semileptonic decays into heavy leptons. Babar last year has shown that there is a tension with respect to the determination of the standard model when you take the ratio B that goes into this star tau nu and B that goes into D the branching ratio. With respect to this standard model determination the tension is 2 and 2.7 sigma respectively which combined gives 3.4 sigma. As you can see from this the data, although with smaller error, are compatible both with the previous Babar data and with Bell data. And if you combine actually with Bell results, it's even larger, it goes to 3.4 sigma. Okay, so this is clued types 2, 2x double model charge X boson with 99.8 confidence level, the region with the X mass, charge X mass less than 10 G were already excluded by BS measurement. So this is, this is estimated of form factor for every quark, the, every quark FTT or a quench QCD. So this seems to point to a very large 30% a new physical breaking of lepton flavor universality as there's been a lot of frame, theoretical framework testing tested and recently there's been a paper where even also this uh, is constrained, this uh, model aligned to X double model has been constrained by this measurement. You see, but I will, but Using unquenched lattice for air, the tension lessened a bit. With a recent result from a Fermilab milk, if you use unquenched result from lattice. Moreover, there have been two determinations, two re-evaluation of standard model determination that reduced its tension as well. So what is, this is for B that goes into D. It is important to have the, the results for B that goes into D star that have to yet to be carried out. And also, Something I would like to point out that it would be also important a reanalysis of data with a 20% more full data set of Bell because what happened in the case of leptonic case when you had the partial result, you had a still a tension with a standard model with a new tracking and new adrenaline fault data set, this year the tension is almost disappeared. So Bell update with full data set anyway is expected soon. So the VUB exclusive determination is traditionally extracted by this decay. There is in this case in the massless limits one seven one form factor. And the usual uh, non-perturbative theoretical prediction are usually confined to different regions. The light consum rules uh, help us in the low Q square region because the OP is near the light cone in this region, while the lattice is, uh, works more effectively at larger Q square to avoid larger discretization error. And there is a, the lattice generally gives a better fit with data. But now there are also new players in this game, the precision measurement and the precision, increasing precision in theoretical calculation is making this decays into rho and into omega almost starting to become competitive with the traditional extraction from B that goes into pi. And uh, since I have uh, two minutes, I will discuss, I will pass to inclusive UB, which has uh, the same description of inclusive with the CB, but with an important, very important difference. There is a large B2C background, which needs experimental face cut that re to reduce background that makes the importance of the so-called threshold region much more important than in the case in VCB. So the, in this region, the final granulation is strongly inhibited. There is a perturbative expansion of spectra affected by large logarithms to be resummed. And there are also more important non-perturbative effects. So there is a difference in this case, which, um, uh, which requires a different treatment. I will 
since the time is running, I will just flash the VUB determination status, what it is now. These are the exclusive decays that I discussed before in the lattice and the else life consum rules. There is a, this is the most recent analysis with a Bayesian analysis made by Manel and collaborator. And these are indirect fit that I took from the website today. You can see if you take um, inclusive decays, I just mentioned four collaborations that have been examined throughout by HFAG, Babar and Bell and give compatible results within the error. And these are completely different methods. In particular, these first two are based on the so-called shape function abstraction and trying to find parameters also in non-universality cases and these other two are based on non-perturbed anal analytical properties of the amplitude and this is the exclusive average taking this four determination made by Babar and you can see that the tension that has been with us in the past year is still alive with different level of Vitality, according to which determination you want to trust, but more or less around the three sigma if you want to be pessimistic even more. So this is the status of VUB, and uh, since my time is finished, I have the compliments of the chairman to finish uh, on time. Some conclusions, which are kind of self-evident from what I discussed today. There have been significant advances in experiments, so I don't share the pessimistic view that is so dominant in this period. There's, I believe there have been actually significant advances in this field. Think about the phase space in inclusive decays. We have almost 90% claim the phase space in inclusive decays, which is with the cuts that have, is an important result. There have been a new decays revealed for the statistic, there have been the inclusion of this new player, there are decays into tau even more, more and more precisely measured, and LACB will give more result, and Bell 2 will start in 2016, which will give an incredible precision in this, for instance, in VUB and VCB determination. Moreover, theory has not been looking at this, there has been a significant reduction of lattice QCD error, you believe it or not is another story, but still there is published a significant reduction. New groups are starting to check this calculation. There has been also a lot of theoretical work on light consum rule, and the new physics is almost more and more constrained. I regard as a particularly interesting the idea of of saying this model is no more with us, which is a statement that I don't hear very often, because there is always some parameters that uh, escapes. Unfortunately, VUB and VCB is still confirmed. There have been studies that claims that this difference cannot come from new physics, so probably we have to put our brain at work to find something more interesting for this determination on the theoretical side. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Are there questions, comments? When discussing the VCP, you briefly mentioned the Pisa Besti case. Uh, actually, uh, at LACB, I mean, there is the possibility of exploding baryon decay, semileptonic decay. Semileptonic case of B barions. Uh, can you comment on what is the. Yeah, uh, there's the, been the, the, a proposal that to, to explore this decay. So, that's are also very interesting. The reason I didn't include is uh, just for brevity and also because of their difficult experimental difficulties, I guess. But if you say that they are feasible, this is a very good news. From the theoretical point of view, can you expect uh, the uncertainty at the same level as the other ones, or smaller, larger? They are only very, in principle, yes, yes. If you, I mean, there have been very 
few studies right now. There is essentially one paper, one or two papers on this subject. So it's more about the feasibility than about the precision. But they are certainly interesting. I mean, mostly, I mean, you can get quite... Uh, the problem is the form factors. It's not yet... I mean, you cannot compare with what uh, is already been done for the meson decay. But this is uh, certainly worth exploring. In this, I mean, in this uh, scenario, we cannot really <laughs> allow to be too discriminant about... Just about the discrepancy between VUB and VCB uh, determination on inclusive and exclusive, you said it could not be uh, explained by new physics. No, I didn't say that. No, but there was an argument about VUB yeah, and VCB, and I think uh, in case of VCB it's not correct. I think they haven't uh, written a erratum yet, but I think uh, that it was discussed in on another place already. I've been studied that claims this, but uh, I know about unpublished studies and uh, also probably other studies already published that Tursiek, uh, I think, is doing something like that. Uh, okay. to uh, or because we, we're starting accepting this as a, a law of physics that we have this discrepancy. Now, uh, you have any ideas where you would start where? to explore? To, to get rid of this uh, discrepancy, because you just, sh I get shown this discrepancy for years and uh, nobody tells me what could be a, a possible solution, a speculative solution. Uh, very kind, but if I had a solution, I, I wouldn't be <laughs> But another one. <laughs> More interesting, I guess. Other questions? Comments? In your opinion, is there any experimental handle that one could use at Bell 2 to probe the correctness of the models uh, that have been used for the inclusive uh, VUB determination? I think if you go to 1%, you should pinpoint the differences between the two determination. And whatever they do is fine. Do you think that they will reach it? Sure. <laughs> <clears throat> there are no more questions or comments. Let us thank uh, Julia again. <clears throat> so now, Tobias Hurt will tell us about the rare BD case. Uh, for invitation to this workshop. Um, because it's a workshop, I just want to invite you to interrupt me at any time, right? So don't wait to the end. It would be probably uh, more interesting because you forget about it and I think uh, please feel free to interrupt me at any time, right? That's important. Okay. I was asked to speak about rare beta case. I, uh, uh, okay. Uh, I focus on uh, B sub SB mu and on radiative and subleptonic penguin decays, and also pick up some recent uh, deviations on lepton non universality and possible correlations between BSLL and BSS in new um, decays. So, when we speak about new physics at, in flavor, we first have to go back to the Stunner model and just remind ourselves that uh, we have no guiding principle in the flavor sector to understand. Oh, I think it's dead. 
Oops, no, this should not happen. There we are. Whoops. Because <laughs> I... Now we are back. Okay. But this doesn't work. Do you have another pointer? No. Then I, I probably use this one, huh? Okay. That's probably better. So we have no guiding principle to understand the hierarchy uh, of the uh, flavor parameters and uh, that is one point, so there's no guiding principle like in the uh, gauge sector where we understand well the different uh, couplings uh, of the gauge groups. And the other problem is that we do not understand how new physics hide from the flavor data. And uh, if you parameterize new physics with higher dimensional operators, we know that there is a kind of ambiguity here because we can think of that these couplings are small or that the new physics scale is very high. I don't know, I need. Ah, oh, no, you have that. I see. Okay. It works? I see. Should, should push just, just a little bit further. further. Here. Okay, I see. Ah. You can see that? No. Oh, we have a better one? That would be nice. Can anybody see that? You can see it, but probably nobody else. In the, uh, no chance for the backbenchers, right? Uh, <laughs> if you have another one, oh, I can use here the hardware stick. No, I. Okay, I use the hardware thing. Uh, okay, so let's go back to this. So I think that is too uh, this ambiguity here in our new physics search for the interpretation. How, why new physics hide from the flavor data. So these are the two points we, we know well. Now, just uh, some implications from the last latest measurements of B sub S mu mu. I think that was one of the highlights at the APS conference in 2013. The first observation of B sub S mu mu, uh, and also uh, this measurement here from B0 mu plus B minus, which are still nicely here, compatible again as we know from LECB data, compatible with the LEC, uh, with the standard model predictions. Oh, now we get this one. Okay. That better for you? Not at all. So then, then I, I go on with that one. Okay, that's good. Uh, so uh, there was a corresponding effort now on the series side, and that's what I want to talk about. Uh, to reduce the perturbative uncertainty of 7%. And that was done by updating a, an old analysis from the 90s to the next and next new order QCD corrections, uh, and also the electric weak corrections which were calculated in the, 90, at the end of the 90s were now updated by this group here, and this gentleman is also here, uh, to the complete electric weak corrections at the next new order level. And if you now compare experiment in theory, it's nicely compatible with each other, but you see that theory uh, took a hat uh, in front of the experiment. But in both an experiment and the theory, there are uh, improvements uh, in front of us. Now let us look at the error budget. We see here the non-parametric error is 1.5%. This includes the mu dependence. If you look at this, what the scale dependence tells us, uh, this is the Wilson coefficient here, which enters the B sub S mu mu, and you see it tells us something about the next order which you have not calculated. When you, ha when you have the leading order, you see a strong dependence on the mu dependence, indicating that the next leading order contribution is very large. Then we go to the next leading order, you see that is the variation is strongly uh, reduced, and now the next next lean order contribution was established, and you see it's almost a flat curve. So it means that the next order, which we do not have calculated yet, is at the 1.5% level. So I think that's the end of this analysis. What is left over is here the VBC. I think there's also an uh, improvement possible in the future. It was this 4%, and of course, CKM will always improve with new measurements. Uh, we know the implications very well. In the standard model, you have a helicity uh, suppression, and that's, therefore you have through, for example, in the MSSM, through our scalar our Higgs bosons, uh, dependent on tangent beta at the third power. And uh, this implies, for example, very strong constraints on the constraint MSSM. Here you look at the fermionic mass, and here the scalar mass. You have only these four point uh, five parameters in the constraint MSSM, and you see the direct surge here from Atlas, 
and you here see uh, Hicks uh, discovery uh, and this is the only thing area which is still allowed and you see at tangent beta of 40 uh, B sub S mu mu is the most dominating R constraint on those two parameters. But this changes already, and I think that you should keep in mind when you go down to tangent beta 20, which is still large. Then, of course, in the flavor sector, P K mu mu, that's the red one, and B to S gamma play a uh, more dominant role. And in this case, uh, the director is just definitely better off. Okay, let's go to radiative semilotonic penguin decays. Uh, we know we have to deal in, in general uh, with rare decays with short distance physics and long distance physics. We want to separate this. How we do this, we work with electroweak effective Hamiltonian, where we integrate out the top at the W and also now the Higgs boson and uh, separate the physics in Wilson coefficients where possible new physics can enter and into operators which are just governed by QCD. And we have to see how we can calculate hydronic matrix elements. Uh, we do that in inclusive modes, uh, like B to S gamma or B uh, X L plus or minus, by using the heavy mass expansion. Uh, we know well that the B to S gamma decay rate is well approximated by the tonic decay rate. Here I have illustrated that for B X S L plus or minus, a very complicated uh, decay. However, the photonic decay describes this in the first order very well, and Q2 equation of motions, non-perturbative corrections enter only at the quadratic level. So it looks like that perturbative contributions are definitely dominant. There is an old story that if one goes beyond the leading order, which is O7 in case of Peter's gamma and O9 in case of P sub XS or plus or minus, then there is a breakdown of this local expansion. I mean here the heavy mass expansion. And then I have non-local operators at lambda over MB. However, there was a a dedicated analysis on those non local contributions, which told us that this is well below 10%, which is a good news. And this is just work in progress to do the same analysis also for BXS or plus or minus, which is definitely important. Now, uh, latest improvement on inclusive BXS plus or minus were the calculation of the electromagnetic corrections, which we have done. And this is corrections which have to do with large coll collinear logs of the form MB over M left tone. And this gives you a difference in the electron channel and the muon channel, and that's the only reason for this. So we get corrections at the 2 or 5% level in the low Q-squared region. However, the effect comes from the fact that we're looking at restricted parts of the D-lepton uh, spectrum. If you would integrate over the whole D-lepton spectrum, you would, these logs would vanish. It means that you get a larger effect in the high Q-squared region where the Brownian ratio is smaller. Okay? Uh, let's go to the uh, experimental situation. Until very recently, that I would say until uh, December last year, the only bell and bar, bar, bar measurements which were on the market <coughs> were based on 30% of the data set uh, which were provided by bell and bar, bar machines or experiments. And uh, that was now updated by the Barbara analysis. There was a final word of Barbara was given, but we are still waiting for the final word of Bell. So everything what I say now in the future when I use P sub LL data is based on this analysis. There was an attempt to match the forward-backward asymmetry in the Bell analysis, but I think that is definitely not a very conclusive analysis yet. Now, uh, when you look at this, uh, now uh, this new zero analysis, of course, has in mind now the super uh, B experiment. And uh, we are looking here now, it's a differential, double differential decay rate of B sub S plus or minus. <coughs> so we have two observables, uh, two parameters here. We have Q squared, which is the d lepton mass, but we have Z, which is cosine theta, which is the angle between the charged leptone and the B mesone uh, three momenta in the d lepton rest frame. So, and then you see that you have three coefficients here two combined to the well-known D-lepton uh, spectrum, and the other one is just the forward-backward asymmetry. And you know well that we have a low Q-squared region and a high Q-squared region, maybe, which is perturbatively dominated, and you cut out the Shamonium region out of this. And uh, what we have done is, or we just publish or will publish soon, is that we look at these three coefficients separately, and the reason for this is that they have all three very different dependencies on the Wilson coefficients and are different uh, 
ways where possible new physics can enter, right? So I think it's definitely important to look at three uh, independent uh, coefficients in this double differential decay rate. This is our input parameters, and I think regarding the perturbed expansion, it's well known that you get already um, uh, large locks independently of QCD. Um, that's what I want to say. What we get in all three cases, we look at the collinear photons, <coughs> which give rise to these lock-enhanced QED corrections. Uh, what happens is, and that is important, that the higher powers, uh, or the QED corrections, introduce higher powers of that in the double differential decay rate, so you have to make a redefinition of these coefficients. Let's go back to this. Uh, you see it's only the set second power here which enters and now you get higher powers in set in the double, double differential decay rate. So you can think of just to measure those higher powers of set to be sensitive for only QD, uh, QD observables but that does not work as we have learned from the super KP people. Now the size of the locks depend on the experimental side set up if you just look at the D-lepton momenta or you include some collinear photons in your setup. So we are just assuming that no photons enter this Q squared. And that is somehow the super KB setting. And however, for Barbar that was not true. They look at the D-electron channel and allow photons in the measurement in the cone of 35 m rate angular opening. So we have to correct for this. And I think we have done it on our own. Looked mainly it was uh, Enrico Lunghi who became a Barbar member for some time and were running the um, Barbara Monte Carlo and find out that the corrections, this is what the measurement and this is our predictions, that there is a correction of 1.6% or in the high Q squared tradition of 6.8%. Uh, when we had the Barbara Monte Carlo in our hands, we made now a validation of our theory predictions, right? That's I showed you before. This is somehow the electromagnetic corrections, which somehow sum up to zero when you integrate over the whole uh, D-lepton spectrum. And we just use the Monte Carlo now. Uh, of Barbar. Here we have K star, K, and then the continuum. You see that the relative uh, sizes do not matter so much, only in the high Q squared region. And then we came out with this prediction from the Monte Carlos, and I think it's, uh, I would say, uh, we were surprised that it's so nicely compatible with our theory predictions, right? So we have done this analysis without photos here, because we did not include any electromagnetic uh, photons here. Uh, and then you should just reproduce with the Monte Carlo our theory predictions, which was rather convincing. So it, at the, I would say, 20% level, we got the same result out. Now, uh, the forthcoming analysis, uh, yeah, give you some numbers in the low Q squared region, now including the electromagnetic corrections that was known before. With new uh, input parameters, we get a very good agreement with the standard model. That's not true for the high Q squared region. As we all know, it's more problematic. Uh, we can only look at integrated observables. We had a two sigma higher than the standard model. However, we have large errors, and I think there was a proposal by Ligeti Chuckman to look at the normalization with BXLU L nu with the same uh, cuts, which probably exponentially is uh, problematic, but on the series side, you get rid of all one over B corrections in this case. And then you see, then you get error bars also in the high Q squared region at the, somehow at the 10% level. But that, of course, uh, one needs here uh, exactly this measurement. And then it's a case for what is, then, uh, if one really gains something. And this I told you already, this is work in progress to look at these non-local contributions. And probably that is the last slide on this uh, about the different results in these two bins. And you should keep in mind you're still left over with five or eight percent uh, scale dependence. Now come back to the ex uh, exclusive modes and we have to think about it, well, how you calculate uh, hydronic maximums in this case. And you see normally people did that by just by form factors, parameterizing our unknowledge. However, we learn from QCD factorization that there are non-factorizable contributions which cannot be described by form factors. And that was a formula given just in the leading order in, uh, in lambda over b, and there were lambda b corrections which were not described theoretically. Then there was an, another input here by Charles and company uh, that there are relations on these form, soft form factors in this large energy limit. However, the main limitations come here from the lambda OB corrections, which are not known in this formula. And there were a lot of work on this, phenologically, 
um, how to look at the possible ratios where those contributions properly cancel out. Uh, this is the kinematics. It's much richer chronology. You have four uh, different angles here involved, and besides the Q squared, the d-lepton mass, uh, and uh, you describe now the different coefficients in this differential decay rate depending on the helicity amplitudes. And what we did here, uh, in specific case, we looked now at observables where the form factor dependences cancels out for all Q squared. Uh, at the leading order. So only as a subleading order, form factor dependencies would come in. However, we are left over with the lambda B corrections, which we just add by hand, uh, assume here on the amplitude level 5 or 10%. But these are not real errors, they are just handmade, right? One should keep that in mind. And you see here that was done in 2008. We have here Q squared dependence of two. Uh, angular observables which we proposed. This is the theory prediction with these 5 or 10 percent error, which are definitely is a dominating one. The rest is almost eliminated, and this is uh, experimental measurement, assuming a specific SUSY scenario, which unfortunately is already ruled out, but it was not ruled out in 2008, of course. And this is just assuming here 10 versus Fentobarn, so that was the last, uh, the, the previous uh, LHCB run, first run. As, uh, luminosity. And you see, I think when you look at this, you can see, oh, there is a chance to separate new physics from uh, the standard model predictions. Uh, that was somehow the hope. Even if you have these lambda V corrections, even if they're 20 percent, you could think of, oh, there is a chance to separate this, even in this exclusive mode. Uh, and that was done then in 2013. We looked at the optimized basis of clean form factor independent observables. They're all from those kind as like IT3 in 84. And this was then used also uh, by the experimentalists uh, in, of LHCB to compare with their measurements. Uh, that is just something about the definition of P5 star, because that is somehow the famous observable where the LHCB anomaly occurs, but there is nothing behind that. Now, then the first measurement came up last year in, two, in April about the forward backward asymmetry, and you, you see our bind uh, predictions, and they were nicely compatible with the LHCB measurement. And then they came up with the new angular observables, that was P5, P6, P8, and P5. And also here our bind uh, predictions were nicely compatible with the data. However, there was a 4.0 sigma deviation in the third bin of P5 star. Okay? And that was somehow based on this uh, arrow which we have given in this uh, paper. Now we have to think about it, where it could come from. Uh, it could be a statistical fluctuation, underestimation of lambda B corrections, or it could be new physics. When you think about this, you know that C7 is definitely constrained by B2's gamma. C10 is definitely uh, under control of B sub S mu mu. So somehow C9 is the only uh, leftover where possibly new physics could enter to explain this anomaly if it's new physics. So, oops. Now, I just give you some remarks on this so called LHCB anomaly. Uh, on work which I did together with Nasila and Mahmoudi. When you look at the power corrections again, I told you that was is never ever a strict theory, right? So we never calculated any error. It's just to put in by hand, right? So we put in 10%. What happens now in this case that things cancel out and on the observable level there was only a 3% error left over. And I think everybody agrees that this is definitely unrealistic. However, even if you change this now by hand, and we did that in our new analysis, if you put in the 10%, you still have a 3.6 deviation, sigma deviation from the standard model. And if you say, look, that's not enough, so we get 30%, then you still have a deviation of 2.2 sigma, right? So that's probably uh, this arrow here put in by hand, 30% is definitely enough bound for those corrections. Then there's one point one should say, this. Uh, Local bin goes up to 8.63 GeV. You can doubt that QCD defactorization can be used in this region, and specifically, you can doubt that the perturbative description of charm loop is correct here. So there could additional hydronic uncertainties coming in. There's also an issue of the charm loops, which were not fully calculated, and also the error, of, uh, the, the sign of this is not yet fixed. So that could also be another source which could explain this LSB anomaly for sure. Then there was an analysis uh, recently of factorizable power corrections, and I just take into account that 
there is also a Kuzidi factorization formula between the full Kuzidi form factor, which we have seven of, and then the soft form factors, where only two. I think that's what I told you, that in the case, uh, in the large energy limit, they're reduced to just to two form factors. And then the difference is just given here by alpha s corrections, which you can calculate, and then the uh, uh, lambda b correction. So in principle, you could calculate these lambda b corrections in the factorizable piece, it's a form factor piece, okay? You could do that. And however, the error bars on the light cone summary calculations are so large that they're only fixed here the central value for this, okay? And then, of course, then it's, again, guessing numbers, the error bars which are taken into account for this uh, quantity and for the non-factorizable piece power corrections, they only guess numbers, again, by 10 or 20 percent. So I think it's not a real improvement. Um, so the suggestion beyond guessing numbers is we're just fitting this, that's one thing, what we could do, or when takes a direct calculation of the Cousini form vectors including correlations, then you can do this at least uh, in, the, in, in one step, or one could look at uh, methods used by the analysis in analysis B to K plus or minus by Alex Kojimirin, where I looked at dispersion relations uh, and light cone sum rules, probably that would be at least a calculation of those arrow bars. Now, uh, let me jump a bit. We made an update now between inclusive and exclusive mode. So we looked at uh, constraints on C10 and C9 and, and saw if these data uh, sets are compatible with each other. If you look at K plus minus and K star mu plus or minus in the inclusive mode, only taking into account bar bar, you see there are, these constraints are nicely compatible with each other. That is uh, definitely an important result. And then there's something about future opportunities. Uh, we made our model independent analysis, made a prediction for low Q squared, high Q squared, uh, xs mu plus and minus, one, two, three, sigma. This is our theory prediction. This comes from the fully model independent analysis of BSL plus and minus data. And this uh, black cross is just the future measurement by super -CAC B based on analysis of Kevin Flood with an error bar of 5%, right? So that is very small. And the same is true here for the four backward symmetry. So uh, this has been one and been two in the low Q squared region. This is our theory prediction, which is one of the best you can have, ever have in flavor physics. And this is the prediction from the model independent analysis at the one, two, three sigma level. So in case this LHCB anomaly uh, persists until super keg B starts, then probably that will be definitely an important cross check if this, there are some anomalies in the data or not. Now, new physics explanations, people said, look, the usual suspect, MSM, partial competence, cannot uh, accommodate the observed quantities or deviations. However, one see that this is a statement on the one sigma level, right? So the one sigma solution really, if you only want to change C9, that is definitely not possible by these uh, uh, well-known popular models. And so therefore, people looked at set prime models at the one sigma level. But I just want to tell you that there is no problem that this LHCB anomaly can be explained at the two sigma level by the MSSM. And if you look at the overall fit, the people showed that this is compatible at the one sigma level. So that one should keep in mind. Um, so let's wait for the LHCB analysis based on the three inverse center bound data. I think that's the only thing which I could say about this. Now, two further remarks. Now, in the meanwhile, we can think about uh, another data from LHCB, which is probably most interesting. Uh, or more interesting because that is the ratio between K plus mu plus mu minus and K plus electron modes, right? So it's just a, a possible sign for lepton non-universality. And uh, you have not to deal here with power corrections so well, like in the other case, and you have a 2.6 sigma deviation from the standard model. So a lot of work on this uh, is done. We just make here some global fits just to illustrate what this could mean. The FRIT results for two operators, if you look at C9 and C10, you see here that there is this tension in C9, as we discussed before. Now, if you offer the data some non-universal operators like C9 mu and C9 electron, then you see that the problem is mainly in the muon sector, okay, if you see here. However, when you now, uh, and there's another thing which was ruled out before by other people, tendrils and scalars cannot explain this very well. Now, when you look at four operator fits, of course, it's a very uh, 
trivially a statement that if you offer only two parameters or four parameters, you get stronger constraints on the two parameters than on the four parameters. Uh, so what we did now, we tried trying to do offer the data four operators. And then you see that larger new physics contributions are allowed within the one sigma range because this is C9, C10. If you make a two operator fit, then you get these constraints. If you now look at the projected uh, constraints on C9 and C10 in our four operator fit, you see that the one sigma range is already larger, right? So but that's a trivial statement, but that is just why we made this effort to offer four operators to the fit. And what you see now is when you look at C9 and C9 prime or C9 and C10 prime, we had a chi-squared of 52 or 52 with 52 observables, right? And uh, if you make this fit now with these four operators, you get also a chi-squared of 51. So there's no real improvement. Give me just two minutes. Uh, the same, something similar, uh, different happens if you now offer a non-universal operator set, okay? What happens then? You start with C9, C9 prime, you get 52 inverse Fentabond, uh, 52 uh, chi squared, and then you have here a uh, 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 big improvement of the fit if you offer here now the non universal uh, operator set. So this somehow says, or strictly speaking, it means that if you assume that this is correct, then this fit here is ruled out by 2.6 sigma. The same has happened with the other set. Again, the non-universal extension is favored compared to the uh, universal extension. Okay, now last statement is about correlations between BSL plus and BSV nu. When you think about new physics, and we haven't found anything to a very high scale, you know that from flavor data, you can get rid of these standard effective field theory uh, where you integrate out the top the W and the Higgs, what well, Zonin says, if physics is much higher up, we can work with it an invariant effective theory where you have the full gauge invariance implemented, right? You look at the six dimensional operators in the fully gauge invariant case, which includes the SA2 left, which is not true in the standard electric um, effective theory. So you have those operators here, uh, which governs these two channels here, okay? Now, you match this on the standard electric effective theory, or nine, or nine prime, or 10, or 10 prime, and there governs here BSLL, as you know, and then you have all, all left or right, which governs just the neutrino decay, okay? And then you get the matching conditions between these two series and hope that this gauge invariant set in some introduces some correlations between these two uh, decay modes, right? So that's what you can hope for, because in the standard electric weak effective theory, you don't have this correlation at all, because there's no SE2 left invariance. However, from the new data, we know that the new physics probably enter at a much higher level, so we do not have to integrate out W, Z, and Higgs, so it makes sense to work with such a gauge invariant effective theory, and then match it on our standard one. But however, when you see this, here these are the coefficients governed by SV nu, and this is the um, C9 and C9 prime, C10 and C10 prime, you see that in the neutrino sector, these two parameters here enter with a relative sign, while in C9 and C10, you enter with a plus sign, right? It means, it's not a statement, right? Uh, that this term here is not undetermined. So if you have all BSL data here, you cannot make any statement about neutrino and neutrino, okay? So there are model, no model independent correlations via the gauge invariant operators possible. And what the people did, if you now use the mineral favorization hypothesis, for example, then you can combine, for example, K star P neutrino antineutrino with the B to K star neutrino antineutrino. There's a strict correlation in mineral favorization. And then you can see what separate variations of these gauge invariant Wilson coefficients give you, and this is somehow at the 30% level. However, you see this variations here of CZZ, CQL, and CQ1. However, if you assume this scenario here, then you have no handle on this from the BSL side, so then every value is possible. So you get no constraint on those two future parameters of uh, measurements uh, from BSL data, okay? So that is somehow the shortcome here. So the only way to get correlations if you, if you made additional assumptions, for example, that you assume that new physics only goes through flavor-changing set couplings, for example, then you can get 
correlations or predictions from the BSL data on BS neutrino, antineutrino for super KP. Or possibly in the mineral variation hypothesis to K star P neutrino, antineutrino. Okay, I think that's all I want to say. Thank you. You probably know that there has been a recent work by Zwick and Lyon showing that the non-factorizable correction to the form factor in the BD to K star mu mu can reach up to 300% corrections. And this essentially is a real showstopper for... B K star plus or minus? For BD to K star mu plus mu minus for the P5 pri prime uh, predictions. There has been a work uh, on June, you can find it on archive. The author? Key and Lion. Okay. They say it could be the non-factorizable non -factorizable CC bar uh, part can, okay. be, can reach up to 350% correction. This clearly, <laughs> essentially. Oh, you mean, whoa, this was, say the authors again. Tweaky and oh, Lion. Tweaky. Ah, I see. Okay, now, uh, that, that's difficult for me now at the moment because uh, um, yes, um, I'm not sure I, we should rely on that uh, uh, work because the point is that um, it, it, it just assumes strict factorization, naive factorization, and then makes extrapolation. So, uh, from this and describes data in, in one range is fine, but then it makes an extrapolation to the low to the low Q squared region. So, I think it's uh, probably not the best work by Roman Zwicky. So. I uh, supervise this to long thesis, but therefore I'm Maybe you very cautious with the statement, but uh, yes. I would say uh, I don't think it's reliable in the sense that because it starts with naive factorization, okay, and uh, you get this out, but uh, I'm sure I also make no statement for an upper bound on those corrections, right, but I don't think that this statement by 300 is, is uh, a reliable statement. Pietro. But I think there was a discussion on the LACB workshop on this, right? And uh, it was op openly discussed, and there was uh, Alex Kochemir, which also was uh, attacking this in, in a modest way, as, as he is, but okay. Uh, along the same lines that you okay. uh, said, uh, uh, I understand it, uh, that uh, what Zwicky said is made so uh, concrete, but it seems that it uh, if, if you do the re reverse thing, you try to extract what might come from uh, data, right. and it seems kind of compatible. Okay, it's true that uh, his theory assumptions might be a bit shaky, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I think it's a it's a, pl a place where maybe we should start looking into uh, because making assumptions of uh, errors of order 10 percent, 15 percent, and increasing it to 30 percent, yes, it gets closer and closer. But maybe. The data is telling us something different that we don't really understand QCD as well as we want to. So uh, maybe not knife factorization, but maybe it's still QCD. I agree. Yeah. So I uh, well, let's probably go back to this. Uh, it's very fast. So I, I made some uh, statements here about uh, about uh, oh, it went so too slow. About uh, this was my suggestions. Uh, Beyond guessing numbers, because I introduced this 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 game to guessing numbers, because uh, before that, 2008, people just neglected this error because we cannot do, say anything about it. So I said, look, we should make it manifest in our analysis, right? Now they were slightly misused as real error bars, but they are not error bars; they are handmade. I think that, that one should be clear about this, and and that's what I said here is. Is only about if you like, uh, take into account the full QCD form factors. Then, of course, this includes all lambda B corrections. So that would be the best way to solve this problem here. But then you are still left over with non-factorizable lambda B corrections, and then still you have to guessing numbers, right? Uh, the point is, uh, I agree, and I cannot rule out that there are 300 percent. Just the argument of, of Roman Zwicky, I think, is, is the wrong one. But um, what one also can do, and I think it was a recent work by Straub and Altmanshauser, they just try to fit it to the data, right? But then, of course, you can also get misled. I agree with you, right? They try to fit the best data. Right. They translate when it's data, and they do not match at all. Right. 
But the idea is you have a lot of observables in the game, right? What we could do is we fit the data in one range or in one or by one or two or three observables and then see if you can make predictions on others. I think then it would be more convincing, right? But I agree, it's probably not the best place. That's the reason why I'm focusing here also on the inclusive mode, because as I said, this is you know, on a much more profound uh, bio, uh, theoretical prediction possible in this area. That's definitely true, okay? Yeah, I have a comment on, on the issue you raised now. Okay. So the non-leptonic BDKs uh, uh, have very clearly shown us that one has to be very careful with the QCD factorization evaluation of loop matrix elements. Uh, penguin type matrix elements. Now, in that case, in QCD factorization, you get automatically something of order alpha strong divided by 4 pi. The power correction is lambda over MB. Now, clearly, if you compare lambda over MB with alpha over 4 pi, you find a factor maybe of 10 or maybe 100. This has been rediscovered 20 years later with a wrong argument by Zwicky. So I, I wouldn't uh, put too much emphasis on Zwicky. I would go back to the original argument that is lambda over MB corrections. Now you say it's 10% with respect to what? Because if you compare with the perturbative QCD evaluation of the charm loop, this is certainly wrong. It cannot be 10%. It might be maybe uh, 100 or maybe more percent. The important thing is that you try to quantify this with respect to all the other amplitudes, not the, the, the allowed amplitudes. This has been done, uh, so naively you would say 10%, 20% of the leading amplitudes. This is confirmed by Kojamirian that in some model dependent way, of course, uh, tries to estimate these loops. So if you compare his estimation for B2 pi pi of the charm loop with what you extract from data for B2 pi pi, he's underestimating this, okay? So this might also be true in B2k star mu mu. So what, what I think one should do is take a reasonable range for the power corrections as indicated by Kojamirian, maybe a factor of two more uh, generous uh, range because he might be underestimated that, and then fix it with the data and see if you get a reasonable fit compatibly with these sides of uh, power corrections. And the answer is yes. So I think there is no big... Uh, the point is all the, the, all the LHCB uh, data on K star to mu mu, K to mu mu, K star gamma, everything. Okay. So I think that... Uh, it's very well known that you cannot extract new physics uh, from that unless uh, someone uh, wakes up and invents a way to solve uh, this problem. Uh, you know, it's the same st story as B2K pi. Uh, yeah. I think one should say one thing. Uh, I agree with you. No, no, you maybe, uh, okay, maybe I don't want to be over pessimistic. Of course, yeah, you get more data. You can compare. Uh, you maybe, I mean, uh, you 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 have a finer binning. Uh, I mean. The more information you add, of course, the, the better uh, handle you have. No? For example, uh, um, B2 vector pseudoscalar decay modes are better because you have more observables. No, in this case, you have uh, uh, hundreds of observables, right. so it's, uh, it's fantastic. You sh we should work on that. However, we have to be careful about uh, state, uh, making sharp statements on power correction. We, it's been known for 20 years, but until you hit, uh, you know, there is an agreement, right. you, try, exactly. you tend to forget this. Okay. Yeah. Now, I fully subscribe to your statement, right? So, but of course, what you just uh, said in the beginning, I think that is done already. I think Christoph uh, also have done this. Uh, they just fitted the Lambda B corrections, right? That you can do. And now it was done by, uh, recently by Straub and, and Altmanshauser, they just assumed uh, that these charm contributions which were calculated by Kuchemirian and the one sigma range of their uh, lambda v corrections, which they assume, right? Just to get one guidance and then try to fit the data and then to compare chi-squared and the fit comes better. So you get a feeling how large the contributions are. Of course, there's one difference between B to pi pi and B to k star plus or minus because in B to pi pi, the lambda v corrections are Kyle enhanced. So they're more or less order one corrections. So there we know we need probably, when we fit to the data, we get 30 or 40 percent corrections. This we don't have here, right? So we have here k star, we have a vector. It would be different in k plus or minus, but in k star plus or minus, I think we can assume that these corrections are not at the 40 or 50 percent level. And that's not what the data tells us, right? So it fits well, right? So we, we, we just 
takes a QCD factorization formula without caring too much about lambda V corrections, and it fits well. One should also keep that in mind, right? It's not like in B2PiPi pi where you cannot fit the data with any assumption on number of B corrections at the 30% level. Here it's possible, right? So it was just one anomaly here, right? And uh, now we discuss this because we, we are looking for new physics, and I agree on your pessimistic view. Pessimistic view, it's very difficult to pin it down at that level uh, if it doesn't become a larger deviation. I agree with you. Okay. Just briefly comment on uh, the no lepton flavor uh, universality violation in this case, how much it is, and if you can compare with the uh, one in uh, semi lepton in the case B that goes into the study, the star tau. Do you think a comparison between two? Yeah. I think there is, there's no work who has taken this into account uh, together, right? Because. Uh, Sorry? It's probably a good idea to do that, to just take these different signs for non lepton yeah, uh, That's what I am asking. It's not done yet, so I think uh, probably you know better how that could be explained. If that goes in the same direction, then uh, <coughs> one can see that. But I think that's probably something which one should do, right? How much it is in percentage? 20%, 30%? I, I think I gave the number. I think, have a look. Or I give you the number of RECB. I cannot uh, do better than that. Look at the number here. So you have, uh, it should be one. And this is uh, what we call the 2.6 sequence It's deviation. about the same order, Roman. It's about the same order. Okay. Then we yeah, have thanks. to see it goes the same direction, sorry, whatever, right? Since we're on the subject, sorry. Uh, yes, very short. Um, since I, there is no um, global vision about uh, lepton non-universality, is there other things that we can, as experimentalists, we could do uh, to, to clarify this, this issue or you know, to explore? Of course, you can do the same thing with more, uh, more statistics and more precision, but... Uh, the point is, what I looked at is uh, in the inclusive decay mode, right? And the present uh, bar data doesn't show anything of that. But if you look at the, some uh, preliminary data of Bell, which now people use, but I was uh, told by uh, Niki Nakaro that we should not use it because it's not official data, it, you get the same uh, features out of this that was published in 2009 on a conference, but one should not use this. I think there are some, to, back to your question, I think there is some work done here by Klasha who gives some suggestions that also this implies something on lepton flavor violation and some uh, shows some nice uh, experimental tests which you could do in addition, right? I think that's probably the work which you could look at for the experimentalist. Right. Because it implies also something on lepton flavor violation in one hand. And uh, if you assume that this is a real number, in the sense that it reflects some new physics. Okay. This one, maybe it's stronger. Like this one. <laughs> if you use this one, this is it. Um, okay. Then I prefer okay. this one. Ah. Okay. <laughs> so. I also would like to thank the organizers for the invitation, and so now the next ten minutes all about be mixing. <laughs> I would like to start with a short introduction on the formalism, the observables, and also measurements that we have now, days. And uh, then talk a bit about the standard model predictions and the uncertainties, and then at the end um, discuss a bit constraints which are derived on new physics from the data. Okay. So in B mixing, we start with a Meson states with definite B flavor. So these are the conventions usually used. 
the B bar meson contains the big quark, and then the B meson contains down the big bar. The time evolution of this neutral meson system is given by a kind of Schrodinger equation, and it depends on two matrices, the matrix, matrix and the decay width. And if we assume CPT invariance, then there are certain relations. And uh, once we diagonalize these matrices, we find the heavy and light mass eigenstates. And uh, the eigenvalues are taken to be positive, and then the mass difference is also defined to be positive, and then the decay width difference can be either sign. And um, what we're interested in are mainly quantities like the average decay width, the mass difference, and the decay width difference, because they are governed by electric interactions. And then we, we think that the average mass is given by QCD and uh, determined from lattice. So let me look at the phenomenology in these parameters. We have two complex quantities, so they are given by four real parameters, and then the decay width is real. And we have, can determine these quantities from mass width difference measurements, from decay width difference measurements, and then the real part of this ratio is given by flavor-specific CP asymmetries. Now, we have also access to the phase of M12 itself, and it is given by the phase of, that we can measure in interference of mixing with the decays of neutral B mesons. This phi f is something which we measure in experiment, and then there's some final state specific part which comes from QCD and other contributions in the decay which we have to calculate, and this is the most complicated part to extract this phi m. And then, of course, we can also do lifetime measurements and extract the decay with itself. Okay. Now, flavor-specific CP asymmetries I already mentioned usually are used um, the semi-leptonic decays for this purpose. <clears throat> and uh, if they were zero, it would be the absence of CP violation in mixing. There's also a measurement by the zero and I would like to discuss a bit the relation of this so-called inclusive Diemion CP asymmetry to these specific um, CP asymmetries. So D0 was a PP bar experiment, and they measure also BB bar pair productions where the BB bars can decay. And then we can end up with a situation where we have a two same sign Mills, they measure the CP asymmetry of these final states of these mions, and we are interested in the ones which originate from the Bs. And uh, for this purpose, D0 subtracts all the non B background with data, and that is what they call ACP. From a theoretical side, this ACP is generated by the flavor specific CP asymmetries as given here. And then this expression was used for a long time until Borisov and Hernesen, they also pointed out that there can be other contributions which arise from interference of mixing and decays. So the bees do not directly decay the, um, semi leptonically but maybe they decay before into a DD bar state, and then the DD bar state also contains some CP end violation and decays into muon final state. And uh, so they found that the additional contributions would be more or less of this form, dependent on the decay width difference of the B sub D and B sub S. And then there are some coefficients which arise here. They are mostly determined in an experiment and they are related to production fractions of B sub D to B sub S mesons, and so on. And um, the most interesting part is that this coefficient of gamma D is negative, so it gives, in principle, a destructive contribution to the one which comes from the flavor-specific CP asymmetries. 
And recently, Uli Nierste also had a closer look, and he finds that uh, they overestimated a bit the size of this destructive interference. But the consequence of this is just that the tension from the D0 experiment measurement with the standard model prediction is enlarged. That what is what Uli needs to find. Okay. So now these are the D0 measurements. They use now this generalized formula and the, there are three parameters, delta gamma D and these two asymmetries, and then you can fit them. Either you set delta gamma d to the standard model value, then they find a rather large deviation from the standard model for the flavor-specific asymmetries, or they use the world average, which has a large error, so they get closer to the standard model, or they fit all three, and then they find these values. And they are still far away from the standard model. So at the moment, there's no solution to to accommodate the standard model with, in this measurement and the current interpretation of this measurement. <coughs> if you look on the other measurements of flavor-specific CPS asymmetries, A, D, and A, S, they are compiled here. So the D0 result was, is this here. And uh, we had recently new updates from LHCB. These are the red measurements for both of them. And you can see that um, all experimental measurements are not are really in contradiction with D0, but they are much in agreement with the standard model. So in the future, we hope that this can be clarified further. Then I would like to talk a bit about how to extract the phase of M12. So in this case, one considers CP asymmetries where the B bar and the B can decay to the same CP final state, and then uh, the phase of the mixing can interfere with the phase of the decay amplitude itself. The time dependence of this PS symmetry has a sine term and a cosine term, and the corresponding coefficients are called uh, mixing-induced and uh, direct PS symmetry. And there's a third one, but there's a constraint on all three of them, so it's sufficient to measure two, and then the third one is known, but in principle, if you can over-constrain, then measurement, and it's interesting to measure all three of them. And maybe also this A delta gamma, it can be measured, it has to be measured in time-dependent analysis, but it can be measured in untacked samples, so this is maybe something interesting too. But the important quantity is this lambda f, this is real observable, it's Q over P from the mixing, and then the ratio of the decay amplitude conjugated over A, the non-conjugated one. And in certain decays, which are called golden plated decays, this lambda f is 1, and then the direct CP asymmetry almost vanishes, and uh, we can determine lambda f from this, uh, the imaginary part of lambda f from the mixing induced one. And uh, for example, for charge current mediated decays like B to J psi phi, one finds that this is simply related to this combination of CKM matrix elements, which is called in the literature beta S. Um, the most important thing is here there's an approximate, and this one stands for penguin pollution, in particular in this decay, which is usually suppressed by CKM matrix elements for this particular decay. For other decays, this can be really large, so then there's no sub correlation, and that's what I meant with finer state-specific things in the previous slides. <coughs> okay, then if one takes CKM fits, one can see that beta S is rather well determined from global CKM fits. <coughs> now this is the situation after the three inverse femtobound measurement of LHCB. They measure phi S, also delta gamma S, and this is the plane phi s versus delta gamma s. The standard model is given by this bar, and uh, there's good agreement overall. Now, if you would like to test further, OK, let me first take, point out that for the first time, LHB measured also 
phi s differently for the different polarization states which appear in this j psi phi final state. So in principle, they don't have to be the same. For all the previous purposes, they were assumed to be the same. But here you can see that it is almost universal. Penguin pollution and final state polarization dependent parts. So this is really a step forward in measurements. They also include a S wave contribution for the K plus K minus pairs. And um, yes, penguin pollution is something very important. Currently, theory has only strategies which rely on uh, SU3 flavor symmetries and uh, use control modes in which the penguin pollution is much larger. So you can really extract it. And uh, one of those control modes is, for example, B2 J psi rho. And this also has been recently analyzed by LHCB for the first time. So they find that the penguin pollution is about half of the experimental uncertainty on phi S with a, assuming the approximate SU3 flavor. And uh, it is consistent with theory estimates from light cone sum rows and other things. And um, in fact, we would need more theory input on SU3 flavor breaking unless we, cannot, unless we can extract it from experiment itself. So if I have this control work measure to this is meant as an alternative to the other three points to the SS3 assumptions. Or so you but assume it's SS3 to use control modes, right. but you have to assume SS3 flavor symmetry. Then you can okay. rate penguin pollution in BJ psi K to the one in this decay. But what means then half of the uncertainty? What, that, that's uh, at the moment, or can this be improved in the future? That's if, my question. No. LHB used this control mode, and they extract the penguin pollution, know, right. and they find that the size of this penguin pollution is about half the size of the experimental uncertainties of phi S. And, but that could be, could be improved, that's my point. So what would we... It, they, they have to assume approximate as a This I know, right? this I know so but now they have a measurement with an error. And everything if you depends assume on the error. then you probably can improve this in the future. But at a certain point, you care about SU3 flavor breaking. So you should bring it in also in this kind of analysis. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, so I, I will not talk about more about these things, in particular the determination of phi m from these kind of analysis. And, uh, in the following, I would like to talk a bit about standard model predictions of M12 and M gamma 12 The standard model M12 is determined by the absorptive part of this um, diagram with top quark exchange that can be integrated out at the level at the scale of MW, and it gives rise to this local delta V equals two operators. For gamma 12 it's a bit more, a bit more complicated. We integrate out further Ws, gives rise to two delta B equals one operators, and then we have to consider these um, double insertions. Of non, they're in principle non-local, but one can argue that the energy release of these particles intermediately is rather high, so one can do a second OPE of these non-local diagrams, which again gives delta B equals two operators. And then the hadronic matrix element of those operators have to be calculated on the lattice. So we are dependent on lattice. Okay. So in general, one believes that M12 is more sensitive to new physics than gamma 1. Now, M12, um, the prediction in the standard model is given by a short distance part, which is this inami limb function. There are QCD corrections. There are even electric corrections known, and these things are more or less under control. So there's no need to go currently beyond this. Then the hadronic matrix element, there's only one operator in the standard model which enters this V minus A, V minus A1, and it depends on the decay constant, 
of the beat and the back factor. Now if you look at the latest results from NF2 plus 1, they're getting more precise. They induce about 4% uncertainty on that time. Um, and um, the back factors, um, the uncertainty is a bit larger depending on P sub S and P sub T. So in the future we hope that there will be much more lattice progress, that there will be more groups which will calculate these quantities to reduce the error. And maybe an important point, to beyond the standard model there are more operators and um, the lattice community so far it focuses only on this one. There's only one calculation which is not quenched for the whole set of these one from ETM collaboration. So this would be interesting for new physics searches to have also lattice results for other back factors. Now CKM induces some uncertainty but actually we would like to use the measurement of delta M to extract CKM and compare it with three level determinations. But if you're interested, current uncertainties of CKM on this quantity are about 6 and 12%. For MD and for MS, they're smaller. Then the theory predictions for gamma 1, 2, they're based on this second OPE, which I tried to explain. We expand in lambda over MB, use quark hadron duality, and then at some orders we even include alpha S corrections. And uh, currently this OPE, it shows a conversion behavior. It's a similar OPE to the what um, Julia explained for a similar psionic inclusive decays this morning. And uh, it works also rather well for the ratios of lifetimes. <coughs> now, the error budget is listed here. So again, it depends on the decay constant, which gives one of the largest errors. And then there is a large error from a hadronic matrix element of the disorder. So this is a dimension seven operator. And those things are also not calculated currently on the lattice. So we would really need the lattice results for dimension seven operators to progress. And then a bit next uncertainty would be also from higher order corrections. But these are the highest ones from lattice currently. Just to show you that the predictions for delta gamma S and delta gamma D Compared to the experimental values, they compare really good. So experiment has currently already smaller errors for delta gamma S, but for delta gamma D, they are still really large. So one can still play with new physics in delta gamma D if one, for example, wants to explain the anomaly, this delta Z, delta zero measurement of the like sign dimion asymmetry. And this is just to show you that lifetimes and delta gamma s are in agreement. So delta gamma s theory is here. And this is a, an old HFAC still from this year. <laughs> if you look just at LHCB data, it, they meet all at the same point. It, there's a bit, I don't know, I should look up if this is D0 or Tevatron dominated, I don't know. This should be the new one. No, no. Oh, this is from. <laughs> okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then, if one would take the measurement of tau d and take the zero predictions of the ratio and translate into prediction of tau s, then it would be a 0.66 or something like that. But with large error probably. Okay. Now this flavor specific CPU asymmetries, they are given in the standard model by the CKM, which we don't extract from a global fit. And then the uncertainties are not included here. These are just uh, uncertainties from the OPE. <laughs> And uh, the numbers are very small, 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5. But the experiment uh, is getting close for AD, as maybe the last value. So maybe LHP can pin down this more in the future. For AS, it looks more difficult. 
these are the prospects for the three inverse femtobon analysis which I found somewhere. And uh, yes, this is just for your reference the actual value for the prediction for this asymmetry measured by D0. Okay, so, so far the standard model. And now beyond the standard model, what people do are uh, either in general fits where we assume only M12 to be affected by new physics, that is parameterized by one complex number, but its modulus and its phase, and there are four real parameters if one considers B sub D and B sub S, and both data sets are correlated by this measurement of A, B, S, L from D0. This was the situation in 2010, so there were some tensions seen, the standard model point is here, the best fit regions were here, this was before the measurements of LHCB and mainly Tevatron driven measurements of fires, but in 2013, the situation changed. Now in the BSAS system, the best fit and the standard model coincide, and there's some small tension here. So there's still some range for new physics, and I think the orange band can be shrinked by lattice improvements. Yes. The largest pool values arise for this ABSM from D0. <clears throat> now, since the one possible explanation would be new physics in delta gamma, I would like to spend the rest on speculating on that. Delta gamma is in the standard model dominated by BS charm charm and BD charm charm or BS uu and so on. If you look at delta gamma S, it's really dominated by BSCC. And B sub in delta gamma D, there's an interference of UU, CU bar with partial cancellations of BDCC. If you look at the branching ratio of a B to SCC bar, then it's rather high. So assuming your physics in this part would also change the total um, decay width, the lifetime, drastically of the B sub, B sub S. On the other hand, in branching edge of B to D CC bar is very small, so if there would be new physics in these current current operators, then it would not be so obvious in the lifetime. So previous studies showed that maybe you can enhance the gamma S by 30% from the standard model if you assume new physics in BS tau tau and try to constrain BS tau tau with all available data. So there's not so much room left here. And I would like to focus on delta gamma D, since it's also not well measured. It's the other side. So at the end, it maybe turns out a good measurement of delta gamma D will give constraints on these current current operators. Because the situation is really like that. There are current current operators, that's just a diagram, B, C, W, B, C, and they contribute to hadronic decays, and we don't have hadronic physics under control, so we cannot constrain these Wilson coefficients. Although our prejudice is there is no physics, no new physics in tree level decays. So if one tries to constrain these standard model current current operators by assuming that new physics can contribute differently to UC, CC, and UU contributions, one can use B2 pi pi measurements, B2 rho pi, rho rho, D star pi. And then one even has to use B to X D gamma, where these operators contribute due to mixing, and sine to beta also. So what we find is that, um, for example, for this Wilson coefficient of B, D, C, C, the large ranges, standard model would be here, are still those. And uh, the single constraints come from, mainly from B, X, D, gamma, and uh, others. The flavor specific CP asymmetry in green. The enhancement of delta gamma D can be about 100%, which cannot be ruled out currently. So if you measure this precisely, we can constrain these things. And then just the other possibility would be that there's B to D tau tau, and B to D tau tau can be constrained from upper bounds on this the tonic decay B to D tau tau, there's also some mixing of these operators with a B to pi tau tau, um, sorry, 
direct contributions be pi tau tau, and there's some mixing in B2 X, SD gamma, XD gamma. And then you can again look at what the enhancement can still be of delta gamma D over, in the new physics scenario over standard model. But the currently upper bound uh, is this one, so it's factor three. And if you would put constraints on these branching fractions, then you can see what this implies on delta gamma D. Okay, this brings me to my summary. And uh, yes, mixing will be important in the future, so we can still learn something. It is, will be dependent on the progress on the lattice for that M12 and gamma12. And uh, of course, on better measurements of the inputs are needed, like the flavor specific CP asymmetries and delta gamma D. And also, this part which I'm not talked about, I think you can have a dedicated workshop on all these extractions of the phase of M12 from these kind of decays. Thank you. Just to continue on, on your question, you, you were asking Tobias uh, what are the next steps for the penguin pollution, if I understand correctly. So there is two things. The latest result from LHCB now tells us that the penguin pollution in Fias is of the order of uh, 10 plus or minus 20 milliradian. And in this 10 milliradian, the uncertainty on the penguin pollution, we have approximately half experiment. We will improve with other mode and more statistic, and half with is due to this SU3 breaking approximation. So the next step are clear. We need to improve on the SU3 breaking. So any ideas, anyone have ideas to control this uh, approximation is very welcome. And from the experimental size, we have here used BD to GPSI row zero, and we are currently using BS to GPSI K star, which is another mode. It is not directly related to um, by SU3 to GIP sci fi because we also have uh, to neglect penguin annihilation and exchange topologies. So there is still a, a lot of activities in, uh, in this area. Thank you. More questions? Comments? So if not, let us thank Christophe again. And so let us, we are a little bit late, so let, let us see each other here at 11.20. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Let's see. That's the slides. All right, so the, um, what? the outline of the talk is, so, I'm, giving, I'm going to give a status of charm physics at the end of uh, 2014. And um, really what I want to say is uh, there's going to be a few slides on the experimental precision. I won't really have much to say about the experiment. Uh, and really what I focus on is on CP violation in DD bar mixing and the direct CP uh, violation. The question here is how large it can be in the standard model and then how to know if you are seeing new physics or not. So let me start with the indirect CP violation. So first, a uh, few words about DD bar mixing. So, <clears throat> so the general statement is that we need three generations. You need to somehow fill three generations in order to have CP violating effects. So that means that in the charm system, you have to go through a big work. Now, um, means that you'll, have, you'll pay a price for the, uh, the CKM separation when you go through a B, so lambda B here means VCB, VUB, and now I can use in any uh, amplitude that I write down, I can use now the uh, CKM unitarity to now have two pieces. One will contain the CP violating piece, and then these two, one of them I can trade for, uh, for the other, so let's say I get rid of lambda S, now I only have downstairs VUD, uh, VCD, which will be over the point one. And all the CP, v, CP violating effects are therefore suppressed by lambda B divided by lambda D. 
If you plug in the numbers, this is of the order of 6 times 10 to the minus 4. So all the CP violating effects will be down by this CKM suppression. Now, to a very good approximation, this means the DD bar mixing is really in the standard model. So that means that if I want to describe the, CP, the, the DD bar mixing itself, to a very good approximation, this will be just described by the CP conserving uh, quantity. So that's the mass splitting between the two states and then the difference of the decay width. So this is now X and Y. So now the first thing you would do is you will assume that CP is conserved and then you do a fit, a constraint fit where only vary X and Y. So this is done by HFAG. That's the no mixing is down there. So this is X in percent, Y in percent. This is no, no mixing. And this is the one sigma, two sigma and so on uh, constraints. So this point is, if you go on the HFAG, is more than 11.5 sigma away, much, much more than this because the feed does not even converge here anymore. It's so far away. <coughs> anyway, so the x and y are, are the order of a percent with uh, well away from zero. Now, uh, how can you know about new physics? So the CP violation really comes in the game when you start asking about the new physics because that's where we can make progress. The DD bar mixing has long range uh, contribution from standard model. We don't really know so well the, the magnitude of these mixing amplitudes, but we do know that they should be CP conserving. So. <coughs> Let's do the following. So let's say that we assume that new physics is off-shell in DD bar mixing, so we're uh, sort of a very likely uh, scenario. Then new physics would only contribute to M12, so the dispersive amplitude, but not to the absorptive amplitude. So you would have the, the M12 in this matrix element would now obtain a CP violating, so it will obtain a weak phase, which will be due to new physics. Remember, I'm still neglecting the, the standard model contribution here. So M12 has now a phase. Now what you can do is, instead of having two parameters, I introduce an extra one, which is the phase of M12 in my convention, and I have three parameters. So what you could call X12, Y12, which is just M12 divided by the, the, uh, the, the, the width, the Y12 divided by the width, and phi 1, 2, which is this argument of M12. <coughs> now this is called a super weak approximation. So that I have a dimension 6 operator. It's due to new physics. I integrated out the new physics. And it only contributes as off-shell uh, mode to the, uh, the dispersive amplitude. Now the X12 and Y12 are related to X and Y up to something which is second order in CP violation. Now, if you do a fit again in these three variables, what you find is the following. So I'm not even showing the x12, y12 plane, because that's essentially the same as, as in the CP conserving case. But so let's look at these two other projections. So this is phi12 versus x12, and phi12 versus y12. So at one sigma, you're sort of at the five degree level, but at two sigma, you're almost at the 20 degree uh, level is still allowed. So these are then the numbers. Now at one sigma, you know, it's a point. Doesn't make sense. Okay. Ah, these are the projections then on one direction. So if I project on one direction, then it's sort of at the two, two degree level that the phi 1, 2 is constrained. All right? OK. All right, so now let's ask the following question. So this is from unpublished work by uh, Grossman et al. And then the numbers are going to be mostly from uh, Alex Kagan's talk at uh, KKFF. And I think the fits were really done by Luca. And th there's a nice talk that he gave at CKM 2014. All right, so let's ask wh what happens if you want to go beyond this super weak approximation. So now what I want to do, or what these people are trying to do, is you want to ask the following question. When does the standard model uh, phase enter, and how will this uh, change the effects? So let's now ask about the standard model contribution to the DD bar mixing amplitude. And what you see is that there, if you just write the SU3 structure, so here I'll have a D and a B, 
and an S running in the loop, you will have this CP conserving piece, which is, goes as lambda S squared, ADD plus ASS minus 2 ADS means I have D and an S running in the, in the loop with the obvious notation. Now what you see is that if I take D equal to S, this thing goes to zero. Now I have to actually do, this is zero up to a second order in the SC3 parameter, breaking parameter epsilon. Then I have the first uh, piece which uh, carries the weak phase. This is now linear in the, in the SC3 breaking. So if you compare the, the CP conserving versus the CP violating piece, you see that the CP uh, violating one is down by one order less in the SCT breaking. Therefore, these phases that you would have on the, let's, in my notation, let's call this the argument of gamma 1, 2 and the argument of the M 1, 2 matrix elements, I have these two new phases, are enhanced by one over epsilon, right? <coughs> the other, no, the other uh, important realization by uh, these people is that there are no such enhancement for individual direct CP asymmetry. It's only when you sum over that you have this SC3 breaking effects, uh, this SC3 expansion in the inclusive modes. Now what you see is that you can parameterize demixing at leading order in SC3 breaking what with four universal parameters now, the, the x12, y12, which were the, related to the CP conserving case, then this uh, phi uh, angle, that the, the phi phase that I have before now splits into two phases. They're still universal, so they're still uh, just pieces that describe the mixing matrix elements, while the CP violation in the in the actual decay amplitudes for the exclusive modes would not, be this, would not have this SU3 enhancement. All right, so now if you do uh, the following, you can now estimate the size of the weak mixing phase. It's just the CKM suppression parametrically, and then, as I said, it's, it's enhanced by this one over epsilon, so the one over uh, SU3 breaking. And numerically, this will be then three times 10 to the minus three, taking uh, epsilon to be 0.5. Now, what you can see here is the following. This has two limits. So let's say that the SC3 breaking is large. Then this, this would be an overestimation of what, how big these phases are. It would actually be just instead of one or epsilon, it would have one, so it would be a factor of five smaller. Now, you can't, you should not make this epsilon too small, so if I say that I have a very good expansion because epsilon is much, much smaller than 0.2, naively would say, okay, but then this thing blows up. But on the other hand, you would have to have something very strange happening in the leading contributions because they are of the order of epsilon squared. Okay, so this somehow is a conservative or conservative-ish estimate of how big this, uh, this phase should be. Okay, they, what they, they do is they also give a more detailed estimates for the uh, phi, one ga, phi one to gamma when they do an exclusive sum over the exclusive modes. Now what you can do is you can look now at the fits. So the fits are in different, made in different languages. So let's stick to this phi one two gamma phi one two m and look at this last column. You would see that the fit right now is going to give you, this is now in radians, if I convert into the degrees, it's sort of 10 degree and 3 degree constraint on these two phases. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Right, so now let's ask about the new physics. So this was uh, something that uh, I was uh, specifically built for asking about the, the size of the standard model contribution, but this parameterization will be valid for some classes of new physics as well. So if you, if you have, for instance, the do, you're dominated by QCD penguin and you don't have some, uh, uh, just some parity, uh, but sort of a generic QCD penguin, then this would be also a good parameterization, but you might start, but it would not be good for the electric penguin dominated effects, for instance. All right. Now, if you are searching for new physics, you can ask two questions. So how well will you do in the, in the future? So that's the end of LHCB and Bell 2 runs. The, this would be constrained to the following degree. So that uh, one uh, percent in radians, or the one percent in radians, so that's still 
uh, a factor of a few better than what you would uh, get for the standard model value, then if you go to 100 times more data, you would start to hit the theory uncertainty. So what you could say is that if you find phi 1 to gamma or phi 1 to m to be much, much bigger than this estimate for the standard model, this would indicate new physics. On the other hand, if you are in this super uh, weak uh, scenario where you would have phi 1 to m much, much bigger than phi 1 to gamma, this would probably also indicate new physics. All right, so that's as far as, as, as I wanted to say about the the, the mixing, so now let me move on to direct CP violation. Now here the problem is the following, or the excitement, the lack of the excitement, is the following. So there was lots of excitement caused by the measurement of delta ACP. So the, uh, two years ago the experimental situation looked something like this. So there was this delta ACP direct, which was well away from, from uh, zero. Now two years onwards, the central value moved, and it's now consistent with zero, um, with slightly smaller error bars, but also the central value is about a factor of two to three. Smaller. Now, what does this uh, teach us? Well, okay, apart from the fact that the experimental anomaly went away, we did learn something. So what did we learn? It was uh, uh, relatively, so one thing we learned with was that it was still relatively easy to write down models to expand new physics in charm at present precision. You, don't, you didn't really have to jump through hoops. So it was still a sort of uh, viable models. Something that you would uh, think about maybe 10 years ago would still go. Uh, the other lesson was that if you uh, postulated that there's some enhancement of the QCD penguins in the standard model. This could be a standard model effect, so that's uh, now a problem because if I have a factor of a few enhancement that I put by hand, and I already explained the, the anomaly, you might worry that what I'm seeing is, is it a standard model or is it new physics? So that means that in the future, we, if you want to be sure what, that what we're seeing is new physics, we need better observables. All right, so let's try to do this uh, exercise. So what I'll do is I'll uh, split the new physics model into two groups depending on isospin. So if you look at the standard model contributions, then the three contributions which have the structure d bar c, u bar d, they have both delta equal three halves and delta equal one half components, while the penguins only have delta equal one half because I sum over the q q. So this would be u u bar plus d d bar. And similarly, the new physics models then can be grouped into two sets. So either they contribute only to delta equal one half, so that would be, for instance, the Q, uh, the chromomagnetic contribution from the MSSM, so you're dominated by a diagram like this, so you have a, a squark gluino loop, and you generate the chromomagnetic operator, or you would have also large delta equal three half contributions. So an example would be it was motivated by the forward backward TT bar symmetry. It's not so important, but uh, the contribution to the delta ACP would come from a sort of a, this type of a three level contribution, which would have both delta equal one half and three half contributions. So there are these two groups of standard models, uh, if this new physics uh, models. And we want to uh, get uh, new observables which would tell us whether we're seeing new physics or standard model. So let's start with this uh, testing for new physics in the chromomagnetic operator. <clears throat> now, the observation made by Isidori Kamenik is the following. So if you're dominant, you have a large contribution of new physics to the chromomagnetic operator, then you would necessarily generate also the electromagnetic one, either through running or generically even, uh, I mean, if you have a new physics model, generically you would also induce Q7 gamma already at the, at the hard scale. Now, the, if you now look at the, so, so now you can test for these electromagnetic uh, contributions. Um, the 
by looking at the CP violation in the exclusive uh, rho gamma and omega gamma decays. Now you have, uh, slight, you have some enhancement here because you directly couple, couple to U, U bar and DD bar. You don't have any dilution here. And uh, the numbers are the following. So it will be a 4% effect if the value of the Wilson coefficient is such that you would get the standard, the observed at that time Delta ACP. So if you have Delta ACP observed, the imaginary part of C8 would be this value 0.4. If you run from one TV, you would actually get almost the same number for the C7 with the coefficient to stick it in, you would have a 4% effect. Now this, if you want to explain the central value of, of uh, Delta ACP uh, now, that would mean that this Wilson coefficient has to be roughly 0.1, so this will be a 1% uh, CP asymmetry in the D to rho gamma. Now, what you can do is you can ask, where does the standard model va value uh, uh, sit? So, if you just parameterize with the, uh, the CKM suppression, which is 0.1%, times the ratio of the matrix elements of the, of the two amplitudes that interfere, that's the value. Now you have to, <coughs> of course, tell me how big this uh, non-perturbative parameter is, and that's where the ugly part is, is you don't know how big this is, but let's say if you were to say it's not enhanced by more than a factor of a few, you see that, okay, you may be a factor of a few above the standard model still. Okay, so that's the, the ugly part. Uh, is, it, it's not entirely clear how big this contribution should be. All right, so now let me ask about delta equal three half. Now, here you can do the following. So you can uh, use the observation that standard model delta equal three halves comes from the three operators, and these electroweak penguin contributions are very, very small. These three contributions carry no weak phase, so if you test the delta equal three half amplitudes and ask whether it, has, it carries any CP violation. If you find CP violation, you find new physics, okay? Up to the corrections that I'll discuss in a second. Okay, so what we want to do is the following. So I want to isolate delta equal three half amplitudes. So what that means is that, for instance, if you look at D zero and D plus, you want to identify I equal two final state. So that means that you can use these modes, pi pi rho pi rho rho, but you can use kk. So you learn nothing from kk as far as this uh, delta equal three half searches goes. The same thing for ds plus, you can use pi k decays. You need the three, three half final state. Now, if you want to play this game, the, really the crucial thing is that you care about the isospin breaking. Isospin breaking is of the size of the effect that you're looking for. We're looking at the percent or below precision, so you need to have some rules which will be valid to second order in isospin breaking. So, or it's second order in, in a small parameter is really what I mean. It's either second order in isospin breaking or it's of the order of isospin breaking times CP uh, violation, which again is of the similar size. So what you would expect is that I have corrections at the level of 10 to the minus four would be the corrections to this uh, sum rules in the standard model. Now experimental errors are somewhere between 10 to the minus two to 10 to the minus three where wherever these CP asymmetries have been measured. So you see there's a, still a big uh, gap between the present measurements and where the standard model would be. All right, so let's look at a few examples. So the simplest one is if I just look at D to pi pi. So that's the isospin decomposition. Here three means that I have delta equal three half. One means it's delta uh, I equal one half. And you see that it's very simple. A pi plus pi minus is already delta equal three half amplitude, which means that if you find CP asymmetry in pi plus pi zero to be non-zero at the level above 10 to the minus four, then you found new physics, okay? Now, if you want to, to have this non-zero, you need to have a strong phase between new physics and the standard model. And the How same thing. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. How do you get Ah, yes. No, I had no idea, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's here, no? 
it's here, yes. That's why I will go on the next slide and try to do something else, yes. Yeah, sorry. Okay, the same for D Tororo. Okay, so what you could do is the following. So if you have, uh, if you <coughs> have now time dependence, a meaning also time dependence for pi zero, pi zero, then you can construct this isospin sum, uh, sum rule, no? So now I have this, uh, the, the triangle with the equal to the isospin breaking amplitude, but this isospin breaking is in the standard model is CP conserving. So what I can do is take the difference between the sum rules for D0 and D0 bar, I get something which is a, gives me, uh, would be zero if I have CP conserving uh, effects. Uh, if, so if I find this uh, sum rule to be non-zero, then I found delta equals three half new physics. Okay, so it's a, you get rid of this problem of strong phase. All right, then you could do something similar for D to rho pi. So again, I write down a, a sum rule. I take the difference between, let's say, the CP, the, the, uh, the magnitude squared, if it's not zero, you found new physics. I could do better, I, you know, it's, the problem is that, of course, there's always a direction where I could just tune away the new physics contribution because the strong phase is exactly the one that would cancel in this ratio, but you could, uh, oh, where did I go? But you could do, again, the time-dependent construction, and then, again, you, you would have a different combination which enters, if you find this to be non-zero, it would mean new physics. You could do the same thing for D, to, D sub S decays. This sum is the, is the delta equal three half. You, you can look at this difference of the two sum rules. If you find it to be non-zero, you found a new physics. All right. So let me conclude. So what I did was I discussed possible tests for new physics using indirect CP violation in the mixing and direct CP violation in the decays. And uh, the message is that there is an order 10 window for new physics with present precision of the data. So there is really sort of the, for the next generation of the B factories, we will not reach the, uh, the standard model uh, uh, wall yet. Okay, thank you. Hi, Zupan. Uh, I have uh, just uh, a question about uh, the isospin decompos uh, decomposition. Uh, it's a naive question, but where are the finite state uh, inelastic? That is, uh, the hadronic interaction that move uh, pi pi to kk, for example. Um. Okay, I don't think I have a very good question, but the KK, um, of course, will not, uh, okay, the KK itself, uh, is, it, no, it doesn't have I equal to no, but, but I mean, one, one thing that is actually scary is that, uh, as experimental, let's say, we know that uh, to understand the hadronic decay of D is complicated. And uh, we know that uh, beside the elastic uh, final state interaction, there are also the inelastic final state interaction. Right. Otherwise, uh, you miss, uh, there are several, <laughs> 10 sure. of uh, 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 exclusive decay modes that are not explained by theory. Right. Okay. But if you include uh, the final state, the inelastic final state interaction, <laughs> At that point, it is more likely that what you observe, if you find something different from zero, is due to the inelastic final state interaction and not to new physics. So, okay, so, um, of course, I, it would be good to do the pro proper analysis offline, but there's a quick answer is that for KK uh, in particular, no, this will be uh, not an I equal to final state. So you would need to go from KK and feed into the, the um, pi pi. Into pi pi. You would need to have the isospin breaking plus the CP violation on top of this. Okay, so I hope I'm correct, so. Okay. 
I'm okay. Yeah, but I think I think it's the wise, the second or, order in the small effects. Yeah, but, but I, other, okay, otherwise theory be, can calculate uh, the branching ratio d zero going to k plus k minus uh, over d zero going to pi plus to my, my minus exactly, but. Uh, Instead, we are off of a factor of 100. <laughs> no, okay, but this can be easily explained just by having a, a large, uh, enlarged QCD penguin. You don't need to, yes. I don't think so. <laughs> Good questions? And I have two. Ah, yes, okay, I move. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. So, I, uh, I will review uh, Charles Lepton flavor physics. Um. Okay, sorry. So, in the quest of new physics, uh, uh, by studying charged leptons, we can be sensitive to very high scale. So current physics, you are sensitive to a scale of 10 to the 5 TV. And with charged lepton, for instance, with a very, preci very precise bound coming from mu to e gamma from meg, you can be sensitive to a scale of order 10 to the power 4 TV. So um, in, um, in parallel of uh, direct search for new physics, it's very interesting to look at charge lepton at low energy and try to, um, to get some indication about the new physics scale and also the flavor dynamics of the new physics. So there is a lot of experiment at low energy in the, in the leptonic sector. At PSI, for instance, MEG or mu to, uh, or Comet, or also at the at the Fermilab, uh, this G minus two experiment, and also in, in B physics, Babar, Bell, uh, best physics for Tau, and also El Ashibi. So there is huge improvement that have been made already on measurement and uh, also bound obtained, but there is much more expected. <coughs> So, also it's very interesting to study um, actually lepton, chart lepton, because in many cases there is no standard model background. It's extremely clean, like for lepton flavor violating processes or for uh, el electric dipole moment churches. And for some mode, still there are accurate calculations of hadronic uncertainty are essential, and this is where the theorists have to work hard for this. Um, so it's really, uh, charged lepton are very important to look uh, for new physics. <coughs> Basically, this is a program uh, in, uh, in uh, charged lepton physics, um, and this will be also what I will try to cover in my talk. This is a, a scheme, a scheme uh, adapted from the talk given by Yuval Grossman at uh, Charles Lepton Flavor Violating Conference in 2013. I have just ad added the Lepton Flavor uh, tau decays into hadrons. And you see that uh, with Lepton Flavor Violation, you can, I mean, you can link this to, uh, okay, muon Lepton Flavor Violation, tau Lepton Flavor Violation, but also at, you can link to neutrino oscillation because you can have some non-standard interactions that will modify the effect, the interacting effect of neutrino in matters. And you have also some constraint uh, on um, coming from lepton flavor uh, conservation from muon or tau from on the G minus two or EDM of the muons and the same for the tau. So if we, 
if we look at all these processes, we can really try to constrain some new uh, lepton flavor um, uh, um, modification couplings, uh, violating couplings, actually. <clears throat> so let me start with charge lepton flavor relation. Um, so the neutrino oscillation are the first evidence for lepton flavor relation in the neutral sector. How about uh, in the charge lepton sector? Well, in the standard model with massive neutrino, there are some effective charge lepton flavor violating vertices, but they are tiny because they are suppressed by G mechanism. So you get some unobservable small rates. For instance, if you look for mu to e gamma, you have an insertion of a neutrino here that will flip, uh, that will change the flavor from muon to electron, and you can predict this branching ratio to be smaller than 10 to the minus 54. And uh, the same is possible in the tau sector for tau to mu gamma is smaller than 10 to the minus 40. So it really, if we observe something there, at the, in, uh, in experiments, this is an extremely clean probe of beyond standard model physics. If we observe something, it's clearly non-standard non uh, physics. So, uh, and uh, in new physics scenario, you, you have some charged lepton flavor violating effects that can reach observable level in several channels. So here is a table for, uh, that tells you what predicts uh, supersymmetry scenario or standard model with heavy Majorana or Z prime, several beyond standard model scenario in terms of tau to mu gamma or tau to free lepton. And you see the undetectable in the standard model but it can reach some detectable level at, uh, in these two channels. So, <clears throat> but the sensitivity of a particular mode to charge lepton flavor couplings is really model dependent. And uh, then you can try to, to uh, measure or to put bound on as many channels as you can in the muonic and taonic channel. And uh, then you can compare the branching ratio, the conversion rate, and the spectra in order to try to disentangle what is the underlying mechanism that could lead to this, uh, what is the underlying physics that could lead to uh, such effects. So in, uh, in the muon D case, there have been uh, a huge progress, experimental progress, you see, in the measurement of mu to e gamma. So MEG has reached an impressive level of, of precision in its bound, and uh, it's, uh, they are expecting to do even better. Then <clears throat> you see for mu to free E, we have some bound from syndrome here, and uh, again, mu to free E experiment in PSI is expecting to do even better by order of magnitude. And then for mu to e conversion, there is a bound in titanium. And again, uh, there are some plan, some experiment plan at Fermilab or PSI to do better. <clears throat> so as far as the tau decay are concerned, you see that there is a 48 lepton flavor modes that has been studied at Bell and Babar. You see there are much more modes than for the muonic uh, channel. Uh, because the tau is heavy enough to decay into hadrons directly. So <clears throat> in, um, in purple, you have the bound that have been put by Cleo, and you see the tremendous progress done at the B factory by Babar, in the bound are in blue, and by Bell in red. And you see that LHCB has one measurement for tau to free muons, and then some measurement also include in involving muon in the baryon number violating sectors. So, <clears throat> can, so in principle, we can do better at uh, Bell 2. Uh, the expecting sensitivity is 10 to the minus 9, and we hope also LH our LHCB colleague could measure some other mode even better. Uh, and I forgot to say that in green, these are the combined, uh, the combined uh, bounds that have been com uh, computed by uh, the AV flavor averaging group. 
<clears throat> so let's try to look what this uh, bound tells us about uh, new physics, uh, adopting an effective field theory approach. So we can uh, we can build. Uh, so we can say the, the standard model is an effective theory and built all the dimension five and six operator. So dimension five is uh, is uh, responsible for the Majorana uh, mass of the neutrino. And uh, dimension six, we, we have built all the dimension six lepton flavor operators that we can have. They involve uh, dipole operator, lepton quark uh, couplings, uh, scalar, pseudo scalar vector or axial, lepton gluon couplings that can be scalar or pseudo scalar, and then for lepton that can be also scalar, pseudo scalar vector or axial. Each ultraviolet model will generate a specific pattern of this operator and by studying the different processes where they uh, enter, you can try to disentangle which model is responsible for this, uh, for this uh, lepton flavor viola violation. So here I, I just uh, give, write them for you, like the dipole operator that can be uh, generated uh, at, at high energy by, for instance, in supersymmetry by this, uh, involving this diagram, tau to mu gamma transition with a, a S partic uh, supersymmetry particle inside the loop. Then you have the scalar or pseudo scalar um, uh, operators that can be generated by an uh, exchange of uh, Higgs at high energy, so uh, CP even or CP odd Higgs. And then if you integrate out the heavy quark, then you can also generate a gluonic operator. <coughs> you can also have this vector, actual vector operator that can be generated by an exchange of a lepto quark, for instance. And then you have this four lepton also scalar, so the scalar vector or actual uh, for, um, operator that can be generated by this kind of particle. So let's see uh, what can, can, how can we discriminate um, models using muon processes. This is a summary table that has been uh, written by uh, Vicenzo. Um, so you can see uh, three different processes, mu to three E electron, mu to E gamma, and mu to E conversion, and which kind of operator will contribute to these processes. So first of all, I have to under emphasize that the notion of best probe, the process with the largest decay rate, is largely model dependent. And now, if we observe the one mode, we can compare the rate of processes and then, if we observe the several, we, can, we have a key handle on the relative strength between operators, and then we can try to infer the underlying mechanism that will generate these processes. So, for instance, if you compare mu to 3e and mu to e gamma, then you, have a rel you can have an indication on the relative strength between the dipole and four lepton operators. So for instance, if you will measure only mu to free, mu free electron, if you could see, and you don't see mu to e gamma, then that tells you that most probably the four lepton operator is dominating and not the, the dipole operator. So the scenarios uh, that, uh, that favor four leptons will dominate over the dipole. So it's very important to really measure as many processes as possible to be able to disentangle uh, uh, the, to be able to disentangle new physics scenario and also that generate different operators. So now you can also, if you want uh, to have a hint of the coupling of quark to lepton, then you have to 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 uh, measure or to have constraint from mu to e conversion. So you see if you compare, for instance, mu to e conversion to mu to e gamma, you have now the relative strength between the dipole operators that come into mu to e gamma and the quark, oh, and the quark operators that are present in mu to e conversion. We can play the same game in tau physics. In this case, you have, in addition to the leptonic um, tau to free muons, for instance, and the radiative decay tau to mu gamma, you have a, a, a large number of hadronic decays. And these, these decays are very important because, as you can see in this table, they are sensitive to a large number of operators. Vector, scalar, gluonic, uh, axial, pseudo-scalar, and uh, GG tilde operator. 
And depending on the channel, for instance, if you look mu to pi pi or mu to kk bar, you are um, sensitive to different isospin. Okay? So it's very important to really consider these hadronic decays because they can really tell us a lot about different operators. Uh, but for this, we need a really a reliable determination of the hadronic part. In the case of tau going to muon and one pseudo scalar, a pion or eta, it will be the decay constant of uh, eta, eta prime or pion. In the case of tau going to mu, pi pi or kk bar, then we, are, we need to determine this uh, form factor. So, um, and there have been recent progress in this, uh, in this study of this form factor using dispersive technique. So basically the hadronic part, so the hadronization of two quarks going to two pion can be written as a Lorentz structure times this form factor that depends on the invariant mass of the two pion in the final state. And this form factor can be determined by solving a two-channel unitary condition using the pi pi and kk bar scattering data as input. <coughs> so we have two handles to try to um, discriminate between new physics scenario. One handle will be to consider the branching ratio, compare branching ratio between two processes. Uh, for, uh, so, and the other handle will be to study the, spectru, the spectra of uh, when you have more than two bodies in the final state between different processes. So, <coughs> this is, uh, for instance, a table uh, that has been made by Buras and collaborators uh, for um, studying uh, the, the branching ratio in different uh, models, little Higgs, MSSM, with dipole dominance or Higgs dominance or a fourth generation. And you see that you have different branching ratios depending on the model. So by comparing this branching ratio, you can, have, you can disentangle the di underlying dynamics. Then uh, we have, uh, now we have discriminated uh, the, the, the different models by looking at the spectrum of tau going to muon and to pion. This is a work in collaboration with Alejandro Celis and Vicenzo Chirigliano. So if, for instance, you look, you have a dipole model, then you will see uh, clearly a rho dominance here. That rho, so pi pi, rho going to pi pi, so rho, do, rho which is around 1 GV. Because uh, the dipole will go through photons and give you this, uh, this resonance. Now, if you have... Uh, a scalar model, so an exchange of a Higgs, you will have the, this F0 resonance 980 dominance. And now if you have a gluonic operator, then you see that you have this F0 dominance, but you have also a, a higher up, you have a bump. So, the, so really, if you manage to measure this spectrum, this spectra, you can really disentangle between different uh, models. Okay? <coughs> so, now I would like to show you a nice application which is trying to um, constrain some leptum flavor volatile coupling of the Higgs. So it's one example of such an operator. So basically you can write this dimension six operator that will induce uh, some, uh, um, some new uh, lepton flavor changing uh, Yukawa coupling to the Higgs. Um, in the standard model, this Yukawa of the Higgs are diagonal, but in this new physics scenario, they, they are allowed not to be diagonal. And then we have considered, so where do, can we measure or constrain this uh, Yukawa non, uh, flavor changing coupling of the Higgs? Well, directly at Elashi, by, uh, uh, by directly constraining uh, or putting a bound on the decay of Higgs into tau and muons, or you can also go at low energy and then uh, uh, considering the tau decays into muon, tau to mu gamma for instance, or tau to three muons. And uh, here you will have the dipole operator for tau to mu gamma or the scalar operator. And um, so this I have to say in this uh, decay tau to mu gamma and tau to three muon, you really have the loops that dominate because this 
operator is suppressed because it's proportional to the Yukawa of the muon here. That is very much suppressed because it's suppressed by the mass of the muon in the standard model. Here we have postulated a standard model coupling, right, of the Higgs to, to muon. And then you can also reverse this process and uh, study tau going to muon, Higgs, and then two quarks that will hadronize to two pion, or, or through the a quark loop will, uh, will give two gluons and hadronize to also two pion. So, <clears throat> so let's uh, examine the constraints in the mu E sector. This was done in a paper by Yure and collaborators in 2012. So where they have put all the constraints coming from XDK LHC they have simulated and also of low energy lepton flavor violating and lepton flavor conserving observable. In this, um, <coughs> so you can see the Yukawa constraint and you, you see that uh, the main constraint mode, mode comes from mu to e gamma by uh, the measurement by MEG, which will imply uh, a branching ratio of X to mu E, of smaller than 10 to the minus 7, so I think Elashik will not be able to uh, put a better constraint on this. But for the, in the tau to mu sector, so we have, um, we have derived the bound from tau to mu pi pi by assuming a okay, standard model coupling of the Higgs to quarks and then assuming, so, so taking these two diagrams that contribute, one that is photomediated with a, with a dipole here that you see in, uh, in yellow and one that is uh, uh, so mediated by the Higgs going to two quarks or two gluons and hadronizing into two pions, which is represented by the blue curve. And then you can sum up the two contribution that is given by the red in total. And then from the experimental um, bound, you can get a bound on your, on your coupling. And this corresponds to this red bound here. So this is a plot again made by Yure that has been updated with the constraint of CMS. So at, from low energy, you see, again, the best constraint comes from tau to mu gamma on the Yukawa of the lepton flavor, Yukawa of the uh, coupling of the Higgs to mu tau. But then uh, tau to mu pi pi is the second best constraint, and then tau to three muons is a bit uh, worst. But I have to emphasize that tau to mu pi pi is a three-level diagram, contrary to tau to mu gamma, where you have to make assumption on the um, on the loop, so it, which is more sensitive to the UV completion of the theory compared to tau to mu pi pi is more model independent if you want and give you robust handle on lepton flavor relation. But here uh, you see that CMS has released a new a bound, a direct bound, and uh, that is a uh, 0.17% I think. And then in this case, Elashi wins for tau to mu. So it's an opposite situation for, than for mu to e. So if there is a, for a lepton flavor violating Higgs and nothing else, the Elashi bound can be translated into a bound of 2.2 10 to the minus 9 for tau to mu gamma and 1.5 10 to the minus 11 for tau to mu pi pi. So tau to mu gamma can still be reachable at uh, Bell factory, but tau to mu pi pi is hopeless in this configuration. But then, Yure has presented a very nice uh, reinterpretation of her work at the Keck Flavor Workshop. And uh, he, he, he pointed out that uh, uh, for tau to mu pi pi, you are sensitive to the Yukawa of mu tau, but you are also sensitive to the Yukawa of the Higgs to the light quark. And these Yukawa actually are poorly bounded. So if you take at their standard model value, the Yukawa of the light quark, then the, the LHC bound, the CMS bound, give you this branching ratio that are not accessible at the, at the flavor factory, but we still should continue to search for these modes because if you find something at um, 10 to the minus 8 or 10 to the minus 9, then that will give you some constraint on the Yukawa of the light quark. Because if you put the Yukawa of the light quark at the upper bound, you see that the branching ratio, uh, you get some limits that are um, below the present experimental limit and can be really rich at uh, B factories. So you see that now 
if this, if this mode is discovered, we will, among other things, have a upper limit on the Yukawa of the light quark. So it's a nice interplay between high energy and low energy constraint. <coughs> Okay, so I think I have three minutes and I wanted just to cover um, uh, the progress that has been done in, in the anomalous magnetic moment of the muons. So I tried to do my best. Um, so basically, um, the zero magnetic factor of the muon is modified by loop contribution. And uh, okay, we, have stu we could also study the uh, anomalous magnetic moment of the electron with bet that has a better experimental precision. But if we consider new physics heavy, then you have more sensitivity to new physics in the muon anomalous magnetic moment in the measurement. Uh, and you should have a better sensitivity even in the tau anomalous magnetic moment, but uh, th there is some insufficient experimental accuracy. But uh, it has been recent work that show also that uh, the anomalous magnetic moment of the electron is also important to consider to constrain new physics scenario. So if I consider the, uh, an the contribution for, for the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon, then I have some QD diagram, then hadronic diagram here, and then the weak contribution in the loop. And then if you know very well the standard model prediction, you could compare to the measurement and constrain some new physics scenario like supersymmetry or other phys new physics scenarios that at one loop already contribute to this, um, to this diagram. But to be able to really put constraints on your physics scenario, you need to compute the standard model prediction with high precision, and this is not easy at all. So in this case, it's not standard model free background, this uh, anomalous magnetic moment. So this is a challenge. So basically here I show you um, in green the, the, the experimental constraint coming from BNL, experimental measurement for in, uh, from uh, the muon anomalous magnetic moment, and in red and black you have a different theoretical prediction, but what this curve tells you is that you have a 2.9 sigma difference between standard model prediction and the measurement. In blue you see that the uh, experimental um, aim of the new experiment uh, at Fermi, proposed at Fermilab, which will be an incredible um, gain in uh, the uncertainties. So we have to work hard to, to have the theory uh, prediction, so the standard model prediction under control. Here I show you uh, in the summary talk at the Tau conference, uh, they, they recapitulate, they summarize which all the contribution from the standard model. Uh, so the QD pre, uh, contribution, the hadronic contribution, the light by light contribution and the electroweak. What you can see immediately is that the main uncertainty comes from the hadronic contribution when you have a loop of hadron here and from the light by, the second uh, biggest uncertainty comes from the light by light scattering uh, prediction. So <clears throat> the hydronic contribution can be computed, cannot be computed from first principle because we are at low energy um, and so QCD is non-perturbative. So it has been shown a long time ago that you can use analyticity and unitarity and re relate the real part of photon polarization function from dispersion relation over the total cross-section data. So you can use data from a plus and minus going to hadron to compute this hadronic um, contribution here. So you see, uh, you need to know this ratio of E plus E minus going to hadron over E plus E minus going to muons to be able to compute this uh, leading order hadronic vacuum polarization. And uh, actually, Kinematically, you have the low energy contribution that dominates. 75% of your contribution comes from low energy, where you have two pi on actually contribution. Um, so there, is, there have been a huge 20 years effort by experimentalists and theorists to try to reduce this uncertainty on the lowest order hadronic part. So basically, if you look at this air ratio that I showed you before, here, you see that in, oh, sorry. 
In red, you have the main contributions uh, that come from uh, the, the smaller uh, um, energy region, and there have been some improvement in the E plus E minus cross-section data from Novosibirsk. And then there have been also improvement to use okay, perturbative QCD in the intermediate energy region. And then there have been a new technique of radiative return that has been developed to use data from phi and B factories. So CLOE2 as data and also um, uh, BABAR has, uh, has also uh, uh, given some data. And then there are also isospin symmetry allows you to also use the tau hadronic spectral function actually. But there are still some progress that need to be done. There is some inconsistency between tau and d plus e minus uh, contribution. So this uh, um, is related to the question of do we understand well enough isospin correction? Then there is also some inconsistency, inconsistency between the technique using radiative return and the direct data. In this case, this raises the question, do we have the radiative correction under control? So these are all the questions we, have, we need to solve if we really want a better, um, a more precise determination, a more precise prediction of the standard model. And uh, this also together with new data expecting from CLOE2, BEL2, and BES3. And uh, there have been some uh, lattice calculations are underway, so they try also to compute this uh, hadronic vac vacuum polarization. And here I just want to point out a recent progress of uh, this year by the group in Bern. So for the light by light, so the second more important uncertainty as I show you is uh, given by this light by light diagram. Until recently, uh, everybody will tell you that it's not possible to use a dispersion relation approach because it's a four-point function. And uh, then there was only model-dependent estimate for this contribution. But recently, the Bern group has shown us that it was possible to have a data-driven estimate of this light-by-light -light using dispersion relation. Basically, they write dispersion relation for two photons of shell. And you see that they have made this nice diagram, which looks terrible, but showing all the experimental input you need to be able to compute this light-by-light uh, -light, um, contribution from data. So photon, photon to pi, pi, and uh, so forth. Uh, omega, phi to three pi on, I mean, gamma, photon to pi going to pi, pi, and so forth. So a lot of... Uh, new data uh, are needed to be able to really have um, a model independent determination of this light by light uh, diagram. So, I'm oh, sorry. Okay, so now if we still get these discrepancies, then we could uh, get some um, a nice information, or I mean, we could constrain new physics theory like supersymmetry with large transient beta or dark photon scenario. Here you can see that there is some correlation in new physics scenario between a lepton flavor mode, for instance, mu to e gamma, and g minus 2. And you see that uh, this was a plot done in 2006, and you see that the MEC constraint and G minus 2 has really shrink the uh, uh, allowed region for this, uh, for this scenario. But uh, before interpreting this discrepancy as new physics, we need to be sure that the hadronic background is under control, and this is really challenging. So more theoretical efforts are needed, and also more uh, experimental measurement. Okay, let me conclude. So, uh, so direct searches for new physics at the TV scale are, are, are done at LHE by ATLAS and CMS and exploring the energy frontier, but probing new physics order of magnitude beyond that scale and helping to decipher possible TV scale new physics require to work hard on the intensity and precision frontier. And, uh, Charge lepton offer a really an important spectrum of possibility. So we uh, so measuring or putting bound on lepton flavor violation, which is a standard model free signal. Um, there are current experiment and mature proposal to promise order of magnitude sensitivity improvements, 
which is very good. Then the muon G minus 2 may already have shown show a deviation from the standard model. But to be sure, this is a real deviation. We have to make progress towards a better knowledge of hadronic uncertainty. And uh, then what is interesting is all these uh, experiments allow you to, to, to uh, put a, st a strong constraint on new physics scenario that correlate these sectors. So I have shown you how charge lepton favor decays offer an excellent model discriminating tool giving indication on the mediator by uh, trying to, design, to see which is the operator structure for lepton flavor violating modes and the source of flavor breaking if you compare tau to mu, tau to e or mu to e uh, processes. And then I will show you an example to constrain lepton flavor violating Higgs decays where there is a nice interplay between low energy and collider physics. Thanks a lot. Can you say something more also on uh, the tau to mu kk? Do you have a similar study as uh, mu pi pi? So, um, uh, yes, so basically it's. Um, okay. So you see when we have applied this unitarity condition with two channels, we have basically the pi on form factor but also the k on form factor by a byproduct. So we could uh, also um, uh, really study, so get this form factor and study the bound on tau to mu kk. But in this case, we didn't do the study because the um, uncertainty coming from, uh, you have to, you actually you have to uh, match you form factor at low energy with chiral perturbation theory. And uh, in, for KK bar, SU free chiral perturbation theory is, is not very reliable. So you really need, in this case, we didn't really make a, an estimate of the uncertainty for pi pi, saying that they are negligible because it's uh, very well known SU2 and converge very well SU2 chiral perturbation theory. But for KK bar, we would have to make a real, a good estimate of the uncertainties. And I think we can, we can make it, we can do it, and we, we will be able, also we will be helped by the lattice determination of the form factor at zero momentum transfer that you can relate to the count mass, for instance. So I think we can do it, but we have not done it yet. mentioned the latest work of the Byrne group, so yes. uh, could you tell us about the impact on the theory error, assuming that this is a correct analysis? Yes, so it's not easy because they have not done it yet. I mean, it's in progress. They don't have numerical results. Oh, sorry. Uh, they don't have numerical results yet. And uh, basically the idea is to be model independent. So I don't know if they will reduce the uncertainty, but it will be much more robust because it will be model independent, this uncertainty. Uh, whereas now it's really educated, I think an educated guess and really model dependent, this uncertainty. So I cannot tell you more uh, until the, I know they are doing the, they are working on the numerics, but um, I don't, I don't know anything. And also it will depend on all, uh, what are the uncertainty coming from all these uh, measurements, right? I have a question. Uh, about the initial state radiation yes. compared with uh, yes. the missing, what are the, the issues? Can you just say a little bit more about uh, mm -hmm. these inconsistencies here? Yes. You are mentioning. So I'm not an expert, but uh, uh, okay. So the, this radiative return, basically, or this initial, initial state radiation, you you take uh, one gamma in the initial state, and to uh, to get uh, the energy, low energy, right? And um, I think you need to understand well um, the radiative correction in this case compared to implicit minus, direct implicit minus, where you don't have this, um, this problem. 
and I, there are some discrepancy at low energy between Novosibirsk, Chloe 2, and I think even between Chloe 2 and Bavar. But about the measurement or about the, the, about param the parameterization of the photon. So is it a theoretical issue or is it an experimental one? So the measurement of the, of the of their a plus and minus going to pi pi is different. The result is different by, by taking in the, the shape. By, by taking the, the photon. By including yes. the missing so, photon. But even Chloe 2, I think, and Babar are different. So B and this we have really to understand why, because they use the same technique, but not the same energy, right? So, but I cannot tell you really more. But it's an issue, and I know that uh, uh, some ex experimentalists in the collaboration said this was really an issue to take into account, well, this radiative correction, and... I w just want, wanted to know where the issue comes from. Okay. Yes, okay. okay. Thank you. So we, we're going to start the afternoon session, which uh, is on the experimental status and near-term prospects. And we're going to start with uh, Guglielmo Denardo, uh, who's going to talk to us about the status and prospect of Belt 2. Okay. First of all, thank you for, uh, to the organizers for, the, to, for inviting me to the workshop. I... Okay. <laughs> okay, um, I will talk about the status and prospects of the Bell 2 experiment. Um, ah, okay. Okay, okay, thanks. Um, so, few words on the physics motivations, the status of the project, and uh, of course what you want to know, the, uh, the highlights of physics. Okay, so Bell 2 uh, starts on, on top of the uh, successful uh, experimental program of the uh, B factories, Bell 2, uh, Bell, sorry, and Babar. Um, you can see here uh, uh, plots that uh, have become uh, something in textbooks for, for the students in particle physics. So we can say they established the CP violation in the B system and the uh, remarkable uh, consistency of the uh, CKM mechanism in the standard model. Uh, this uh, had the consequence of uh, the award of the Nobel Prize in Physics to Kobayashi and Maskawa. Unfortunately, they forgot Gabibbo, and this is a uh, uh, something I, 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 I photo I, I took at Keck uh, of Kobayashi and Mascara that thank the Keck and uh, KK and uh, Pep2 for, for uh, the work done. So, sorry. So, despite the, um, the, the efforts, uh, experimental efforts of Bavar and Bell, the, um, the standard model uh, didn't show any sign of, of breakdown. And um, the, uh, the triumph of the standard model uh, continued with the, the discovery of the, uh, of the Higgs boson exactly where it was expected, and uh, nothing yet, uh, nothing else uh, yet uh, found apart from that. So uh, this is a mission for Bell 2 and LHCB. Uh, would be to um, has to do with the, the role of flavor in the in search for new physics. So, uh, in a scenario where and this is what we everybody hopes, uh, new particles and interactions uh, are found in direct search, searches at uh, LHC um, to reveal the, the the flavor structure of, of the the um, new physics found. Or otherwise, uh, if uh, the new physics keeps uh, hiding uh, from us uh, to extend the search uh, to even higher uh, mass scales, uh, looking as with the flavor we do um, in possible, effect, possible effects at, uh, at low energy from, from these new particles and interactions. So, uh, 
Okay, so K, uh, K, uh, at KK, um, the upgrade of uh, KK B is going on, um, and um, the construction is uh, mostly done. So the commissioning will start uh, next year of the accelerator. Um, and the target is to have an instantaneous luminosity 40 times the, uh, the one of the president of, uh, of KKB. Um, so this is achieved uh, essentially with the nano beam scheme that was first proposed by, uh, by um, Pantaleo Ramondi uh, for Super B. And uh, many upgrades needed, uh, mean many accelerator uh, components and a, a little bit more current to, to achieve this goal that will uh, provide us, uh, you can see in this uh, table, the amount of uh, B pairs and uh, um, this yield the, the, the per year, okay? At instantaneous at, uh, at regime, at instantaneous luminosity. Okay, um, so, excuse me for the... Okay, uh, with more luminosity also come uh, more background. Uh, we anticipate uh, 10 to 20 times the background we had at uh, PEP2 or KKB. Uh, and with that comes uh, uh, worst occupancy in the detector, pile up, uh, it's not LSC pile up of physics, it's pile up of signals from background in the calorimeter, um, fake hits, uh, um, more radiation damage to cope with, uh, and higher event rates, mostly due to backgrounds, so that the L uh, level one trigger would be 20 kilohertz. And these uh, ask for an upgrade of the detector, if I can go. I'm sorry. Okay, so um, the detector uh, is upgraded uh, to, to um, respond to these uh, new conditions and um, also uh, adding improvements on, uh, on belt to performances, especially for interaction point and secondary vertex resolutions, okay, short reconstruction efficiency, a, a better muon identification and um, also K0 okay, long detection, um, charged count identification in the forward. So this uh, has important effects also on physics. Um, okay. So with this detector and the, um, the characteristics of a plus and minus uh, uh, collisions, uh, we have uh, unique capabilities at Bell 2 that can be exploited to, to, uh, to get um, a very broad uh, uh, physics program. So uh, I will summarize here um, the fact that we have exactly two quantum correlated uh, bimesonet Y4S, uh, so the, the event is very clean, um, no trigger bias, we are almost 100% uh, efficient in, in, uh, in uh, getting the B pairs, uh, excellent efficiency and resolution both in tracking as well, in, tracking as well uh, in detecting photons, k longs by zero, and reconstruction of all the intermediate resonances, and able to perform um, Dalitz plot studies. The clean environment, uh, in the sense to be compared to a, an hadron machine, uh, also permits uh, full interpretation of the whole event, which is uh, a powerful tool um, to do physics with missing energy modes when you have many neutrino in the final state or full inclusive uh, analysis. And together with the B uh, yield, um, we also get uh, a large sample of D mesons and, and tau leptons in a low background environment. <laughs> Quite unfortunate. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, 
facciamo con i tasti dai facciamo con i tasti ok so um, for example um, what I mean with full event interpretation is to uh, perform a full reconstruction of one of the two dimensions they are exactly two in the event uh, this can be done with a reconstructed a, 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 an adronic event fully reconstructed it or um, a partial reconstruction of the uh, semi-leptonic event and then look for the signal in the rest of the event so it's a sort of having a, a, a beam of single dimensions that you can analyze Analyze, looking for um, signal that have, that have, uh, signals that have weak experimental signature, like can be for decay with missing momentum, uh, like tau nu, um, or uh, inclusive, analysis, inclusive analysis, like when you want to reconstruct semi-leptonic events and you want to do it inclusively to measure VUB. But of course, uh, untagged analysis are still possible and will be done, for example, in cases like you have uh, a strong uh, signature like um, pi electron neutrino with the loose electron neutrino reconstruction that doesn't need to, need to measure all the details, or um, uh, purely leptonic events like uh, B2 mu nu, um, having a monochromatic muon in the, in the final state in the B rest frame, just is smeared a little bit in the, uh, in the lab frame, so um, could be enough also to having uh, untagged analysis. So the, um, the belt collaboration is already, um, is already uh, a large collaboration, as you can see from the map, uh, it's collaborators from uh, Asia to Europe to North America, and uh, is uh, even um, larger than uh, the bell one. So uh, physics highlights I, I will give now on selected topics, of course, uh, the program is very uh, is vast. Um, of course, uh, one of the um, important points of the physics program is to reduce uh, the uncertainties on uh, unitarity triangle uh, measurements, like the, uh, the angles, and those will be uh, substantially reduced. So um, we, will, we are going to have results that may be competitive with the LHCB, um, of course, uh, from the modes of our LCB, uh, like uh, with all uh, charged final states, LACB is expected to dominate. Uh, but uh, um, in some results, may, we may be competitive, and we can also add measurements uh, on, on many final states, uh, including neutrons. So at the end, we expect to, uh, to, to go down with the uncertainty on uh, alpha, beta, and gamma uh, at the level of one degree for alpha, uh, 0.2 degree for beta, and uh, between one and 1.5 degrees on gamma. And uh, especially gamma and VUB um, are important also because uh, um, they have a special role of setting the, the, the standard model baseline um, uh, for, uh, to look for, for interpreting the deviations of new physics uh, uh, starting from them. So um, we also look for additional sources of, uh, we are going to look for additional sources of CP violation, uh, like uh, the one that you, you, you have when the, the B go to, to, to strange. And uh, you can see uh, from the plot the prospects from, for several uh, penguin modes. Um, and the message is, is that we can go down to the asymmetry uh, to the level of 0.1 with the full data set. Of course, uh, here also some effort on theory is needed um, to, uh, to really constrain the, uh, the standard model uncertainty. Uh, so this is needed in, in view of the experimental progress expected. Uh, and uh, mixing induced CP variation with radiative penguins, for example, when uh, um, since the um, when we have the BS gamma uh, transition, uh, uh, the uh, the helicity uh, of the photon is constrained in the standard model because of helicity suppression, while new physics may uh, may bring uh, uh, enhance uh, the other helicity mode. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the, um, so left-handed versus right-handed. And this may enhance the, inter the interference among the two when you do um, CP asymmetries, time-dependent CP asymmetries, so this is mixing-induced. 
and um, over there uh, the standard model is, uh, uh, as I said, uh, elicit is suppressed, so we expect uh, minus 0.03, um, uh, while uh, extension may, may let the, the asymmetry grow up to 0.5, and the expectation, for, um, for example, in, uh, in case short by zero gamma uh, mode, um, as you can see from the, uh, the plot, uh, the, the, the red dot is the where the Bell 2 um, uh, ellipse error is expected to sit, uh, uh, and uh, compared to the, the actual to, to, cur to current measurements, uh, and the, the prospect for the future go down um, to uh, zero, zero point, uh, 0.02. Okay. Uh, also, um, techniques like. Uh, um, um, measuring inclusive, um, in measuring inclusive B2S or D uh, gamma decays are possible in Bell 2 with uh, some of exclusive uh, modes or fully inclusive uh, reconstruction of the uh, XS system. And uh, for the rate, uh, okay, we don't expect really, uh, we expect to, to, to reach soon the level of 5%, but also there the um, asymmetry, the CP asymmetry is interesting for new physics tests. And there we expect an experimental uh, uncertainty of 0.5%. Let's come to uh, view B. Um, here we have uh, um, the, uh, the, the two ways to, uh, to, to measure will be uh, in exclusive decays. Um, so we, um, these are, uh, from theory point of view, um, the uncertainty are determined from the knowledge of the form factors. And uh, experimentally um, are more constrained. So um, for, there, uh, for, for, those, for those modes, we, we are going to perform both untagged and tagged analysis. And inclusive uh, extraction of UB is possible at Bell 2, of course, probably only at Bell 2. Theory depends on uh, operator product expansion. Uh, here, the, uh, the, 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 um, the, uh, the number one, the, the enemy number one is the uh, B2CL new background, so that uh, a phase space must be selected to enhance the signal, the VUB signal, and uh, also there, theory is needed to extrapolate to full rate, so this is the, one of the, uh, the concern theory there. Uh, and also, tight selection from the experimental point of view may jeopardize uh, the extrapolation. So, for the, uh, from the experimental point of view, you can see here uh, how they look now uh, exclusive uh, um, B2U decays in Pi0, Pi plus, uh, in several modes, and uh, um, also uh, in the, the plot uh, at the bottom, you can see the, uh, the spectrum of the, um, the hadronic system uh, that is used to extract uh, VUB in the inclusive analysis. Um, so the, uh, the important part is here to control uh, the systematics on the, uh, from the charm background composition but also the U-fragmentation uh, for the inclusive analysis, I mean, and all this can be improved with Bell 2 because we are going to do a systematic measurement of all the uh, B2U transition and the, the, um, the B2 charm uh, lepton neutrino states. So uh, you can see here uh, view B um, exclusive and inclusive determination today uh, show uh, a significant difference, uh, statistical significant difference at the level of 3 sigma. Uh, this can be an effect uh, in experiment or something in the theory that is not correct or new physics or, <laughs> or a combination of that. Uh, this is a problem that, uh, one of the problems that uh, is expected to be settled at Bell 2. Uh, reducing the uncertainty uh, on view B and providing uh, uh, more consistency checks uh, that, can be from, that can be used um, to check theory and experimental effects. So you can, you can see here the, um, the extrapolation to Bell 2 for uh, uh, VUB extraction. Uh, if you can see the table, you, you find the, um, the experimental uncertainty that we expect to reach um, and at five, so early, and uh, with the full data sets, uh, both experimentally, uh, the systematic part, and what you expect uh, uh, to be the total error depending on the, 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 the theory uh, improvements. The assumption there is that the error can go down to the level of 2% for exclusive mode or to the level of 2-4% in inclusive modes. 
So uh, very promising are the exclusive analysis, as I, did, I, as I um, just said, uh, to perform a clean uh, and detailed exploration of them and uh, to, um, to observe the B2U exclusive mode spectra. Um, improvement uh, are needed also in theory prediction to, to fully take advantage of those measurements, of course. Uh, this start out new. Um, okay, this is uh, uh, clear from the, uh, the theory point of view. Um, just need a form factor uh, to be evaluated. New physics can, can come from charged Higgs. Uh, the ratio of B to D star tau uh, with respect to uh, electron immune has been measured by both Babar and Bell. This is not a simple analysis. Uh, experimental is hard. The signature of the uh, decay is not a, a, the, the usual peak uh, on a smooth background, you can see it's in, a, in, a, in a excess on, the, on a tail. So uh, data-driven methods are, uh, have been developed and uh, have to be used to control the backgrounds, especially the combinatorial background and the, the one that comes from this star star. So um, improvement in uh, this star star uh, understanding um, will help also this analysis to, to have this component under control. Everybody knows about the, uh, the, the excess uh, seen by Babar uh, and confirmed by Bell. You can see in this table the, the, the average and the, also the, um, the prospects for Bell 2, uh, what would be the error. And, the, um, and you, you see here that already now we, we killed the 2H uh, Dublin model type 2 for the charged Higgs. Um, the expectation for uh, Bell 2 is to, to shrink the, uh, the error and confirm the excess, of course, uh, at an early stage, uh, but with more data, uh, better understanding with the backgrounds can come, and uh, we also expect uh, better understanding of B2D star star uh, lepton neutrino, which is the most delicate background, uh, to measure differential distribution, so it's more than just having we we'll have a measurement at a level of few percent at the end of the dataset, but also have all the details of the, um, of the decay that can uh, give insight of new physics. Uh, I have to, to go a little bit uh, more quick. Um, so for exclusive distar nu, um, this is the most accurate uh, way to extract um, VCB. Of course, we have uh, we we have progress also here, especially in reducing the the, the, the work here is to uh, reduce the systematics uh, that is mostly detector uh, related. So most of the work will be to 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 shrink the systematic error, and uh, we expect to have uh, um, a competitive measurement also from DL new um, inclusive B to C. Uh, L new decays, uh, modest improvement, of course, because the, the, uh, the uncertainty is already very small, but um, uh, we expect uh, working on the systematics to go to down to a, uh, experimentally on a 0.5% ultimate systematic uncertainty, uh, and the theory will saturate the error, of course, here, but the deliverables are also to, um, from the experimental point of view, to a detailed exploration of B to D and pi lepton neutral and to uh, hopefully solve puzzles like the gap between inclusive and exclusive modes, uh, exclusive extraction of VCB, uh, probably also check uh, if uh, actually the exclusive modes really saturate the inclusive rate. Uh, purely leptonic BDKs, very clean theoretically, uh, quite hard experimentally. Um, in Bell 2, we will, we'll, uh, uh, of course, measure uh, quite early B2 tau nu, um, and uh, at the end, we can also check the lepton flavor universality, making the ratio between B2 tau nu and B2 mu nu, which is going to be measured, and uh, electron neutrino, of course, is out of reach because uh, um, the standard model level is out of reach, uh, but also uh, is going to be studied at the same level of, of B2 mu nu. Um, let me skip this one. So, uh, mu nu and electron neutrino, um, these are, have monochromatic lepton in the BRS frame, so in a uh, tagged analysis with one B fully reconstructed, we have the momentum of the B, and these uh, uh, searches are basically background free. 
And these are uh, the prospects for the measurements. You can see summarized in this plot. Uh, the message is that we'll have a, a bit of uncertainty down to uh, 3% or 5% at the end, depending on the systematics. Uh, a 20% uh, at early stage and, at seven, uh, um, um, and 7% on B2MU, mu -nu, assuming a standard model, of course. Um, so the, the real point here, um, the real point is to how to control the systematics, okay. How can we go down with systematics uncertainty? Electric penguins with charger laptops is another um, field uh, where uh, Bell 2 can, uh, can say a lot. Uh, of course, a B2K star mu muon decays is something uh, <laughs> that LHCB uh, is going to study very well. Uh, but um, Bell 2 has smaller statistics, um, can add uh, electron modes. Uh, which are measuring the same, same uh, um, sensitivity as the MUO modes, uh, can study uh, inclusive B2XS lepton plus lepton minus, which is also interesting uh, to, to, to measure and explore the third generation, so with tau in the final state. Um, so the, uh, the twin uh, decays uh, are electroweak pangs with neutrinos in the final state. This is possible, of course, only at Bell 2. Um, if we, we extrapolate to Bell 2 the, uh, what we have now with B factories, we get a 30% accuracy if we assume the standard model um, branching ratio. Uh, just with one tag method, the hadronic one. So, of course, uh, this is, I think, the the level we can uh, reach um, with some confidence, uh, but we can consider that also improvements in particular D, tagging efficiency, a better k -long rejection, uh, and background rejection with um, calorimeter uh, timing that we, we, we added. So uh, more improvements can come, so this may be even uh, too conservative. Um, tau decays, uh, together with uh, B pairs, we, we get, we get a, a large sample of uh, tau pairs, so we can explore, uh, okay, a, uh, tau physics is, uh, has many things interesting, but especially um, lepton flavor violation in tau decays, we, we talked about this, uh, this morning also, um, which is a clear a null test for the standard model. So, uh, Tau to three muons or three electrons are, are completely background researches in Bell 2. And uh, I don't know if uh, LHCB could, be, could do something if it's going to be competitive. It's something that you can do even at LHCB uh, with three muons, three charger muons. And, uh, but of course, this, um, you can see in this table all the kind of uh, lepton flavor violating modes that uh, we can study and the level that we expect to reach uh, at the end of the data set at the end of the data taking. Finally, charm, uh, a, a, um, something in which, uh, in which uh, LHCB is very strong. Um, we can complement the, and cross-check the measurements from LHCB and uh, also can add something that's unique um, in Bell 2, uh, performing um, the, the, the charm recoil technique, which is the analog of the uh, full B reconstruction that we already used um, for B. Uh, so that uh, leptonic decays of the D can be measured at 1% and 3% level, but also um, have a sensitivity to D to, uh, to photons, which is important for long uh, distance contribution to D to mu mu, and searching D to neutrino neutrino. Okay, let me conclude. Uh, of course, I've been, I must have been uh, partial in the uh, <laughs> discussing of the, the physics program. It's very rich and largely complementary to LACB. Uh, the unique capabilities uh, of the machine and the detector uh, and the plus and minus environment greatly improve the, the, um, the discovery potential in flavor physics, in B and D in tau flavor physics. Um, super B uh, construction uh, is on schedule. Uh, almost completed. Um, we'll start the commissioning at the beginning of 2015. Um, okay, there is nothing technical that can stop this apart from financial problems. <laughs> so, um, nothing, uh, this may 
may delay a bit uh, the schedule. Um, the physics run, uh, as uh, we know now, is anticipated to start at uh, late 2017. So what I have to say uh, to conclude uh, is that Bell 2 is a unique place to, to, um, to solve current patterns we also discussed this morning and shed light on uh, new physics from flavor. Um, for that, uh, more accurate theory predictions and also new ideas are, uh, have to be exploited, of course, and uh, refinements in experimental techniques um, to really let systematic uncertainty, that something that was assumed in, my extra, in the extrapolation that I showed, really shrink with the statistics. Uh, the physics program is still in the phase of building, so the details uh, are worked out, uh, the effort is ongoing, uh, and there is a, a particular effort that is ongoing uh, to gather experimentalists and theorists uh, that recently started is the Bell 2 Experiment Theory Interface Platform. Uh, I, I put here a link so you can uh, have an idea of it if you, you already, if you don't have already, uh, and possibly uh, join. Thank you. Any questions for Guillermo? I was curious about what's the currently planned expected duration of the running of uh, Bell 2. The duration, the expected duration. Ah, sorry, I, I actually didn't put a slide on this. Um, of course, there is a startup phase where the uh, accelerator has to reach the, uh, uh, the nominal luminosity, and um, and then we will reach in a few years the nominal luminosity, and uh, for then run four or five years uh, on. Uh, that. So the, the target integrated luminosity that we use is to uh, accumulate 50 inverse atobar. And this is when we are expected to stop. So five years of running, four or five years of running. You briefly flashed a, a slide on inclusive UB expectations. I guess from the numbers I think that you, you are assuming the current uh, technique to measure inclusive UB, but there is also this uh, effort uh, made, put forward by Tuckman and collaborators about uh, doing a global fit for shameless semi-leptonic decays, inclusive, with moments and so on and so forth. I wonder whether you consider that and what's Not the sensitivity. In Not in this table. Of course, this is part of the, uh, for sure, is, is going to be taken into account. In this, this seems yeah, to be a breakthrough in inclusive UB. We know about that. Uh, we know about that. And this table just reflects what are the extrapolations from current measurements using Bell results uh, and extrapolating uh, um, the statistical error with luminosity. And um, trying to separate what we feel is reducible and unreducible in the systematic uncertainty. So that reducible means something that we can uh, improve with statistics because we have larger control samples, we can extract from real, from, uh, real data um, the, uh, the systematic uncertainty. Yeah, so should shrink with statistics also. So this is a guess, um, guess estimate. You have, sorry? And this is, you, you, you should read the, here the, um, the experimental, expected experimental part. And then you can make a, may have a guess on the theory. If you make the guess that, for example, with the inclusive, we go to 2, 4 percent, you got a final error, which is, uh, of course, more than 1 percent that I promised, but the 1 percent I promised is here in the experimental part. So it depends on how much the theory is going to, uh, to, to shrink the uncertainty. I think here, uh, th these are extrapolation, by the way, from the current Bell measurements. Mention uh, for tau is a tau lepton flavor uh, violating prospect at Bell 2. And do you also have prospect for adronic, measuring adronic tau decays like CP violating asymmetry on tau to k pi? And also the spectral function of tau going to hadron that allow you to extract, for instance, the strong coupling constant with a very good precision? Well, I, I just uh, selected 
few parts of the program. Of course, uh, uh, every, that, everything that can be exploited, depending on the working, uh, the, uh, the manpower that is willing to work on it, uh, will be exploited. Of course, this is something that can be done uh, with no problem. It's just a matter of uh, work on it, uh, working at it. At it. Okay, if there are no other questions, we can thank Guillaume, uh, Guillaume again. Now we have Mark Maggiora, who's going to talk to us about the prospects, in, uh, the results in the prospects. Three, sorry. non va indietro questo si può riprovare con questo questo funziona come il mouse cioè è sempre attivo okay. questo manda avanti questo manda avanti è puntato ah ok è sempre attivo ok grazie ok Let me first thank the organizers for having invited me to this workshop where we report on the latest uh, measurements from BES3 with a particular focus on those related to flavor physics. Uh, BES3 is uh, no more. Keyboard. Yes, it's a better keyboard. <laughs> Don't worry, I will use the keyboard. So BES3 is no more a collaboration composed mostly of uh, Chinese physicists and uh, we have a significant contribution from European and US researchers together with uh, Russian researchers. The Bestri experiment is hosted on the Beijing Electron Positron Collider 2. That is a, a significant improvement of the previous version of the collider with a uh, two order of magnitude higher luminosity, design luminosity, and we are already around uh, Uh, we are already around uh, uh, 70% of the uh, design luminosity. The best three uh, spectrometer inherits the design of the best two spectrometer. It is again a significant improvement because we have a much better energy resolution and a large magnetic field around one Tesla. We started to collect data in 2009 and up to now we have collected at the energies of these three charmonium states these statistics, the green numbers. And uh, let me stress the point that the analysis I will report in and hence their statistical significance is referred to the blue numbers because we could analyze only a small fraction of the data already available. And even if up to now we have analyzed roughly, uh, one, we have collected one tenth of the intended statistics that are the red numbers, we have already more data in our storage than any other previous experimental scenario. The DPC2 collider may reach higher energies up to here, and more data have been collected in the last years at these center of mass energies and to perform these scans. And more data are of course coming from the this and next year data taking. So let's start from the radiative transition of the gem sign, in particular from the one to gamma eta eta. Uh, we have performed a PWA on this data set, favoring this uh, contribution from the best solution and uh, excluding these other contributions that are in principle hallowed. The agreement between the uh, best solution and the experimental data is excellent and excludes a tensor contribution from the phase space. The Best solution uh, contains a significant contribution from these uh, two scalar components, while there is no clear contribution from the F0-1370. And we are also, uh, provide, the best solution also includes a smaller contribution from these tensor components. At the best three, we have observed and confirmed the near threshold 
uh, announcement in this WSI suppressed radio transition of the GMSI to omega phi. And under, with a very uh, lazy uh, assumption, so we uh, perform a PWA, providing as a best solution uh, a solution that is confirming the enhancement interpretation provided by BESTU, a resonance DX1810, but with a ma much larger statistical significance of around 30 sigmas. The best solution provides this resonance parameter for the X1810 and this branch infraction that, as I said before, is significantly larger than that would be expected considering the WRC rule violation. Uh, our solution favors a scalar nature, confirming the early observation by BESTU. And uh, while uh, we can exclude that this resonance, the X1810, is not the X1835 or the PP bar announcement that we report in the next slides, we cannot exclude yet contribution from an artificial appearance of F on FS01710 or a final state interaction. To have a better understanding of the nature of this resonance, we need to collect more data from these decay modes or for these related processes. As I said, that was not the only neatricial announcement. An artificial announcement in the gamma PP bar final state had been observed by base 2 and confirmed by Haas with a better statistical significance, leading to these resonance parameters uh, just performing an S wave rate with their fit. But in our case, the statistics collected is much larger, one order of magnitude, so we could perform a PWA that leads to a, a best solution with a very large statistical significance, including the uh, PP bar. Uh, formation with this resonance parameter and indicating also in this case a scalar nature. We have also determined for the first time the corresponding branch infraction. We have observed a radiative transition to the X1835 that I cited before considering this final state produced together with these two other resonance. In this case, we have not yet performed a PWA. The analysis uh, has, has to be uh, concluded with a PWA, but our preliminary investigation points toward also in this case a scalar resonance. And if we consider other final state, we have also observed a radical transition to a resonance that is slightly uh, with a larger mass, around 1840, with a large statistical significance. Also in this case, the PWA had not yet been performed as this uh, final state that provides us uh, a clear evidence with a very large statistical significance of the formation of a resonance to again a mass that is even slightly larger, around 1870, produced together with the eta 1405 and this F1. So the situation is pretty puzzling because we have a set of resonances that are clustered here, just below the PP bar threshold, that are all formed in James R relative the case. Uh, the interesting part is that they cannot be final state interaction because they are not observed in say prime uh, the case. And uh, we have to perform a full PWA of these states to understand uh, better the nature of these resonances and frankly speaking also to understand if we are speaking of one single particle or not. We have also investigated the Psi prime radiative transition to the P gamma PP. The situation at threshold is uh, remarkably different. We have still an announcement but not as announced, with, uh, as in the case of the GMSI, the best solution for the PWA leads to uh, assuming the same resonance parameter that has been determined for the GMSI relative to the case to this branch infraction and to a production ratio that is remarkably lower than what would be expected in terms of QCD. So sticking to the Psi prime transitions, we have investigated carefully the radiative transition of the Psi prime. In particular, we provided the best measurements from the eta C resonance parameters, and we observed for the first time this radiative transition to the eta C prime. 
The ground state of the Charmomni Eta C has been investigated for a long time, but is poorly known uh, if compared with other Charmomni states. In particular, uh, recently, uh, gamma gamma processes and be the case provided a set of measurements from the mass and width that were systematically larger than those historically extracted by the radiative transitions of the uh, other charm states to the eta C. At best 3 we had uh, large enough statistics to uh, observe these final states and to clearly identify a resonance, sorry, an interference between the resonance and the non-resonant contribution of the background. An interference that strongly affect the mass and width measurements and so partially explain the discrepancy that I reported before. Uh, we provide, with the simultaneous fit of these final states, these resonance parameters that are the most precise measurement of the eta C mass and width that fall in the same sector of those recent measurements that were departed from the historical measurement from the radiative transitions. So, accounting for the interference, we can explain this discrepancy. And the hyperfine mass splitting that we obtain with these new values are in perfect agreement with theoretical predictions, both considering quark models and lattice calculations. You can see here a summary of... Okay, sorry. Uh, the slide that disappeared. I, was just want, I just wanted to show you that our results were in good agreement. So let's come to the eta C prime. The eta C prime have been observed in different decay modes, but before BST there was no evidence of this one transition from the Psi prime to the eta C prime. And for the first time, BST observed this transition considering these final states. If we perform a simultaneous fit of these two final states, we have a clear contribution from, uh, uh, of the eta C prime and uh, making use of this uh, branch inflection measure by Babar, with a large statistical significance, we can determine the branch inflection of the fuel chain and hence the branch inflection of uh, the radiative transitions, uh, transition that is in good agreement with the uh, theoretical predictions and with the uh, upper limit experimentally previously set by Clio C. We have also observed a C contribution in uh, these other final states with uh, smaller statistical significance and resonance parameters that are slightly different but within one sigma from those previously shown for the other two final states. So here again a summary for the C prime measurements that includes the later best three measurements that I just reported before. Coming to the HC, HC was very poorly known before BES3. It was identified and confirmed at Fermilab, but its only production mode was identified by Clio C with a limited statistics that was not enough to determine the corresponding branch infraction. At BES3, we have a statistics large enough that we can investigate the HC production from the Psi prime through the decay to pi naught HC with and without considering the radiative transition to the eta C. So if we consider the pi naught recoil mass, we can perform an inclusive measurement, while if we consider the uh, uh, transition photon or exclusive decay modes of the eta C, we can perform exclusive measurements of the eta HC uh, resonance parameters. You can see here the recoil mass of the pi naught with and without the photon tagging, and the corresponding mass, re, uh, mass and width, the resonance parameters, are in good agreement with the error measurements of Clio C within error bus, but we can also perform for the first time the evaluation of the corresponding branch infractions that are in good agreement with theoretical predictions. These are first measurements. We can also reconstruct these 16 exclusive charge decay modes of the eta C, accounting for roughly 40% of the total eta C decays. And if we perform a simultaneous fit, we obtain uh, a new evaluation of the resonance parameters that is in good agreement with and more precise uh, of the earlier previous measurements from inclusive approaches. The branch inflection of these 16 decay modes have been determined, five of them for the first time. And let me stress the point that while when we go and reconstruct the, uh, HC, uh, the HC shape, we have a much cleaner 
a much cleaner uh, line shape without the interference that is observed in the radiative transitions. So even for this, for the time being, is not the most precise. Okay, this has died also. Even if uh, the relative transition, sorry, these measurements is not the most precise because we have collected only a small fraction of data that are intended to be collected, when we will have the full statistics, th this way will become the golden way to assess the theta C resonance parameters because the line shape is perfect without any evidence of interference. So, if we look at the charmonium chart, uh, all the states below the DD threshold have been observed and described in terms of the charm anti charm potential. While if we go above, many predicted states have not been observed, many unpredicted states have been observed, and few of the predicted states have been observed but with different properties. So, at BES3, we perform a systematic investigation of the production of ease. XYZ uh, for um, mesons, and uh, uh, to achieve such a goal, we make use basically of two golden final state. The first one is the pi pi James psi, where we exploit the two electronic decay modes of the James psi in order to have a signal basically without background. So, if we make use of this very clean data set, we can have an excellent uh, data set to investigate the exotic mesons. With a cross-section that is in perfect agreement with the earlier measurements, both from Babar and Bell. The other golden channel is the pi pi HC final state, in which we perform the reconstruction of the 16 exclusive decay modes, charge modes, of the eta C that I introduced before. You can see here the HC line shape as reconstructed for the data coming at 40 to 60 MeV from the 2013. And if we perform the same selection of events for the different center of mass energies collected up to now, we can evaluate the cross-section that is of the same order of magnitude with respect to the pi pi gem cross section that has been determined previously by Bell. Up to now, we collected data and up to 4.40 MEV, and we want to collect data at higher energies up to the top energy that BPC2 may provide. So these data sets have uh, produced already quite interesting results. If we consider the pi pi gem psi final state, and we look at the pi gem psi invariant mass for the two charge states, we see a clear enhancement in the same place at 3900, and a uh, lower mass uh, phase space reflection. And if we add these two contributions, we can perform a fit that provides us, uh, with a large statistical significance, the evidence of a new particle, the ZC3900. That is a very strange beast because it is charged, but it is coupled with charmonium. So it has to be composed of at least four quarks. So these uh, uh, new resonance have been immediately maybe 10 days, confirmed by Bell, and later by the analysis of Clio C data performed by the Northwestern University Grab. All the resonance parameters determined by the three experiments are in agreement with error bars. So even if the C3900 is pretty new result, it is also pretty much established. We uh, consider the indication from Clio C with a 3.5 sigma statistical significance that it could exist a neutral isospin uh, mate of the two charge states that we did observe. And uh, so we looked for it in the pi pi gem psi final state neutral. And we did observe with a very large statistical significance the last uh, element of the isospin triplet for the ZC3900 that has hence been formed all the states have a statistical significance from 8 to 10 sigmas. Since 3900 is uh, the ground state of this new particle composed of at least four, trucks, four tracks, we looked for states in the pi pi HC final state, and uh, we found uh, an even more funny uh, line shape. We observe an announcement at 3900 that corresponds to a transition of the HC to the 3900, but we observe a clear announcement 
at 4020 that can be fitted and provide with a large statistical significance the resonance parameters of a new charge state coupled with germonium. That means, again, we are speaking about at least four quarks. The statistics is large enough that we could in determine the uh, production cross-section for the three central mass energies that we could investigate, and uh, we could also evaluate the um, production cross-section. Also in this case, we looked for a neutralizer spin partner, considering the pi not pi not HC final state, and we could observe a five sigma indication of the uh, resonance parameters of the neutral isospin partner. So also in this case, we could form an isospin triplet at 4020, and if we observe the cross-sections, this cross-section is roughly one half of the cross-section of the charged states, in good agreement with what one could expect considering isospin invariance. Both the C3900 and the C4020 are close to relevant thresholds. In particular... <laughs> If we evaluate the production fraction, it is around 6. That is lower than the 12% that would be expected uh, from QCD predictions. And if we consider the D star, D star uh, threshold, sorry, D star, D star final state, again, we, find, we found close to the D star threshold uh, an announcement that leads, again, with more than 10 sigma to a resonance parameters that are uh, these ones, and let me stress the point that uh, 4026 is very close to 4020, and the 3885 is very close to 3900. I will come back later to this point. At best 3 we have also investigated for a production of the X3072, 3872. Uh, the clear Psi' ISR signal is used to for validate the data and for energy calibration, and we see a contribution at 38.72 at these two center of mass energies. If we add these two data samples, we obtain a very limited signal, roughly 20 events, 20 events that anyhow provide a large statistical significance because we have basically no background. The resonance parameters that are obtained fitting this announcement are in good agreement with those from the BDG. But the more interesting point is that if we plot a cross section that can be determined at four center of mass energies, we see how they perfectly overlap the Y4260 line shape. That means that you are probably looking at a radiative transition of the Y4260 to the X3872 with this production ratio. So summarizing which are the published results from S3, uh, we have determined two isospin triplets considering the pi James psi and pi HC final state. And we have determined uh, resonances that are very close to the state, charge state of these two triplets looking at upper charm uh, final states. In both cases, we are speaking about particles composed of at least four quarks, because they are charged and coupled to germonium. We are near threshold. We are speaking of uh, isospin triplets. We want to acquire uh, more statistics in order to understand if for each isospin triplet we are speaking of one single particle or really of two different particles. Let's move to most recent and preliminary results. We have observed for the first time the production of the Chi C0 with an omega at uh, these two center of mass energies, while we have no evidence of a production at a higher energy or of a production, sorry for the typo, this is a 2, of the Chi C1 and Chi C2 at the three center of mass energies. The line shape of the production of the omega Chi C0 is not consistent with the Y4260, and if we perform a fit, it points toward a narrow structure 
that is slightly uh, moved around 40 to 30 MeV. But let me stress the point that these are yet preliminary results. We have also investigated the KC production in these final states. At this center of mass energies, we have a limited indication of a very limited indication of the production of KC0, while we see clear evidence of the production of the KC1 and 2. We can simply add the two final the, sorry, uh, the four data samples at the center of mass energies, and we attain the top plot, but we can uh, perform a simultaneous fit of the data collected at the three and at the four center of mass energies, assuming that the cross section is following the Y4260 line shape. And in such a case, we obtain the bottom picture in which we have this statistical significance for the KC1 and KC2 production. If we determine the bone cross section, we have these plots for them at the four considered center of mass energy, and assuming that the decay C is not produced, we determine the corresponding upper limits, the red squares, that are in good agreement with theoretical predictions from non relativistic QCD calculations. Finally, we have also investigated the production of the gamma phi James Psi final state considering these decay modes of the phi and the 2 d epitonic decay modes of the James psi, in order to probe for the production of the Y4140. This is not the case. We have no evidence of the production of such a state. And these are the upper limits that have been determined at the three center of mass energies that we have analyzed. So assuming this uh, range infraction from theoretical predictions and assuming the cross-section measured for the X3872 by best 3 that I just reported on, we can, as, uh, we can state that the production of the Y4140 is suppressed of at least one order of magnitude if compared to the one of the X3872. So coming to the conclusion, I reported on the latest results focusing just to those related to the flavor physics and the production of exotic final state. Let me stress the point that all the analyses I reported have been performed on a tiny fraction of the data already collected and that more data will be collected. So the data I have reported on are justly 100 of the data that will be available in 2020, in, in 2022, and most likely in 2024, because most likely BES3 uh, will be extended up to 2024. Um, new uh, data are being collected now, and the luminosity is continuously climbing, so we should reach the design luminosity of APC2 in one or two years. Now we are at 70%, that means 7, 10 to the 32. More PVA are in progress, and new PVA will be performed on those final states that have not yet been analyzed with partial wave analysis. So stay tuned, because many more exciting results are on their way. Thanks. Questions? Uh, this is a, a little bit out of the scope of your presentation, but are there people uh, working at the pi pi cross section at uh, low invariant mass, which is a very useful uh, measurement for G minus 2? Yes, they are working on that, but we are at an early stage of this analysis. Probably it would go out in one, one year and a half from now. If I understand correctly what you say, that there is only a fraction of the data that has been analyzed up to now. With one six, to one seven, uh, it considering the different what is keeping you? What is the biggest hurdle for completing the analysis? Manpower. Because we have so many data, we are uh, around 360. Most of them are also working on the analysis, but uh, since uh, the um, computational load is uh, 
remarkable to analyze all this data, we prefer to perform a quick pass on our data to see if there was something interesting and coming out from the first pass. And the answer is yes, we observe a lot of things. Now we will have a change in our computational model. We have moved uh, the analysis scheme to a cloud computing distributed of different sites around the world, and uh, we will more than double the computing power that we have to perform our analysis. You say this main power, it's actually computer power. No, no, main power and computer power, both. I mean, people have to sleep a couple of hours a day, so. <laughs> Just a principal uh, question of an non-expert regarding this XYZ state. So we know everything below the charm threshold. We understand Chamonium states very well. And above, there's a lot of things it's happening. Quite a mess, and the yeah. last uh, discussion about these uh, states I witnessed, there was uh, the claim that possibly all those states are just threshold effects. Is there ev experimental evidence that this is not true? No, uh, it's, uh, it's not that way. I, we have evidence that uh, we have isospin triplets in uh, the uh, pi pi gmsi and pi pi hc final state. Then we observe what is happening in the charm, open charm states and we see resonances that are most likely not uh, threshold efforts because uh, we want to understand if they are the same or different particles with respect to the, those that we observed in the other final state. There is no clear evidence at all that we are speaking about threshold efforts. There are clear resonance with modern 10 sigma's uh, statistical significance. They are states what we observe, not threshold efforts. Yeah, the, the problem is that we see slightly different um, masses. And then threshold efforts could be the cause of such a shift or could be something more complicated. And we need much more statistics to understand this. Sorry, just a point to our colleague. The uh, statement that we analyzed only a small fraction of the data available is valid only for the James Psi, Psi Prime, and Psi Double Prime states. We analyzed, of course, all the data collected in the XYZ sector. So we really need to collect more data. But it's time consuming because we have to. Uh, perform very precise scans and uh, we not lose, but we use a lot of time of uh, machine people to correctly tune the detector every time that we move the center of mass energy of the collider. So moving, uh, performing the scan uh, is much more time consuming than collecting data at the fixed energy of the Chamon state. You can rule it out that these are just threshold effects. Yeah. Yes, what we cannot rule out is the threshold effect is the one causing the shift. Okay. <laughs> okay, um, well, thank you again, Marco. And, uh, And we have uh, Gaia Lanfranchi, who is going to talk to us about the physics prospects in uh, the LHCB upgrade. Okay. Okay, thanks for inviting me. I'm going to present you the physics perspective of the LECB upgrade. And I will try uh, to do with you somehow an open brainstorming uh, also about the weak points of this uh, project. Uh, since we are in a workshop, we can discuss freely. So uh, I will try to give you my personal point of view, clearly based on uh, official plots and numbers uh, about what we are going to do in LECB in the next uh, decade. So what is the mission of a fluorophysicist for me, uh, I guess for all of you, is to look for new physics uh, in most, uh, mostly flavor changing neutral current B, K on charm decays, 
and charged lepton flavor violating decays that can be sensitive to quantum correction from degrees of freedom at or above the electroweak scale. So this is our main mission, essentially. We have to dig inside this field. The success of the CKM picture so far is impressive if you look uh, how much has been gained from in the last uh, 12 years, 13 years, uh, from EPS 2001 to Murion 2014 is impressive. However, besides the fact that uh, the picture looks very, very consistent, uh, if we parameterize new physics contribution in a model independent way, assuming uh, an arbitrary uh, amplitude and phase to be added to, for example, delta F equal to transition, and despite the fact that the LECB in the run one was able to push the constraints in the B sub S sector at the same level as the B factories before us did in the B sub D sector, we see that uh, still new physics contribution con could, could uh, be there at the level of 20-30% level with respect to the standard model. We don't know. We still constrain somehow in a very broad way this kind of model independent uh, new physics contributions. And uh, if you look from this, uh, from this uh, paper from CKM FIT uh, group, uh, that was quite recent, it was a year ago, but essentially most of the LACB results were already out, you see how things can evolve in the next, uh, let's say, uh, 15 years. Here is what it was a year ago, it didn't change that much since then. This what, uh, so is a correction at the level of 20-25% in the phase versus amplitude of new physics uh, plane for BD and B sub S. This is how things can evolve in after run two uh, for LECB assuming seven inverse Fentoban and Bell two collecting five inverse Aptoban. So we are going to sh shrink this uncertainty to 10%. And then uh, we, uh, uh, what we can have after the upgrade, so 15 inverse Fentoban for LECB and 50 inverse Aptoban for Bell two could reach a level of 5%. How this translates in constraint on new physics uh, is already outlined from in this paper. And you see that uh, if we reach an accuracy of 5-10%, we can put constraint uh, on physics uh, on ma mass of new particles in the 10-20 TV range if they contribute at the three level. While we are going to scan the range between 1 and 2 TV if they enter in the loop suppression, which is essentially the, the, the case of, uh, of the flavor physics. And so you see that here this will be somehow the ballpark uh, that uh, uh, LECB upgrade will range, will, uh, will scan. That is somehow the ballpark of the glino mass is explored, uh, uh, that will be explored at the LEC with the 14 TV cent of mass energy. Parenthesis, uh, we know uh, that uh, already now stop mass and gluino mass that mostly could contribute in delta F equal to transition are already excluded at 700-800 GV and uh, for the stop and gluino at 1.2 TV. So we are already almost there. The problem is uh, this sensitivity to mass of new physics uh, scales uh, has uh, 1 over n to the 1 over 4, so really is very slow, and that's why we need a lot of luminosity, and that is why also we need to upgrade the detector for LCB. So you see here, this is the situation in run 2, we collect the 3 inverse Fentoban, this will be the situation after uh, in run 1, this will be the situation in after run 2, so um, increasing cross-section and luminosity, we are going to increase the yield of a factor almost 4, and then uh, in uh, around uh, about uh, 2030, we will have uh, a factor 20 with respect to what we had in run one. That's why we had to uh, upgrade the detector and uh, you will have a detailed description of all the detector component in the next talk by Alessandra. What I want to discuss with you is uh, the reach of uh, LECB upgrade and here I present you a table that has been presented many times uh, and this has been up recently updated uh, for the ECFA workshop we had in Aix-les-Bains uh, a couple of months ago where you can see the reach of the LECB upgrade but I want to stress with you that these extrapolations are somehow naive. They assume the scaling of the accuracy with square root of L and this is uh, somehow is reasonable. The gain of a factor 2 from uh, the removal of the first level trigger for hadronic VDKs and a bit more for hadronic charm decays. 
but this also assumes the same HLT efficiency, reconstruction, stripping, selection, and particle ID efficiency as we had in run one, and the same level of background. And this, uh, uh, I mean, is something that we have to prove that is the case. So, first question I want to ask is, uh, are we going to be dominated by systematic uncertainties? So let me uh, flash uh, just a couple of examples. Uh, first one is uh, the bis best mixing, uh, where uh, we recently had uh, the, uh, the, the, um, the update of the measurement of the phi S, for example, in BS to JPSI KK and BS to JPSI PI PI. LCB currently is dominating the world average with this beautiful result. And, uh, uh, and the, we are unfortunately very well uh, compatible with the standard model prediction at the level uh, still uh, of 100% of the central value, you see. We are fully dominated by statistical uncertainty that right now are eight times the systematic uncertainties. If you look in detail how the systematic uncertainty, uncertainties are affected this measurement, you will see that uh, phi s is mostly dominated by the knowledge of the angular acceptance, is a pure statistical problem, so this is, uh, will go down with uh, statistics, while the gamma s and delta gamma s are suffering from uh, the uh, bias introduced by the silicon detector uh, acceptance and the trigger efficiency. And these two points are going to be uh, clear, um, quite well uh, improved by the upgrade where we are, assume, where we are going to build a uh, silicon detector that should avoid this kind of bias and a fully software trigger that should be avoided this bias we have right now by cutting on the IP impact parameter. Unfortunately, we don't see any deviation in, even in the gluonic penguin decay, which is uh, somehow the brother of the BS2 JPSI phi. The BS2 phi phi, this is a purely hadronic uh, decay, and uh, the phi S has been extracted. In principle, the, 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 the contribution from new physics are possible in this gluonic penguin. The results we had based on the full statistics of round one, unfortunately, is very well in agreement with the standard model prediction, and we don't see uh, any, any deviation from that. Even this decay suffers from the no knowledge of the angular acceptance and time acceptance, but again, this should be somehow improved with the, uh, improved the upgraded silicon detector and the trigger for the upgrade. These are the projection for phi S, so essentially we are not going to be, uh, to be limited by systematic uncertainty as far as we can say today. In uh, the red points are LCB, the blue points are Atlas, the, the, full, dot, uh, the full, full triangles are the JPSI phi, the open triangles are the phi phi. And you see the phi phi, we will have a big jump due to the fact that we will remove the first level trigger. This should, in principle, allow us to have a much larger yield with respect to a simple increase with the luminosity. But what could limit these two measurements is the tagging efficiency and its knowledge. This will be a crucial point. And on the other side, the control of the penguin pollution we discussed this morning because the control mode relies on the assumption of SU3 breaking correction. So the, if this will not be under control, this could be a potential showstopper for, for the ultimate accuracy LACB upgrade that could obtain. And the question that raises also is uh, since we know this relation that uh, link uh, the B physics with the Kion physics, uh, the question for uh, Augusto is uh, will uh, the Kion measurements be at the same level uh, in 2028? And it would be nice to cross check uh, these, uh, these, uh, these quantities. Mixing can be also studied in semi leptonic asymmetries, and we do it. Despite the zero showed a few years ago a discrepancy with the standard model prediction, LACB recently uh, published the full analysis of uh, semi leptonic asymmetry for the B sub D with three inverse pentoburn. The B sub S is still one inverse pentoburn, both of them are consistent with standard model. 
But here the, the systematic uncertainty matter because we need to have a, a very deep control of the detection asymmetry. And for the BD some, uh, mode, we have the dominant systematic also coming from the production asymmetry because we are a proton-proton collider. So this will be clearly a, a tricky channel to where the systematic uncertainty will play a role in the upgrade. Let's move to the realm of the rare decays that maybe I'm more, uh, I'm more uh, close to. Uh, in the rare decays, we are uh, scanning uh, the, possi the possibility to have a new physical contribution in Wilson coefficient that can affect the different observables like angular distribution in the B to K K star mu mu, branching fraction in B mu mu, and photon polarization in, uh, for example, Bs to phi gamma. And, uh, 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 in the rare decays, the constraints to new physics are even looser than in mixing. So if you plot uh, all the possible Wilson coefficient, uh, one against the other, uh, allowing for new physics uh, contribution, you will see that all of them are compatible with the standard model prediction, but one so far, which is the famous C9 that uh, we were discussing even before during the talk of Tobias. In fact, uh, one of the first puzzling deviations in LCB was uh, seen in the BD to K star mu mu in 2013. And uh, this, was, uh, uh, this has received so far a lot of uh, attention from theorists uh, because, uh, I mean, there was a clear deviation in uh, this bin, uh, the level of 3.7 sigma discrepancy in this region, that could be explained by a negative new physics contribution to the, physics, uh, to the Wilson coefficient C9. And we have a very long list of theory paper that went out after this result was published. Another puzzling deviation was uh, published last year is in the RK measurement in 2014. In fact, we measured the value which is uh, uh, below the standard model prediction, assuming uh, lepton universality. So it's consistent or inconsistent with the standard model at 2.6 sigma. Here you see the LCB measurement here. And this uh, is clearly another intriguing result that should be uh, somehow checked in the coming run. A third passing deviation is the fact that all the, measure, all the branch infraction containing a couple of muons in the final state, and we tested them in the star mu mu case, in the phi mu mu case, are all below the standard model prediction, um, assuming the state of the art from factor from lattice QCD and so on and so forth. And you see that if you make an average between LCB, CDF, CMS, and ATLAS, they are constantly below what you expect from the theory and are compatible with this red line that is, somehow allows us to have a, somehow a, a, an interpretation common, common interpretation for all these anomalies, that is new physics in the, uh, assuming a zeta prime, uh, zeta prime uh, particle with flavor violating couplings with the muons, but with a mass that should be at the level of 7 TV to escape the limit from direct searches and from mixing. So it's a very ad hoc theory that allows us anyhow to somehow explain in a coherent way the three deviations that we have observed so far. Clearly, I have to point out again that NA62 will probe the same underlying physics using the Keon to Pi on new new bar decays. So it will be extremely interesting in the coming years to see if these anomalies will be confirmed or not. At this respect, while RK is theoretically extremely clean, the uh, P5 prime, as we discussed before, are, and also the branch infraction even more, are plagued by sizable hadronic uncertainties. Different treatments of factorizable, non factorizable correction can give a different prediction. And uh, the real point is. Uh, once we will, have in the, will be in the upgrade and we will collect uh, uh, these kind of uh, yields, uh, this will allow us to push down the accuracy on these points by factor 3, 4. Will uh, the theory prediction able to predict the standard model shape at the same level? Here you see a very extreme case. This is the, the case we were discussing before, uh, predicted by Ronan Zwicky and collaborators, where you see how uh, different treatments of the non factorizable correction can change completely the shape of P5 prime. So essentially, they spoil any kind of uh, hint of new physics. And, uh, and uh, so this is the main question about this channel. 
Another puzzling deviation, and this is only a deviation, uh, is uh, about the branching fraction of the B sub D to mu mu. Probably um, only few of you knows, know that uh, we have an update of this measurement uh, due to the combination of LACB and CMS results uh, that was uh, sent to archive and is going to appear on Nature very soon where uh, you will find that uh, the B sub S has been observed by, uh, at, uh, uh, sorry, this is <laughs> clearly is, uh, opposite, the B sub S has been observed at 6.2 sigma, the B sub D at the level of 3 sigma, but the B sub D with a value which is four times the standard model prediction, even if the errors are large, so they, there is a compatibility at 2.2 sigma level. In this plot of minimum flavor violation, you should have B sub D here, the B sub S here, the LACB and CMS results is out of the scale because of the, is a four. And uh, I mean, uh, we have to wait for run two really because uh, this uh, we have to understand uh, if this is a really uh, a real effect or not. But uh, for example, uh, you see already that uh, a part of new physics that could explain this kind of enhancement has been already constrained by the K-star mu mu if new physics is in the Z and penguin. So clearly this is an open game, it's just a passing deviation, but we have the duty to pin down the accuracy. The ratio, which is very important for the minimum flavor violation, clearly does not fit with the standard model prediction, always at the level of 2.3 sigma level, and this is the extrapolation of the ratio of B sub D over B sub S in the upgrade, where you will see, uh, you see that uh, even at the end of the LCB upgrade, uh, we will be still far from the theory prediction, and, uh, um, and uh, the main limiting factor from, uh, from, uh, from an experimental point of view will be the control of the peaking background. So this will be strictly, we rely on how well the uh, MIS-ID and uh, MIS-identification performance will be during the upgrade. Question that I want to ask with you is, are these extrapolations reliable? So in order to answer this question, I want to, first of all to have a look into the past and compare what we measure with LCB during round one with respect to what we predicted uh, that we, we, will, we were measuring uh, before the data taking 20, in 2009. And I look into the future, looking which are the performance that we outlined to have in the several TDRs that we just published about the upgrade, and they were very recent, uh, were somehow published this year. So into the past, uh, you see, for example, an example of FIS. FIS, uh, we uh, were saying, claiming uh, during uh, our simulation work, that with two inverse Fento but not 14 TW, we would have measured FIS at 0.03 radians. What we have done with the three inverse Fento but a lower uh, center of mass energy, which is somehow equivalent of having two inverse Fento but a 14 TW, is an accuracy of 0.05. So in this case, the predictions were somehow more optimistic and the the name of the game here was the tagging efficiency. Tagging efficiency turned out to be slightly worse with respect to what we foreseen to have. This is not surprising, tagging is difficult. Another example is the BS2 mu mu. Here we have done better. There is no tagging in the, in the game. And uh, we were expecting to have the three sigma evidence uh, at, uh, at uh, uh, 3 inverse phantom but a 14 TV, we got the 3 sigma evidence at 2 inverse phantom but with the half cross section at uh, 7 TV. So this uh, was uh, clearly a big improvement in the analysis. So let's look into the future and let's see if the performance we promised to have in this extrapolation will be somehow kept by uh, the uh, newly approved detectors. First of all, the upgraded silicon detector, we have a TDR about that. This is clearly a major piece of the, the work because a lot of measurement relies on the time resolution, on the IP resolution that allows us to cut away all the prompt background and so on and so forth. Here you see that the upgrade detector will have a much better impact parameter resolution and similar time resolution as the current one. 
So for sure, the upgrade the velo will be a major asset for the LCB upgrade. So we will improve uh, all the measurement that heavily rely on the velo. For the newly approved uh, tracker, the scintillating fiber tracker, first of all, we have to say clearly that the current tracker will never be able to stand in the upgrade conditions because it would die. So clearly an upgrade was, uh, was necessary. However, the upgrade tracker in the upgrade conditions will have worse performance than the current tracker in the current conditions. So, uh, here you have some numbers that I summarized in, the, in these slides. Essentially, for long tracks uh, above 5 GB, we could expect uh, a loss of uh, four, between 4 and 6 percent for generic long tracks coming, for example, from Charm and Strange, and a loss between 2 and 4 percent for long tracks from BDKs. This means that, for example, for BDKs, in the four body decays, we could have a loss of eight, between 8 and 16 percent with respect to the current performance. The particle ID for the rich, in principle, the upgrade rich system is, on the paper, able to recover the performance in run one in a much more difficult environment, which will be the upgrade ones. However, an increase of heat multiplicity will change the situation, and we know that this performance are based on a Monte Carlo that is not perfectly tuned. For example, we know that in the calorimeter we observed 40% more it's in data with respect to the Monte Carlo we have. So somehow this will be, we have to see how, how the, 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 the heat multiplicity will behave during the upgrade phase. For the muon as well, we expect some deterioration due to the fact that the MIS ID will be worst due to the fact that we will have much more combinatorial background heat that uh, essentially switch on the muon chambers and uh, we have to fight in order to recover the performance that we have now. Trigger. Trigger is the name of the game for, for the LACP upgrade. Clearly it's a very challenging project because the numbers are Terrible. I mean, uh, the numbers from the LAC, we are going to produce an enormous amount of beauty, charm, and strange decays at the level of 270 kHz, 800 kHz, 260 kHz of events fully reconstructed in LACB and uh, with very mild cuts. And we know that the, the trigger will be able only to process a part of them. We will have 30 milliseconds per event at 30 MHz time budget and 20 kHz maximum output rate. At least uh, this is the, the, the number that uh, uh, is driving the, the, the design of the farm. It's a very challenging project uh, and uh, to process at 30 MHz uh, these events are so complicated with 13 milliseconds of events will not be straightforward at all. You see here how the CPU time increases as a function of the global event cuts, as a function essentially of the multiplicity of the events and how the CPU time increase uh, as a function of PT. So, assuming we have to put a cut in order to keep the time budget within the limit, this cut is 60% efficient on charm decays. So we'll cut away essentially half of the statistics of the charm. And if we try to put some safety factors, we see, so assuming that the multiplicity will be higher than what we know now in simulation, this uh, timing will explode and uh, in order to keep down the timing of the trigger processing we have to cut away the BS255 30% of the yield. So this uh, will be clearly the, the bulk of the upgrade and uh, everything will depend how the trigger will behave uh, in these conditions. Output rate is very small because we are allowed to write 20 kHz corresponding to 2 GB per second and this will be, uh, allow us only to save a very, a very small fraction of the actual physics program of the LACB and in order to increase, to enlarge the physics program we will need to have either to increase the offline resources or to reduce the event size or to park the data. So there will be tough choices to be done in order to have a broad physics program. So let me conclude. Flavor physics has been, is and will always be a strategic asset in the case for new physics. However, so far we have observed only a few hints of deviation standard model. And the sensitivity to new physics must scale 
uh, will grow very slowly with luminosity and we will approach uh, in 2028 at the end of the LSP upgrade the same ballpark of direct searches at the LAC at 14 TV if we assume the new physics enters with the same CKM uh, structure, so assuming minimal flavor violation. Clearly to do a sizable step forward in the flavor sector we need high luminosity, highly performing detectors, deep control of systematic uncertainties and reliable theory prediction. So my question is, uh, will the LACB upgrade able to keep its promises? So I give you a rendezvous in 2023 for the answer. And since we are in the Col Normal uh, and this uh, was somehow the temple of the critic criticism, uh, people uh, that were critical view, let me whisper just a uh, doubt. Uh, and there was nothing between the letter week and plus scale. What do we do with flavor? I'm assuming you don't have an answer, right? You didn't have another slide with the answer, right? No. Sorry? You didn't have another slide with the answer. I have no answer. No, okay, well. <laughs> So I guess uh, I'll open the, the forum for questions. So, so Gaia, you showed some hint of some uh, reduced amount of mu plus mu minus in uh, this uh, uh, flavor change in neutral current processes in more than one, in which there might be a scheme which might embrace them. But let me ask you again about the B0 rare decays. The average of the CMS and LACB showed somewhat smaller branching ratio for the BS, but significantly oh, larger, it. significantly yes. larger for the B sub D, and that is completely out of the picture, which uh, which has with the other things. Attempt to to include this in this zeta prime uh, picture, at le at least as far as I know. Still concerning the future extrapolations for JSI-5, you put the emphasis on the removal of the lifetime bias for, for the improvement of the precision on gamma S and delta gamma S. Will not that be a trade-off with respect to modelization of the background at that point, at low lifetimes especially, where you, know, you, you may not be necessarily gaining much in that direction, right? I think Olivier can answer much better than me. <laughs> We are not frightened at all by the background for this channel. Really, we have the two million, you know, for making GIPSI. So the, the problem here is we are really dominated by the statistics. Even at the end of the upgrade, the problem is still with statistics and not systematic. I can argue more if you want. <laughs> we can take the table of systematic one by one. Uh, Gaia showed that, and really, the, our, our problem is the statistics. The, the background is extremely low. And uh, I don't see why it, it should uh, become more. Maybe I wasn't uh, quite to the point. The, the idea is you remove your lifetime bias. You will accept more events at shorter lifetimes, which is where the background is very large. So you're, you're trading, basically, you're, you're removing the, the dealing, the leading source of, source of systematics. You may be ending up having a leading source of systematics that is now the modelization of the background, which is going to be there because you're going to shorter lifetimes. And the question is whether you have an idea of how much better control you have on that with respect to your lifetime bias. We can still use the lifetime as a discriminating variable. There, there is no, uh, no problem to still use uh, the lifetime to remove the background. It's, we, we, have, we have no plan to make the full analysis uh, with a lifetime unbiased. This is just an, an additional level arm. About the, um, the ratio of uh, B2K E plus C minus over B2K uh, mu plus mu minus. So we know that muons are a piece of cake in, in the LACB, but electrons are more problematic, right? So is this going to be a limit for the, uh, the prospects on, on this ratio? Is just the statistics that uh, you get less electrons, so it's just the statistical error, or also the systematics that may limit it? No, it's a pure statistical problem. Right now in LACB we have an efficiency for electrons which is a factor 7 lower 
than for mules. So this is clearly a statistical error you see here is fully dominated by the electron component. I should go through the systematic error, but I don't think it's a problem there in the future. No, I don't think so, because the electrons are mostly suffering for low detection efficiency, not from particular systematic effect. Yes. Just a question, a theory question. Uh, what are really your golden modes? Not a theorist. <laughs> yes, no, but the point is, what are your golden modes of the upgrade? Because uh, ah, if upgrade, I see your yeah, list... That's I, easy, that's easy. The, the upgrade has been designed for adronic, fully adronic final state. Because uh, is where the trigger now is uh, cutting the most. Because clearly, the, the dronic in an adronic environment, in order to select a dronic final state, you have to keep the threshold very high. And uh, the trigger will be the bulk of the upgrade. There will be a fully software trigger that should, in principle, be able to recover all this efficiency. And the muons, in principle, would not need an upgrade at first order. Because the trigger can follow very, very well the luminosity. So it's a matter of choice. But the choice has been done, and the, done, the, the choice is uh, adronic states. You can be in agreement or not, but that's the fact. Okay, but when I look at the, uh, the uh, examples you have shown us, then all of those are, have some similar tonic, or you look at PP bar mixing, and there, in all cases, I have a bit of doubt that uh, you get backed up by precise theoretical predictions, right? In one case, you have no idea what lambda will be corrections. Uh, in the other case, you have no real idea how we could probably get uh, an idea about the SS3 breaking. So, but you need a lot of progress to, on the theory side to, to match your mark, experimental really. accuracy. In the, I mean, the past experience always showed that uh, whenever there is a, a compelling measurement, the theorists then speed up to try to understand. <laughs> so it somehow should be a trade-off. So a, a measurement which uh, will profit a lot is uh, the measurement of gamma, for example, which will go down yes, to less than one well uh, degree. Down, yes. This is uh, something which is not theory limited from three. If there are no other questions, uh, I guess we can go for coffee and be back at 4 p.m. You, you have an announcement for the, the afternoon session and uh, with uh, Alessandro Cardini, who's going to talk to us about the LHTV upgrade uh, on, the size, uh, on the side of the detector. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jumpy. So I, I will present the, LH, the, the detector strategies that are the base of the LHTV upgrade. So briefly, I will present the current detector, first of all. Gaia didn't describe very much in detail the, the detector, so I will briefly describe the detector in such a way you can uh, appreciate the improvement we are planning for the upgrade. So then I'll discuss the upgrade, the motivations, trigger and data acquisition system, which are important part, and then the detector. So as you know, LHCB, it's, uh, it's a dedicated heavy flavor experiment at LHC. We have a big physics program. CP violation, B sector, rare B and C hadron decays, uh, sur indirect surges of new physics and all that. The shape of this detector, it's, it's a forward spectrometer, and this is done to exploit the huge production of B pair at, uh, at small angles. So you see this is the detector acceptance of HCB, is, is in the forward region with a much different complementary with what is uh, in ATLAS and uh, CMS. Another important... Uh, We, uh, we approach the two beams close together continuously to keep the, the interaction rate uh, at a constant level. So these are the requirements of the experiment. We need a, uh, a very good separation between secondary decay vertex and primary vertex. 20 micron is what we need, and this, uh, and this provides the excellent decay time resolution you have seen in a few plots that I showed before. We have an excellent momentum resolution that provides a very good mass resolution at the end, and uh, this is very important. We have an excellent particle identification capability. As you know, we have to select 
rare and beauty charm exclusive decays up to the end of the decay chain and we need to know which are the particles to reconstruct, completely reconstruct these decays. All this is possible because we have an efficient multi-stage trigger which allows us to select efficiently all these complicated events. This is how the experiment looks like. I will briefly describe the main components, the vertex detector, the spectrometer, dipolar magnet with a tracking station before and after the magnet, the two rich detectors, the calorimeters and the muon system. This is the vertex locator. The vertex locator is really the heart of our experiment, so the microscope that allows us to clearly select on the geometry the events where there is a, a, a heavy uh, particle decaying after it's produced. So it's made of a, a microstrip sensor, silicon microstrip sensor with an RF geometry. And uh, the nice thing of this uh, device is that the two sides, the left and the, and the right side, they close around the beam line after the beam has achieved the, 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 the data taking condition. So in such a way, the planes are very close to the beam line and the efficiency of this detector is very high. This is a plot showing the, the resolution of the impact parameters, a function of one over PT, showing that we can achieve uh, uh, better than 20 microns resolution. And this is the, is the decay time that you can see in, uh, in the mixing of B and, uh, and BS in the SPI, showing that we can achieve a 45 femtosecond time resolution. <coughs> The VELO is only a part of the tracking system of LHCB. As I said, before and after the magnet, we have two other tracking stations. This one is this part here. It is, it is made of silicon microstrip. And the, the part of the detector uh, of the tracking station, which is after the magnet, it's made of silicon microstrip in the central region and stroke tube in the outer region because we, have, we need also a very wide angular acceptance. And together with this, uh, the magnetic field of 4 tesla meter, this provides an excellent mass resolution and one of the world best mass measurements. You can see some examples here. This is lambda going to JPSI lambda with a sigma of 9 MeV. This is B0S going to JPSI phi with a 7.7 .7 MeV of resolution. So, uh, as I said, the ring imaging Cherenkov detectors are, are a very important part of, uh, of LHCB uh, detector. So, the there, are, there is one reach before the, the magnet and one reach after the magnet. They differ in size and in acceptance uh, because the, the, the particle that they sample have a different momentum range, so they use slightly different gas also. In general, they have a radiator here, a gas, and in particular for the rich one, the one in front of the magnet, we have an aerogel sitting here. And then the photon detectors are located outside the, the detector acceptance. The photon detectors are right now hybrid photon detectors with a 1 MHz readout uh, chip. And uh, this is some uh, plot showing the quality of these devices. This is uh, the Cherenkov angle as a function of the momentum. You can see many, all the different particle types. This is an efficiency of uh, identifying the kaons. And here is the, is the background as a function of the momentum for two different uh, cuts. And uh, when you use it, so if you select B0 going into adron adron, you see that the pi pi contribution is very small, but when you use rich information, the pi pi contribution stands out very clearly. So this is a very powerful device. Calorimeters and muon system, they complete the, the, the detectors. Calorimeters is a, a system made of four different subsystems. There is a scintillating pad detector, which is used to uh, to, to see if the particle impinging on the detector is neutral or charged. Then there is the pressure, ECAL and HCAL. They are based on scintillating tiles uh, technology. And then we use lead or iron as an absorber for the ECAL and HCAL respectively. All these are read out with photomultipliers. And the calorimeter information enters directly the high transverse energy level zero trigger. The muon system is made of five muon, five muon station, mainly built with multi-wire proportional chambers, very high efficiency, and they are used into the level zero high PT muon trigger that is very important for our physics. So these are a few, this is one of the world best branch integration measurement. This is uh, PS going to phi gamma. So 3.5, 10 to the minus 5, showing uh, a very good invariant mass resolution of about 94 MeV. Here, there is a photon here, so this is a very good number. And this is the Upsilon family that you can see with our muon detector. 
So why do we need to upgrade? Okay, we, there is no evidence of new physics in run one, so we have to look for tiny deviation of the sta to st from standard model prediction. So we need the, the maximum statistics we can, and if we, if, if we go to ten, times 10, we will, we will be able to have some experimental sensitivities which are comparable to some theoretical uncertainties on some channels. So what is the limitation? Why we cannot do it today? We cannot do it today because we have a limit on the bandwidth that comes uh, at, at the input of the high-level trigger farm. So we can only, the, the high-level the, the high level trigger farm can only accept one megahertz event. And uh, so we, if we increase the luminosity today, uh, we would have to, to, to harden the cuts in order to keep this one megahertz uh, uh, rate. And on, on most of the channels, this will not allow us to increase the statistics. Here you see the trigger yield as a function of the luminosity for adronic channels, some adronic channels, and a muonic channel. So we are sitting here, and if we increase the luminosity, you see we are more or less at a steady state level. So we need, we need to, change, to change the philosophy. If we just increase the luminosity, there is no gain in statistics. I have to show you, remind you, that our upgrade does not depend on LHC luminosity somehow, because we, even if the LHC machine upgrade would be late, we could be able to, let's say, to, to achieve the required luminosity in, in, in the same, in a, let's say, in a normal way. Uh, there is no, no limit right now uh, at the luminosity we can achieve at interaction point eight in LHC. So how do we do it? How do we do the upgrade? We remove the level zero hardware trigger, and we go and try to read out every event at, at, 40, at, at every, in every bunch crossing, 40 megahertz. For this, we need new front-end electronics and new data acquisition system. Obviously, all this, then, we have to process these events, so we need a fully software trigger, which, in order to be able to disentangle the complicated topologies that we have the, of, on the many channels we are looking for, we, the, the software trigger has to access the complete event information, and this has to run also at 40 megahertz. Uh, Going to from 4, 10 to the 32 to 2, 10 to the 33 is not uh, for free. Uh, the, the, the increase in luminosity obviously will increase the occupancies in our detector. Our detectors were fine-tuned to run at the current luminosity, and uh, the system was uh, perfectly adequate to run, uh, is, is perfectly adequate to run this luminosity, but when you increase the luminosity, immediately you start to lose performances. So we have also to redesign several detectors to adapt them to the new condition in such a way that we, we can really profit of the luminosity increase. So our plan is to, I mean, we are building the upgrade right now. We will be installing it in 2018, 2019, start data taking in 2020. So this is the upgrade scenario. Luminosity is 2 times 33. 30 megahertz collision will be, will be occurring inside the LHCBA. We will look at them. We will write from 20 to possibly 100 kilohertz event of small events, one kilobyte to disk, in order to integrate five inverns fern to burn per year. The challenges are the high pileup, the large occupancies. Uh, when you have large occupancy, the event reconstruction is more difficult, and in particular, the particle identification becomes more difficult. You have the background increases, and so you have to improve your detector in such a way to keep this background low and to, to do the same physics that we are doing now. Radiation damage to the detector is another issue and we are taking care of it. So the upgrade summarizing is fully software trigger, new data acquisition and upgraded subdetectors. So what, what are the, up, the, sub, up, up, the upgraded subdetectors? The velo will be renewed, the tracking stations will be renewed, the reaches will be upgraded, and also the calorimeter and the immune system. And I will discuss this in the following. So this is the software trigger. So 30 megahertz of event will be sent to the trigger farm. Trigger farm will consist of 50, of the other 50,000 logical CPU cores. And uh, the, the selection will be done in, in, dif in different steps. So at the first step, we, we plan to re-implement something which we call LLT, which is similar to the LL level zero easy selection that we have now. High transverse energy, high uh, uh, transverse momentum. 
So this would be a software, a software tool, and the idea is in the long run to stop using this and to open completely, uh, to send all the events from here to, let's say, the step one of HLT, but at the beginning, since the farm will not be completed at the real beginning, we will use this LLT as a throttle to adjust the, the input rate to the high-level trigger. Then, in the two steps of the high-level trigger, here, this one and two, we will be, we will be doing an offline-like reconstruction tuned to the available time constraints, and then, in the last part, we will have a, a mixture of exclusive and inclusive selection algorithms, and we will record uh, between 20 and 100 kilohertz of events. So, this is to show you how the signal uh, rates will uh, improve with respect to 2012 when we, are, we increase the, let's say, the rate to the high-level trigger. So right now we are here at the level of 1 megahertz, but these are for some hadronic channels, B0KPi, DD, uh, and D0-2KK, and you see that when you accept more event, you send more event to be processed by the HLT, you are able to gain, let's say, a lar large numbers of between 10 and 20 with respect to 2012 data taking conditions. So this is, this, is a, uh, this is much more than the times four increase you have uh, in luminosity, okay? So the real advantage is the possibility of having a fully software trigger which efficiently selects those events. This is maybe a little technical, but this is how the 40 megahertz readout will be. So we will have uh, uh, specialized uh, uh, readout boards on, on the detectors. The data will be acquired, uh, zero suppressed because you have a huge amount of data. Then they will be sent to, via optical links up to the surface where there will be a huge farm receiving the, the data. So here we, on, on, on standard PCs, we will have PCI, PCI uh, third generation boards uh, reading the events. Uh, these uh, computers which receive the event send the, 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 the data fragment to a commercial uh, but huge uh, uh, switch which then does the event building and the, the full events are spread out over all the computers that are running the HLT uh, algorithms and then the data for the, the, for the event accepted will be recorded to disk. So just to, to show you that the bandwidth we're going to have in uh, 2019, it's 32 gigabit per second, which is similar to what CMS is going to have. But we have a much smaller event, of course. So going to the detectors, this is, the, for what concerns the VELO. Uh, the VELO will have to stand uh, very high particle rates and a huge, uh, huge data volumes. 20 gigabit per second per chip. Uh, so this is a, it's, it's a huge data data that, that rate. Also, the VELO uh, suffers for a highly non-uniform radiation damage. In fact, uh, the, the illuminate, I mean, we are, since we are at, at very small angles, I mean, very close to the beam pipe, uh, to, the, to the beam line, the, the, the rates are, are huge. So on, on VELO, uh, the, the rates can be as high as eight particles per chip uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the in the sensor, which is close to the beam line, up to very, I mean, factor 100 less uh, when you're going far away from, from the beam line. So, in order to deal with such a disuniformity uh, and uh, to have an efficient detector, so we will be using uh, pixel detectors, uh, so 50 micron pitch, uh, read out with uh, the so-called VeloPix front-end chip, which is a uh, the, the, the evolution of the Time Pix 3, which is a, a MediPix uh, series uh, detector. And uh, uh, these, these uh, detectors that will be sitting in a, let's say, in a, in, a, in a vacuum, but not the vacuum of the machine, we require an appropriate cooling. And this will be achieved by let's, uh, uh, the so-called microchannel CO2 cooling. The, 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 the CO2 will be circulating these channels which are etched in the, in the silicon plate, which is the support of all this. So this is a very complicated device. The, 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 when designing this, uh, we, have, uh, we have fight for reduce the material budget and we try, in order to increase the efficiency, the tracking efficiency, to bring the detectors as close as possible to the beam axis. This is not evident because we are, as I said, in a, in a different vacuum. So we have a, a, something, a, a, an interface, which separates our vacuum to the machine vacuum. And so 
it's complicated to, to go much closer. This is how the Velo upgraded will look like. This is only half a Velo. So these are the, the planes which are sitting on, the, on one side. There will be another, another side and they will close around the beam during the data taking. These are the Velo performances uh, that uh, Gaia showed briefly in her talk. So here you can see the three-dimensional impact parameter resolution as a function of one over PT for the upgraded Velo <coughs> and the current Velo. You see the upgraded is obviously much better. And those are the efficiency in tracking you get for the Velo. In red, the upgraded Velo. In black, the, the old Velo. Uh, as a function of PT, and this is the same as a function of eta. So, the, the, the upgraded Velo is superior to the current, uh, to the current Velo, uh, to the current Velo. If we bring the, the current Velo at high luminosity, but the, the new, uh, but the, the the current Velo cannot operate at high luminosity in an efficient way because it will suffer too much radiation damage. So this is not really, this is not considered at all. Uh, the, the tracking station, which are sitting in front of the magnet, this upstream tracker, have this uh, shape. So these are four detection plane with uh, some stereo view. And these are made with silicon strip detector, 200 micron uh, thick. Uh, as I say, there is a, a, a very big uh, disuniformity in illumination of this detector. So we are selecting different technologies also for the detectors depending on when they are sitting here, the red one, the yellow one, and the green one are different detectors adapted to their positioning on, on, the, on the detector planes. So the detectors will be assembled on a stave. Here are the sensors. And uh, there will be the, the front-end chip, which is a special 40 megahertz uh, able uh, front-end uh, front chip, will be sitting close by. And all the signal then will be carried out uh, on top and on bottom. Uh, the fiber tracker is the part, uh, is, the, is, the, is the new detector that we will, will be part of the tracking system and is located after the magnet. Uh, we decided to, be, to build this using scintillating fibers. So the scintillating fibers are, that we plan to use are 250 micron diameter scintillating fibers and we assemble them in, in, uh, in, uh, in mat, five, five or six fiber thick. So we have something like, which is of the order 1.5 millimeter, and these are 2.5 meter long. And these fibers will be read out with silicon photomultipliers that will be uh, installed on top of these, of these fibers. These are uh, silicon photomultipliers array that are built exp explicitly for LHCB. And you see these are the cells. They will be sitting here like this. And so when the particle crosses the fiber mat, we will have some light in integrated on every cell. And we can know the position of the particle crossing the mat uh, by looking at the, uh, at the uh, center of gravity of the, of, the, of the charge of the signal uh, measured on the silicon photomultiplier channels. This is how the fiber tracker will be designed. So as I say, this is... Uh, uh, five meters high, 2.5 and 2.5. These are, in fact, two separate mats. We, we have silicon photomultipliers and readout electronics here and here. Uh, with respect to now, what is the advantage? Uh, the advantage is that we will be using a single technology. This is, will, uh, this is easy to operate. And it also provides a uniform material budget, which is very important. And there are no dead zones that somehow could affect also the, the efficiency at some, at some angles. So uh, the challenges are the fact that these detectors will suffer some radiation damage, obviously. In particular, the radiation, dam the radiation damage is the fibers. But these have been tested and appears to be OK. This is the hottest region. Remember, the hottest region is here close to the beam pipe and on this horizontal plane. We have also the silicon photomultipliers suffer radiation damage. We have tested this and we found that if we operate them at minus 40 Celsius, we are able to, to operate them in a, in a safe way. So this is how the FT will, fiber tracker will look like. And what are the performance of the overall upgraded tracker of LHCB? So this is, this is the, the efficiency as a, fu as a function of eta of the of the the, uh, the upgraded track tracking 
and uh, the current tracker for a specific channel, BS in Fi Fi. So you see that the efficiency is obviously higher for the upgraded one with respect to the old one at the at the, at, the, at, the, at the upgrade luminosity. And if you use the, the information coming from the upstream tracker, the one sitting in front of the magnet, you see that the, the ghost rate that uh, goes from here to here. So overall, we can have very high efficiency and very much uh, and a small ghost, ghost rate on, on, the track, on the tracking. The reach upgrade, uh, as I said before, the reach cannot be operated right now at, one, uh, at 40 megahertz because the photo detectors, they have embedded a, a chip, a readout chip that is only one megahertz capable. So we, we go for changing all the photo detectors. The choice, we have chosen the 64 channel multi-anode photo multipliers and to this we will attach the 40 megahertz ASIC called Claro, which allow us to read out all the events at 40 megahertz. And this uh, uh, will be, let's say, the upgrade for REACH2. For what concerns REACH1, in an addition, we will be removing the aerogel. The aerogel is this first radiator that is currently sitting here. This will be removed because it's, uh, uh, it would not be very useful at increased luminosity. And in order to improve the, the, the optics, we, and in order to spread out the sharing of rings much more on the focal plane, we will be moving this, the, the photo detector's focal plane further away. So this is how which one will look like. This is uh, the elementary cells that are in construction, so this is very, in very good progress. And what is the performance? Guy already showed this slide. In black, this is the, the pioneer misidentification uh, as a function of Kaon uh, efficiency. And in black points, you have the current performances at the current luminosity. But if we go with the current geometry to high luminosity, we will switch to the red line, which is not acceptable. So the upgraded geometry brings this red line here in green, very close to the black line. And this is considered to be sufficient for the upgrade. The calorimeter will upgrade mainly for, because of occupancy and radiation issues. First of all, the pre-shower and SPD will be removed. These are elements, the key elements for the L0 hardware trigger, but since we will not be having the L0 hardware trigger, this will be removed. The ICAL has, has been checked and expected to be fine up to, let's say, half of the long run. Uh, in case the, the innermost cell could suffer but could be replaced during the run. HCAL should be okay and in order to be, to run, to be on the safe side we'll be using the, the photomultipliers at a reduced gain. Operating this at a reduced gain implies that we have to do a new front end. There is a, a new front end chip which is uh, in, uh, in development and we will also have some new back end electronics which will already calculate the clusters that could be used at the LLT without uh, affecting uh, much more the, the, the HLT algorithms. Final slide, the immune system upgrade. Also in the immune system we suffer for occupancy issues. Uh, the immune detector is already 40 megahertz capable. However, the, the boards are not adapted to the new system, so we will be redesigning the readout boards and we will remove M1. I remember you that M1 is a station that is currently sitting before the calorimeters and allow, and allow us to have a, a better PT selection, a more cleaner selection of uh, high PT muons. But this will be, uh, will have very high occupancy in the upgrade, so it will be removed. And very important is the fact that we have to better tune the shielding uh, behind HCAL to reduce the rate in the, in the inner, innermost region of M2. Also, we are considering the possible replacement of M2, M3 in a region detector to further improve the performance of the Muon system. So the summary, so thanks to excellent performance, LCB is producing world best measurements that you, you have seen and you know. The upgrade the LHCB will be triggerless. This is the key point, triggerless, and this will guarantee that we process all the event at 40 megahertz and will allow us to collect useful five femto, inverse femtoburn per year. And the upgrade is ongoing, we are building it, we will put it on, on the floor in 2018-19 and then data taking will start in 2020 to allow us to reach experimental precision that are on the order of the theoretical uncertainties. That's it. Thank you. Questions?
So it's a very stupid theorist uh, question. So this FT track? Not. <laughs> ah, no, no. So it's five meters and it's so rigid that it's o it only bends by less than 50 microns or? Yeah, these are, I mean, they have support. I mean, some solid support. Right. And this has been verified that uh, by tilting it at five degrees, you, it will maintain exactly the position. But then you will have alignment runs. So you could also, a fine tuning will be done with the uh, further alignment. So, well, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my detector, but I trust them. <laughs> no, it shouldn't be any problem. That German. Yeah. <laughs> any other question? Um, I, I, I had one, actually. Maybe I should know this, but... Uh, you should know. <laughs> Uh, for the uh, for the velo um, or anything, uh, is it tracking which is which goes a, around the velo close to the on the, uh, quote unquote the interaction point has been like a strategy has been considered sometime? I mean, I, I understand this is not very useful. What for, worries you? Sorry, I like a, a tracking system which is like a barrel, let's say, uh, around the the interaction point because now the velo is all in the forward region, right? Uh, because I'm thinking more like uh, not, not that those tracks are useful, but they might be useful to know that there are tracks, like velo tracks that actually leaves the but remember that the, 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 ve the velo closed completely, huh? So yes. you are practically kind of a kind of a bar. Huh? I'm, I'm, I'm saying uh, like around the interaction point. So yeah, it there is, are, there it are many is. tracks that ah, okay. there are many tracks that actually leaves the detector, and we don't really know. So the the, the, the efficiency for tracks which are which have a high PT or that may be soft uh, and they, these are not very useful for the physics, but they're useful, for example, for algorithms for uh, uh, isolation. For example, you know, you have tracks you can. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I mean, you have, I, th I think I mean I don't know the precise answer, but I guess that the precise answer is that you have a certain general geometrical acceptance or detector and making the, the velo larger will not bring you so much benefits with respect to the increase of cost which would be prohibitive. But I this guess. is probably the but so this has been adapted to the to the geometrical acceptance. So uh, other questions? <clears throat> if not we can thank our speaker again. Yep. Now we have now we have Alexis Pompili, who's going to talk to us about the CMS uh, experiment uh, in uh, view of the, of the upgrade as well. Oh, thank you. Uh, oh, this, this I work? Okay, let me thank the organizer for the invitation. So I will uh, talk about the experimental status and uh, the near term perspective of uh, flavor physics in CMS. So uh, there is a, a great impact of the LHC experiments uh, in the AV flavor sector. Um, the large production cross-section for AV flavor particles in PP collisions uh, at the LHC energies provide uh, opportunities uh, for testing the standard model picture of flavor dynamics. Uh, and besides uh, uh, LHCB, which is a dedicated experiment, uh, CMS and ATLAS uh, are giving significant contribution to beauty and quarconium sectors, mainly using final states containing muon pairs uh, because of trigger constraints. So there are several motivations. Uh, precision measurement of uh, uh, rare decays and CP violation, violation are sensitive to effects of particles beyond the standard model that may contribute to quantum loops even with masses too large to be produced or detected at LHC. LHC. Uh, so we look for uh, indirect evidence or constraints uh, to uh, uh, new physics. And uh, B meson decays uh, mediated by flavor change in neutral currents are transition are a su suitable uh, place to look for. Then uh, production cross-section and polarization measurements of S and P wave states of uh, conventional quarconium 
allowed uh, to study the hadron formation within the NRQCD framework. And then the test of perturbative and non-perturbative QCD models for B uh, adron production or fragmentation, the study uh, dynamics of heavy quark inside hadrons, the decay models, the spectroscopy, and also it's possible to study or search uh, some quarkonium-like uh, exotic states. All this uh, is possible uh, thanks to the excellent tracking and muon identification performance combined with a, a flexible uh, uh, trigger system. Uh, so for the tracking system uh, we have a good uh, PT resolution uh, down to 1% in the barrel, the tracking efficiency in the, for central moons uh, more than 99%, a good vertex reconstruction, an impact parameter resolution down to 15 microns, and the moon system uh, we reconstruct moon candidates by matching moon segments uh, and silicon track in a larger rapidity coverage. There is a good daemon resolution, depending on uh, the rapidity, obviously it goes from 0.6 to 1.5%. This means that you reconstruct uh, a JPSI with a width uh, between uh, 80, uh, sorry, 20 and 70 MeV. And also we have an excellent uh, high purity moon identification. So the fake rates uh, uh, for uh, uh, pion, keon or uh, proton contamination is uh, about a few parts uh, uh, over 10,000 10, uh, and these fake rates are estimated uh, both in Monte Carlo and with uh, data control samples. So the diamonds provide a clean signature and are easier to reconstruct and to trigger on. And uh, we will, all the results are shown here uh, involve diamonds uh, with uh, definite uh, invariant mass uh, like uh, JPSI or uh, Y1, 2, and 3S states, or uh, even um, not in uh, definite invariant mass in the case of uh, B0, 2K star, mu plus, mu minus. The trigger system is a, flexi uh, the system is a flexible trigger, uh, which is essential, the flexibility to collect data at increasing luminosity. And pile up here, you have uh, a D1. Uh, uh, the spectrum of the muon mass uh, for a, a, a part of the, the 2011 run, and uh, you can see the different uh, muon triggers uh, uh, HLT paths, uh, and this uh, shows that uh, the flavor physics analysis rely on uh, displaced or inclusive quarkonium, JPSI, Psi prime, uh, YNS, also B sub S to mu mu, and also non resonant uh, D muon triggers. A uh, few features, uh, it's a fast hardware MUON detector based trigger at L1, then you have a software trigger in which you do the full uh, tracking and vertex reconstruction. There are specific triggers developed for various analysis. Uh, the 10% of CMS bandwidth uh, is given uh, to the flavor physics, so we are a, a part of uh, the whole uh, picture, obviously. And uh, these, are, these require different uh, features and needs because, uh, the, for instance, the rate decay, you, you essentially trigger backgrounds. Uh, when you look at quarkonia, you are uh, essentially triggering signal. And uh, we have uh, benefited uh, a lot from having a data parking in 2012. Uh, so having uh, 120 hertz at LCLT on the top of uh, the 25, 30 hertz on the prompt stream. Here we will show results with the whole uh, run one data or part of them, uh, 2011 or 2012 or together. Let me say something about the trigger strategy for run two. Uh, this is a crucial um, uh, a peculiarity. Uh, it is, right now it is under definition in view of higher luminosity of pile up, so there is work in progress. Uh, we need to stay within uh, a 100 Hz of uh, the bandwidth uh, budget uh, at uh, an integrated luminosity of 1.4 times uh, 10 to the 34. So uh, this is crucial for the capability of uh, carrying out flavor physics in RAN2. Uh, that is uh, the delayed uh, reconstruction. So the outline of the talk. Uh, we will um, review analysis of B sub S mu mu, uh, B0 in uh, K star uh, mu plus mu minus, B sub S to J psi phi, something about the production, cross section, and polarization of uh, S wave states, and something about the exotic uh, quarkonium. 
So uh, about uh, the, this rare uh, BDKs, uh, which are uh, new physics probes. Um, so uh, the, the transition uh, BSD to mu plasma minus are flavor changing uh, metal currents, which are high, uh, su highly suppressed in the standard model. Uh, the effective flavor changing metal current transition are forbidden at three level and can only proceed through uh, high order diagrams. Uh, furthermore, you have an illicit suppression and a CKM suppression. So uh, the standard model um, allowed uh, processes uh, have this uh, kind of diagrams and uh, you can uh, 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 theorist can uh, have a, a very precise, uh, provide a very precise calculation of the branch fraction with these ones in, within the uh, standard model framework. And the further, further suppression of the BD over B sub S is given by this uh, term. So uh, you understand that there is a, a high sensitivity to new physical contributions in the loops. So new particles uh, can alter uh, the decay. Uh, new physics scenarios in the extended rings uh, sector may enhance or suppress the decay rate with respect to the standard model. And uh, they would show different tan beta dependence. Moreover, the ratio of the two branching fraction provides a powerful discrimination among the beyond standard model theories. So uh, those uh, among them that uh, have the property of the minimum flavor violation predict the same uh, value as the standard model. So let, let's see the analysis, the strategy of the analysis. Uh, first of all, uh, the round one uh, data sets are uh, divided, then uh, split into regions, uh, the bar and the red camp, so we have uh, four channels. We have uh, a dedicate, dedicate, as you have seen before, uh, the muon triggers, paths, uh, a BDT-based muon identification, which couples kinematic variables and tracker and muon chambers fits uh, information alone and then coupled together. So what do you measure? Uh, you go to measure the branching fraction of the Bisabes to Mumu uh, with uh, choosing the B plus to J psi K plus as a normalization uh, channel. So essentially you, uh, this uh, branching fraction is given by the product of uh, the ratio of the signal and normalization yield, the ratio of uh, the uh, signal normalization and signal efficiency, the ratio between the B plus and B sub S fragmentation function, which is taken, uh, borrowed uh, by LACP recent measurement, and then the well known uh, branching fraction of the B plus. Um, this norm the usage of this normalization sample allows to avoid uncertainties uh, from uh, B production cross section and luminosity and to set a nearly ide identical selection to reduce uh, uh, the efficiency uh, systematics. And moreover, a B sub S to J psi phi is used as a control uh, channel to calibrate and validate the simulation. So, uh, what we expect, uh, uh, the, the signal has uh, the following characteristics. It is a, a it is uh, essentially a, a couple of isolated muons from a, a secondary vertex uh, with a, a muon uh, momentum aligned to the flight uh, direction and obviously an invariant mass around the B sub S or B sub B. While uh, the background characteristic uh, are these one, so you, essentially we have two, two um, categories, so the combinatorial background comes from uh, uncorrelated uh, semi-electronic decays. Uh, this is calculated from uh, side bands, uh, and you estimate it by extrapolation to the signal region. You can have uh, both uh, two semi-electronic uh, B or B or D decays, uh, or you can have uh, one semi-electronic B decay and one uh, misidentified uh, hadron uh, that is mimicking uh, another muon. The other category, you have a single BDKs. Uh, these are measured from simulation and are uh, estimated normalizing to the B plus to J psi K plus yield. And uh, they have uh, they are different um, contribution. Uh, some of them have a peaking background because you essentially have uh, lambda B or B uh, to two prongs uh, decays and you have uh, to have you have a double misidentification so the prongs are misidentified uh, um, cations or pions while uh, in the non-picking uh, component uh, you have essentially semi-leptonic uh, 
B plus, uh, sorry, B uh, zero decay or B plus to prong muon muon on lambda B uh, semi-leptonic decay. Uh, in this case, uh, you essentially lose uh, the neutrino and you have uh, one misidentification. So the event selection uh, is done by means of a, a BDT exploiting uh, 12 uh, uh, kinematics vertex in, in isolation variables. Essentially, here are, are four of them. You can exploit a difference between uh, signal background uh, behavior of the three-pointing angle, of the flight length uh, distance, uh, significance, of the isolation, and uh, for instance, the number of tracks uh, with a distance of closest approach uh, under a certain cut uh, close to the, to the moons. When you put them together, you, have, you are building a, a BDT, uh, you have the, its output discriminant, and uh, the output discriminant is used in, in a couple of ways. You can either uh, build a categorized BDT, so you use uh, uh, to define 10, uh, 12 categories with a different uh, uh, signal over background ratio, or alternatively, uh, you use it in uh, the standard way, uh, which is uh, you just do a single cut, which is optimized on the four uh, main channels I talked about before, uh, on the discriminator. So this is uh, used for cross-checks purposes and also to estimate the upper limits uh, for the, the B0 to mu plus or minus. Uh, th this one, DT, is uh, more robust but less sensitive. So, uh, okay. So how is extracted the signal uh, and the background yields are taken from uh, an up um, an unbinded maximum likelihood fit to the muon uh, muon mass, invariant mass, simultaneously for 12 uh, BDT categories. Essentially, you have the BD and B sub S signal uh, represented by, modeled by two crystal balls with a fixed shape. The resolution is uh, taken on a per event basis and the normalization is left uh, floating. And they sit on a background which has on the right uh, uh, essentially is just uh, the combinatorial background which is a simple first degree uh, polynomial and then you have uh, uh, a, the contribution on the left of uh, the rare uh, non-picking uh, background with a fixed shape and constant normalization. These are the semi-leptonic uh, uh, the case, so you essentially are on the left because you, you undetect the neutrino and you have a mass identification, while the, in the rare picking background uh, you have uh, to have a cut to uh, concurrent uh, misidentification, so it's uh, closer and is uh, really picking here. And this is constrained uh, to expectation, um, you, use a, you use a Gaussian plus crystal ball with a common mean. So the results uh, for the full run one are statistically dominated and are uh, consistent with uh, the standard model expectation. Uh, we gave uh, for the Bisabes Mumu um, uh, this number uh, using the, uh, cat uh, BDT, uh, the categorized BDT with a 4.3 sigma significance. For the B0 uh, to Mumu, uh, we gave both uh, an upper limit with 1D BDT, and also um, we provide also uh, this, uh, uh, this measurement. So, um, uh, the main systematic uh, are essentially the monomer identification, the brushing fraction of the rare background decays, the lambda, uh, which are essentially the semi-leptonic debate of the lambda, the normalization of the picking background. This has been a, a long journey because uh, we, were, we had uh, only upper limits uh, in the pre-LHC era, era. So uh, LHCB and uh, CMS have uh, very uh, compatible measurements with uh, uh, similar precision and uh, it was uh, necessary to combine them together to, pro to provide uh, a, a final result which uh, gives a 6.2 uh, significance and a 3 sigma significance for the B0 to Momo. These are the like local contours in the plane uh, of the, in which you have the scatter plot of the two branching fractions and this is the comparison with some uh, um, beyond the standard model uh, 
um, models. The ratio of the black shrink fraction is very sensitive to probe new physics. Uh, this was measured and is compatible uh, with standard model uh, within 2.3 sigma level. So now in the future the focus will be on the black shrink fraction of the B0 and on the ratio, uh, this ratio for run 2 and the relative uh, error on R will go from 100 to 70 uh, percent which will be uh, st statistically limited because the theory uh, error is already very uh, small. More uh, projection will come tomorrow from the talk by Mario. For what concerns uh, the um, other rare BDK, quasi rare because uh, uh, they, have, um, they are forbidden at three level, you have a branching uh, fraction of 10 to the minus 6, uh, and they proceed uh, uh, via uh, Frevin changer and our current processes. Uh, these are also sensitive uh, to effects in photon vector, axial vector coupling, and in this sense they are complementary to the Bisabestum Mo search. Uh, the amplitude are expressed uh, using uh, the operator uh, expansion in terms of hadronic matrix elements for long distance effects and Wilson coefficients for short distance coupling, and uh, new physics can enter in these coefficients. Uh, the decay dynamics are determined by th these uh, three angles, the elicity angle of the K star zero, of uh, um, the Dimon uh, system, and of uh, the, uh, the phase plane between the two decays. Actually, we integrated over this uh, uh, angle. So the, the differential amplitude, uh, the, the angular distribution is given by this differential amplitude. Uh, they are um, a function of the angles and also of the physics parameters. So the two main important are the forward backboard uh, muons asymmetry, the fraction of longitudinally polarized uh, K star zero, and since uh, there can be a contribution for, um, from a spinless uh, uh, S-wave uh, K pi, uh, you have also to put uh, in, the, in the play the fraction of uh, this contribution and the interference uh, amplitude between the S and the P wave decays. This is uh, taken from a fit to B0 to K star 0 J psi, and this, uh, and this, uh, this is measured with this uh, control sample. So the, the, the strategy is to uh, provide a B flavor assignment uh, uh, for the KP charge. The charge combination with the closest mass to the nominal is chosen. This is uh, characterized by the 80% mistag. The candidates uh, yields are divided in Q squared bins. Uh, Q squared is the mass squared of uh, invariant mass squared. The candidate yields are measured um, uh, from uh, and the parameters uh, from the unbinded maximum likelihood simultaneous fit to mass and the two cosines of the two main angles. And you have also background parameterized for Monte Carlo, which has a combinatorial and a peaking uh, nature. The peaking comes from a residual uh, uh, B0 to K star 0 J psi or psi prime. These are, for, for instance, in the six bins of Q square, uh, the projection of the, the fit on the masses. And moreover, you also measure the differential Brachian fraction obtained relatively to the normalization mode, which is the B0 to K star 0 J psi. And the system, um, so uh, the results are consistent with the standard model predictions. And, uh, and also other measurements. Uh, the FAB and FL are uh, competitive uh, with LACB at high Q square. Uh, what can we say that uh, in 2012 uh, data, uh, CMS uh, is uh, releasing a soon uh, an analysis which will contain uh, the FAB zero crossing point, which is already uh, measured by LACB. Uh, instead, uh, the new angular variables which have been uh, proposed with a small form factor dependence uh, will come in a later uh, analysis. Um, uh, we can skip this. Uh, for what concerns the J psi phi, uh, which is a, a tiny effect sensitive uh, to new physics, um, uh, this is also a, a sensitive. Uh, uh, 
uh, to different uh, scenarios. The JPSI uh, final state is in an admixture of CP odd and CP even eigenstate, so you need to disentangle by angular analysis. We essentially have three helicity angles. The differential decay rate can be expressed as the sum of the product of time dependent functions uh, uh, times angular dependent uh, functions. So the um, theta is the measure, the set of measure angles. The T is the B sub S proper decay time. This is the parameter of interest, Fs, uh, the decay with difference, the, uh, the lifetime, the ampli three amplitude and three strong phases. The parameters uh, uh, Bi and Di here contain the contribution from Fs. And the B sub S decay is described by sw the switching sign of C Cy and Dy. Uh, so how do you tell the flavor of production? You use the opposite the sign uh, um, lepton, uh, determined with a flavor tagging. So you search for a second bihedron in the opposite side uh, of the event, decaying semi-leptonically. The lepton charge flavor coloration is diluted, so you have a mistag that is due to a sequential cascade, B to C, and then another, uh, the le lepton from the charm or even oscillation in the opposite side uh, B meson mixing, or you can have lepton from other sources like the decaying flights or charmed meson. The tagging performance is measured by the self-tagging channel B plus to Gpsi K plus. Uh, the PDF uh, is modified uh, to include the tagging into the uh, CY and DY terms. Uh, you have an unbinded maximum likelihood fit from which you extract the physics uh, parameter, among them the three angles, uh, the alpha, sorry, and you fit uh, the three angles, the invariant mass and the proper decay length. Uh, delta MS uh, is constrained to a world average, delta gamma S is uh, greater than zero by uh, previous result from LCB. The uncertainty on proper decay time is computed on an event basis and is included in the feed together with the resolution, which is about 70 fem uh, femtoseconds. Lambda, which is uh, uh, present in some of, the, um, of these uh, amplitudes, uh, coefficients, sorry, uh, is, uh, um, uh, is uh, assumed to be one, so this is the uh, CP violation. Uh, direct in, in the direct decay, and then uh, you let uh, free uh, in the fit and you assign uh, the, a systematic. The results, uh, so we have uh, already seen in other talks, um, uh, for phi s and delta gamma s, this is the plane with the contour uh, likelihood, and uh, this is uh, rather competitive with uh, LSEB. Uh, the delta gamma is uh, confirmed to be non-zero. Uh, these accurate measurements are in good agreement with standard model and with previous uh, ones. And uh, phi s is uh, clearly statistically limited. So the final results will be released soon and will include the usage of an improved lepton tagger, the study of this uh, background channel, a better description uh, of this wave component, uh, possibly in the future uh, we, can, we are planning to do the B sub S to J psi F0 in the case, which are a CPO of the final state, so you don't need an angular analysis. And clearly the uncertainties of the measurement are still dominated by statistical one, especially if yes, and can be reduced further with run to data. Since I run uh, out of time, uh, you can find this uh, uh, other uh, information uh, in uh, the slides. Uh, one thing that uh, uh, would be uh, uh, interesting um, to see is, is uh, to, to remind is that even uh, without having uh, an hadronic particle identification, uh, we are still uh, able to be competitive uh, also on the um, in the exotic uh, quarconium uh, sector. And uh, let me uh, finish uh, with the summary. So, although CMS is uh, not designed, is designed for high PT physics, is an exceptional apparatus for dealing also with favorable physics topics. 
The CMS results on Golden Channel to look for indirect evidence of new physics are competitive with those from other experiments consistent with standard uh, predictions. And nevertheless, we still have chances to see new physics in, CK in CKM with more data, RAM2, together with uh, upgraded LSCB and uh, complementing future Bell2 results. Uh, also, I couldn't have time to, sh to show that uh, LSE is a quarconium factory, uh, so it, it will be possible to test the validity domain of uh, NRQCD. So considering RAN2 integrated luminosity, a factor 2 in cross-section improved triggers, we expect a sample of quarconia a few hundreds times larger than 2011, which will be, will be crucial to extend considerably the PT reach of quarconium studies with very small uncertainties. Let's see. Question. Yes, please. So you have, you have shown results concerning delta gamma s f with 20 inverse femtobarn. You have also an old result with 5 inverse femtobarn. Is there a plan from CMS to, to publish a unique paper with the 25 inverse femtobarn for phi s and delta gamma s? Uh, one second. Yeah, here you, yes. are, you are only speaking about the 20 inverse femtobarn, but you, you also have a result for delta gamma s uh, with uh, only 5 inverse femtobarn. So do, do you have a, a plan to update, uh, to, to, to include the 5 inverse femtobarn in, into this uh, GIP sci-fi result? Uh, I don't think so, but uh, Giacomo probably will call. Giacomo is here, no? Ah, Giacomo, no. Not for the moment. For the moment. May I ask a second question? Yes. C can you comment about the run two possibility for the B physics uh, the, the for concerning the trigger? What will you do at the, during the run two concerning the, the trigger for B physics in yes. CMS? Yes. Uh, well, the, the, this is uh, now we are in a, in a phase in which there is a lot of testing of uh, both the L1 and the HLT paths. And uh, we are uh, essentially um, considering uh, the possibility to have an alternative way to, to data taking. For instance, uh, to, we are trying to understand if it is possible to do a, a regional reconstruction, so to reconstruct only one part of the event uh, close to the Charmonium uh, uh, candidate, to the muon candidate, let's say. Uh, this is one main uh, feature, and uh, the other one, uh, obviously we have to increase uh, the PT threshold to diminish uh, the pseudo rapidity windows, but not too much. And uh, uh, as I said before, uh, the delay of the reconstruction is under discussion, but uh, we are pushing for that. briefly flashed a, a Chi B peak. No? <laughs> Not, we didn't have time to discuss. And so, as you well know, I mean, we had this um, result from LHCB saying that a significant uh, uh, fraction of, uh, of Upsilon come from Chi B, notably from Chi B uh, 3P. Yes. Uh, and whether I would in, curious to know if you have seen the same effect in a no, we have not. Uh, well, this is. These are uh, just the um, production. One p. One p. Yes. And clearly, um, no. We have, we don't. We couldn't do this. Uh, but this is very important, as you know, because, uh, for instance, uh, when you discuss uh, uh, the polarization, because uh, uh, in the NR NRQCD, you essentially the um, uh, the long distance matrix elements. Uh, are left uh, floating and are um, um, determined by the fits. So typically, when uh, you, comp uh, you have uh, uh, the theoretical course, uh, which compare with uh, this is a polarization parameter in function of PT, uh, usually when uh, uh, you have, uh, um, uh, you can leave floating uh, these uh, matrix elements, the coefficients are essentially, you can accommodate, uh, so you can, uh, the theory can uh, be, uh, can describe the data. 
And here you assume, uh, you assume that uh, uh, you, um, uh, here you assume this is uh, important because you, have, you are feed down free. But uh, here, for instance, you are no more feed down free uh, because of the measurement of LACB. So in the red curve, you assume that there is no feed down from KBs in, in the theoretical curve. And so uh, you, you are not this, consistent, so you claim that there is indeed some feed down? Or? Yes, here uh, the, the comparison, the theoretical curve does not assume uh, that there is a feed down. I have a question about the Gestarmio mu. Uh, so you mentioned that you are going to have somehow the form factor uh, free, is not free, I mean uh, less dependent analysis. What are you going to do? Is a full angular analysis, is a folding technique of one of the angles? What you are going to do? Um, actually, uh, we are trying just to finish uh, the analysis uh, with the 2012 data, and this is uh, very similar to the analysis done with 2011. Not going to fit uh, P5 prime, P5 four, P5, P5, no, no. P4 prime, and so Not so. Uh, in this round. And when this result will be ready? Uh, this is now in the approval phase. For, for Morion. Okay. Jure? It's sort of a general question. So people are talking about these deep learning uh, techniques for Higgs to Tau Tau. I mean, could you learn, I mean, could you gain by doing something similar for K star Mu Mu? I don't know about the technique you are telling me. Ah, okay. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Just a quick one. Yeah, quick. <laughs> what is limiting the FIS measurement in terms of systematic uncertainties? Because you have a systematic uncertainty which is 30% of the statistical one, which is not uh, really negligible. So what's... Uh, I have uh, in the backup... Uh, uh, let me go. Uh, here we are. So essentially, the angular efficiency, uh, so probably the, the modeling of the efficiency from uh, the Monte Carlo, and also this comes from living free uh, lambda, the CP violation, the direct uh, contribution to CP violation. Here also there is a, a count-pt reweighting, so you reweight when you have a discrepancy between Monte Carlo and data distributions, things like this. There are no other pressing questions. I think we can thank Alexis again. And we have uh, Sandro Palestini who's going to talk to us about uh, the status and prospects of the Atlas experiment. So, good evening and thank you for the organizer for inviting me to talk about the Atlas experiment, in particular the uh, situation now, recent results uh, from, from run one, and then the detector upgrades for, uh, for run two, so the short term development, and then I will discuss a physics case for run two to show how the detector upgrades fit in uh, an example of physics study. So I will go first across a few of the recent results, uh, very recent from, from 2012 uh, data, run, uh, run one. So the first one is a search for the uh, 
XB, so the corresponding exotic uh, multi quark state uh, corresponding to the one in the charmonium. So we did a, we did a, sorry we did a search in uh, uh, upsilon pi pi. Here you see a mass plot uh, where the upsilon 2s and upsilon 1s are seen as peak, and uh, and you see here extraction of the same of the same curves done with the, with the full statistics. And by doing that, we have tried to, to search to place a limit on, uh, on the XB. And this is our results in terms of the limit. Here you see the p-value. P-value for the background only hypothesis in terms, uh, and then you have the significance in terms of the variable error, which is the ratio of the cross-section times branching ratio for this hypothetical state divided by the one observed for the upsilon 2s. So, uh, we have not seen evidence for, for these states. We placed a 95% upper limit. So you see we are at the level of a few percent in, uh, in the value R. The limit is compatible with expectation. You see to the right, uh, uh, this was done under the assumption of uh, no spin alignment for the uh, XB. If you vary, if you assume extreme hypothesis for fully longitudinal or fully transversal with uh, uh, the second coefficient plus one or minus one, you have this kind of range of systematic uncertainties, but as, as is done usually, we have placed this limit assuming no spin alignment. And actually the results is on most of the range is, is the most uh, competitive on these limits, but it's only an upper limit. Uh, the second result, which I'm going to discuss briefly, is a measurement of uh, charmonium uh, production, in particular the uh, Psi 2s uh, observed in the transition to J Psi plus Pi and Pi. This is, as usual, this is studied via the decay of J Psi into a muon pair. And we have done a measurement of this, of this cross section as a function of, uh, of Pt and of eta. And you find that uh, we distinguish prompt uh, production. We can separate from uh, using uh, the uh, secondary vertex, we can separate prompt and non prompt production. And this is the cross section for the prompt part. And for the non prompt, you will notice the offsets of uh, 110 to the 4 between the different uh, repeated regions. And this is consistent with the results obtained uh, and published before by CMS and LHCB at typically lower PT than the one uh, achieved by, by this study. Uh, next, uh, there is the observation of the excited BC state. So this was done uh, looking both uh, in uh, the 2011 and 2012 data, five and about 19 inverse femtobar of data, looking at the B sub C, which is first observed uh, in a transition B sub C to J psi pi in a displaced vertex, and then combining it with two pions, uh, softer pions, which are coming from the primary vertex. And we found evidence, uh, we are not measuring a cross-section, but we found evidence of, uh, of this state that is uh, a, a peak in the combination of the B sub C plus the two pions at a mass of uh, 6,842 MeV, with errors of four and five MeV for statistical and systematic, which would be compatible, which seems compatible with expectation for the first uh, excitation, the B sub C 2S state. Uh, next, uh, the most recent result, which, uh, which has been shown uh, at the workshop on, on, charmonium, uh, on quarconium at CERN a few weeks ago, and, uh, and this is going to be submitted very soon to a journal. This is a, a Z plus J Psi associated production. We already did one year ago, uh, well, with the data collected in 2011, a study of W plus J Psi associated production with five inverse Fentober. Now we did it uh, we, again, looking at uh, using uh, about 20 vice of 2012, and now looking at the association of the Z and the J psi. So the Z can decay both to mu plus mu minus and uh, electron and positron. J psi only to mu plus mu minus. This is better for, for our background. The trigger is the one on the Z. So this is not a classic B physics trigger for atoms, but it's, it's an APT trigger. And what we do is then to study the events in the invariant masses of the Z and of the J psi. And this is the example for the J psi producing coincidence with the, with the Z. And also to look at the pseudo proper time which is uh, an estimate uh, uh, of the decay time in, uh, uh, for the particle which, uh, uh, which produced the J psi if it is decay from, from the B meson. If you do the fit in two dimensions, you can separate the different components. So we can observe both 
prompt and non prompt associated production of uh, Z and J Psi. When you look at it, actually, I'm not going to show the uh, rapidity and PT dependence for, to be brief, but I will show this, which is, which is kind of interesting. If you look at the angular correlation, an azimuthal angle between the Z and the J Psi, then you find that most of the events are peaking at the uh, opposite uh, direction in Phi. <laughs> Because you could imagine that uh, your signal is, well, we'll have some background, which is uh, pile up, which is simply events in which the J Psi and the Z were produced uh, in two separate vertices, but that can be estimated with rather good accuracy, knowing, uh, having measured directly the cross sections for Z and, and the J Psi, and knowing the distribution of the, of the primary interactions. But then beyond that, we can imagine that part of this is not a, a real associated production, but it's a real event in which you have a multi uh, part on interaction. So that, uh, a priori, would be more likely to be not tolerated in phi. And actually, we can estimate uh, the effect, uh, because others did, uh, like others, but in particular, we used the measurement of Atlas, a study of double part of scattering in, in the production of Ws plus two jets. So uh, two scatterings in which one is the production of a W and the other one gives a jet jet event. And this is interesting because despite, uh, okay, this is a different regime, W plus jet jet is a somewhat higher PT than J psi plus, uh, plus Z from the point of view of the J psi, of course. But then the kind of uh, uh, double pattern scattering which we obtain if we take uh, an effective cross section for, uh, for double pattern scattering comes out to be consistent with what we see at large angle. This is just a hint that indeed our observation is consistent with both uh, uh, associated production, real vertices in which you have uh, J psi and W, which is interesting because it provides a ground for models of charmonium production, again, issues of comparing singlet and octet productions, with, uh, in a situation which is different from the usual one. I just have to add that while for single J psi production we, have, we are dominated by a factor about three, uh, by non prompt over prompt, when you go to, uh, sorry, here we are dominated by, by uh, uh, non-prompt. We have more events seen in non-prompt than you see in prompt for, for this production, which is the opposite of what you have when you have single j -Psi production. Now let me go to, to the detector upgrades, and I will discuss them in the next pages. They will affect uh, different parts of Atlas. The main one is the affecting the pixel detector. Then there are upgrades on the trigger. And then there are addition of uh, uh, muon chambers, which improve both the resolution and, uh, and uh, uh, some triggering capabilities. And then, uh, not exactly now, but in future, so now also an upgrade on the innermost station of the muon dead cap. So as I said, the most relevant is probably this one. The pixel detector has an additional layer, and this additional layer is much closer to the beam pipe than the previous one. So we move from the existing inner layer at about uh, 50 millimeters from the beam axis to one which is laying between 32 and 38 millimeters. So this will improve, us, uh, improve the performance of Atlas from different point of views. We have a fourth layer which will give more a better uh, tracking reconstruction, but in particular better parameters on, on the vertices, better impact parameter and, and resolutions and some improved uh, resolution at low PT in the regime of one to, to a few GB. So this detector has been installed and will be running, uh, commissioned and running uh, as we start uh, in, uh, in run two. Uh, next, uh, considering the triggers uh, using MB physics. Now in run one, most of our program has been made, like, like it was said before uh, for CMS, uh, based on uh, two muon triggers, in which there were selection on the transfer moment of the muons ranging uh, between uh, 4 and 6 GV. In addition, we could already ask in 2012 to have at least one of the muons in the barrel, which helps because in the barrel we have a better momentum resolution, and in the end cap we have a, a less uh, clean, less pure triggering, more background. 
Uh, we had already in 2012 some problem in triggering on this because uh, the trigger rate was too high. Typically, well, I'm quoting here some trigger rate at uh, 7 to 33, we had about 11 kilohertz of the two 4 GV, GV, 4 GV and 4 GV trigger and 3 kilohertz for the 6 GV times 6 GV. It was already uh, too high in the last part of the run to be operated without rescaling, so we had some prescaling of this trigger, a minor prescaling of the triggers with 4 GV and 6 GV, or the 4 GV and 4 GV and one muon in the barrel. So data were collected in that way. Uh, additionally, the way the trigger of Atlas works is that we have uh, an high-level trigger in which we have an offline-like reconstruction which is done on two stages. On the first one, only a fraction of the detector, a few percent of the detectors of inner detector in the regions which are identified by the triggering muons are red and are analyzed for uh, tracking reconstruction, fitting tracks and confirming the presence of, uh, of, uh, of the muon candidate. And then at the second stage, we have a full readout of the event, which, which does the reconstruction again nearly, nearly uh, offline quality. Uh, in 2012, also, we had uh, uh, the possibility to not to do immediate processing of uh, JPSI based triggers, but to delay the stream, which will be less easy to do when we have a run of several years. And uh, now let me go to the improvement which we will have, which we are preparing for the run two. In particular, at the level of uh, the hardware trigger, so the, the basic one, we will have uh, additional information, not just the number of muons and their threshold, but also information about the opening angles between the two muons, the topological trigger. This topological, uh, this angular information can also be combined uh, with the information on the momentum uh, thresholds, which these muons do pass, 4, 6, or 10 GV. So we can have an approximate uh, estimate uh, in, in two uh, microseconds of the invariant mass of the two muons. And uh, this has been tested, has been studied. Well, we are developing a study on this uh, on some reference channels, BS to JPSI 5, B0 to mu plus, mu minus, BD to K star mu plus, mu minus, and Upsilon studies. And here you see an example of a preliminary. This is a study to see uh, indeed to tune these triggers, which shows that if you indeed use a combination, an intelligent combination of opening angle between the two muons and information of the, on the threshold, you can have a discrimination curve efficiencies versus rejection of background, which is much better than what you would do with different, simpler uh, topologies or thresholds which, which were available or not even available in run one. Another, another part, another improvement, which uh, now involves the high level trigger in its early part. So, uh, not when uh, in the past we were reading only. Uh, some percent of the inner detector corresponding about one percent uh, for each trigger in muons. Now the fraction of uh, data which will be available for fast uh, pattern will be increased by a, a fast tracking trigger, which is uh, a, an hardware-based processing of information. And, uh, and this, uh, until now, it has not been applied so much to be physical application, but tagging has been considered for that. This will be further discussed, I think, tomorrow by, by Alex in uh, long-term developments. Uh, next, uh, other uh, improvements which we have for round two. So we will have better, uh, more pure trigger in the end cap by including uh, another layer of chambers which uh, provide two-dimensional information but were not included at the time in the first station of the, of the end cap, the thing gap chambers. We have completed uh, in the transition region, eta between 1 and 1.4, the transition between the barrel and the end cap. We have completed the, the muon system with the third layer of, of chambers, which have been delayed for cost reasons. So we will improve the resolution over there. And also we are filling several percent of uh, gaps in the acceptance in the barrel uh, trigger because we had holes uh, related to supports and access paths to the barrel. So these things are being improved now. The new small wheel is the major upgrade of the detector which will happen uh, not now, it will be in, installed in 2018-2019. Uh, this will uh, increase significantly the resolution which we have uh, on the inner station and this will be used, uh, well, it will be used uh, off in uh, high level trigger uh, very soon, as soon as it is installed. In the future, it might be used in level one, but I'm not going to, to discuss these very long-term improvements. 
so now let me let me make the case of uh, how well these things uh, do work for some physics study. So I take the example of bs 2 psi Now I apologize because I took the HFAG average from spring 2004, so this is not as recent as the one showed by, by Gaia. And also, also I think, well, for CMS at least, uh, uh, we put on the CMS and we said it's not in the average, but LHCB now is uh, somewhat slightly smaller and somewhat displaced uh, uh, curve there. But the point is that, uh, well, as you well know, uh, the experiments, several experiments have been working on this, uh, and uh, the uh, Comparing uh, uh, the observation with the standard model prediction is still very difficult because the standard model predicts a very small angle, and so <coughs> there is a path in that direction. So what I want to discuss is really uh, how are we going to do for this analysis with the upgrade which is available for run two. So the sensitivity is really driven by the measurement of the fast oscillation. You can measure the CP violating phase uh, uh, phi s without, uh, without, with an integrated, with uh, not tagged analysis, but you are much less sensitive. So you, you rely on your final results, on your best results, on tagging power, and also on decay time resolution. So the tagging power, while I write it in the simplest way you could write it, you normally don't write it when we do our analysis now, that is at the level of some percent, about 1.5 for, uh, for Atlas. But then what I want to point out, uh, which is not mentioned too often, but it is the decay time resolution. So a fast oscillation is going to be reduced in amplitude by a limited uh, resolution in the decay time. So actually, if you, if you want to just make a rough estimate, but it's not so rough, if you have a fast oscillation and you, uh, uh, you consider it as measured with a device which has a resolution of sigma, so you do a convolution of the fast oscillation with the Gaussian response, what you find out is that still you will have your oscillation, but you have the amplitude reduced by this coefficient, so which is related to the frequency times the resolution squared uh, exponential. So now what we have uh, in our situation, in the BS oscillates fast, so the frequency is uh, the mass variation uh, between the two eigenstates of the BS, which is about 18 picoseconds to the minus one. And currently the resolution which Atlas uh, uses, I think CMS is close to that, is about 0.1 picoseconds, which is uh, not as good as the one of LHCB, which has been designed for this kind of measurement. So our, uh, if you look at uh, at this term, which, which I wrote before, for us it's about 0.2, and it's as large as maybe point, about 0.8 for LHCB. So any improvement in this resolution is going to be very valuable because it will increase uh, this, this amplitude. So effectively, if you do an improvement uh, in, uh, in this quantity, it's like making uh, a large improvement in, in, uh, in statistics. It's, it's kind of one is the square of the other is effect. So what we have here is a simulation of the IBL of the performance in terms of, uh, of resolution in proper decay time, which we have now. And what we have here is with the IBL. I don't want to discuss it. We discuss tomorrow by Alex uh, also with an improved long-term tracking. And you see here the distribution of this, uh, of, uh, this error, which now it's peaked at about uh, uh, 0.90 femtoseconds, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, it is moved now the peak to something below, below 0.04 picoseconds, which is quite good. So effectively, if you improve by 25% sigma uh, t, you get something like a factor of, of 2 in, in the sensitivity, which is quite important. Now here are quoting results which are not the most recent. This is uh, something which was already uh, made public about one year ago. So this is uh, our resolution now for 2011 only data with a statistical error of 0.25. Systematic error is only 20% of that. This was at that time the prediction of what we would get from 2012. This is from Toy Monte Carlo. This is not from real data and from the improved analysis, which should be complete. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have it today. It should be available by the winter conferences. And as you go ahead, things do get better, although the improvement must be, is going to be mitigated by maybe the necessity to, to have less events because of uh, trigger threshold. So this is based originally on uh, 4 and 4 GV of transfer momentum thresholds. 2012 could not use full 4 and 4, but uh, at least a cool 4 and 6 was used. For the future here we are assuming higher thresholds. 
and then uh, the improvement is, is not as violent, it's not as good as uh, something which approaches a factor of two. On the other hand, uh, I must say that this, these uh, projections here were made without uh, in considering effects of the new topological trigger or of the FTK trigger. So there is still some margin to, to do better on that. So uh, these are my conclusions. So we have uh, a detector upgrade in the physical agenda of Atlas, which within, with some limits, within some limits, take into account uh, our interest uh, and the relevance of working on B physics. The main improvement uh, have to do with the detector itself on the innermost new innermost layer of the pixel, and, uh, and then also on uh, better flexibility, a better level one trigger in particular. We still have to see if we can do something uh, concerning the overall data flow, which was, which was a limit which was overcome with the delayed uh, stream of part of the physics triggers in 2012. That has to be still seen how much of that bottleneck that will be. And I have illustrated a specific case, which is the one which I, which I picked because it's the one uh, which is more closely related to the improvement of the hardware. So, thank you. Yeah, you, you have shown a very nice improvement in the property, in the decay time resolution of the B meson by more than a factor two that you are expecting thanks to the inner B layer during run two. Uh, do you also have uh, expected uh, performance during run two concerning the flavor tagging? Uh, are you expecting that this will remain the same performance or? Oh, well, uh, flavor tagging. We are working on that, and, uh, and I expect to have some improvements on what we are going to publish soon in 2012. To go, to go beyond that, uh, well, uh, flavor tagging in this moment, uh, it's not so much based on the reconstruction of, of the secondary vertices for us. So the, the, the improvement will not be so direct, I'm afraid. But this is really lacking, lacking, uh, lacking much studies about it. Could you maintain the current performance, or you do expect that to be Ah, no, I, I, don't think, I don't think we should have much worry about degrades. We have done, study, for instance, the studies which I showed, uh, these kind of studies on, on, uh, on, uh, on the resolution, these were done with, uh, with uh, increasing the number of uh, primary interactions per batch crossing. So we still are expecting to be rather stable comparing to, to the multiplicity of the primary vertices. You mentioned the um, improvement in level one muon trigger in the next uh, future about uh, having available the angle between the muons, right? So be able to evaluate the rough mass. I thought that the, when you said that, that this was coming from uh, measuring tracks, maybe it's not that. Uh, if it's not that, why it's not available already? What changes? Why you have the angle in the future you don't have it now? Just oh, well, some more detail how it's done. Uh, it's, first of all, it's not uh, using track. It will be at the level of high-level trigger with FTK, which is not the main thing I, I, I talked about. The level one, which is using the information on uh, on uh, this kind of information, the the region of interest direction, which is which is a kind of bind measurement. This was in principle available, but we did not have a central process of, well, okay, but we did not have a central process of which would take this input and, and come out with, uh, with the trigger of that. We had just something which would. So it's not an hardware change, that's what I say. Well, it's an hardware change or on, a, on, a, on a trigger combination, trigger logic unit, but not, not on the detector. Okay. I just wanted to add to what, what was asked before. Flavor we actually studied also the, the extrapolation of flavor tagging at higher pileup, and we do not see a significant degradation in performance as far as we did the extrapolation. So that should be reasonably safe. It's, it's, of course, it's only muon tagging. Um, do, do you also have an estimate on the improvement uh, on uh, BSB mu, for example? Well, the BS2 mu will have some improvements in the sense that uh, we do in, at the uh, offline selection, we use some information on vertexing. So, for instance, the collinearity between vertex displacement uh, and, and momentum direction will be improved. 
Uh, now I don't think, uh, I would not, we have not done an accurate study on that. I don't think we are talking about something like uh, a factor of two signal to noise just because of that. But there will be an improvement uh, at that level. Uh, we will have uh, a better resolution in, the, the, in measuring uh, the, the um, not by factor of two, I suppose, in measuring the, the, in the, the, the position of the secondary vertex with respect to the direction of the, of the pointing angle. And then we'll have also some improvements, like for instance, you now reject uh, events in which you have a track from, uh, from another, uh, an additional track which goes by your mu plus mu minus candidate. Of course, we are going to improve over there. I, I do not have a number for that. I, I'm sure it will be improved proved, uh, but I do not have uh, a clear number at this moment. Any other questions? If not, we can thank our speaker again. <laughs> and we invite Augusto Cecucci, who is going to talk to us about Keon experiments. Si, si. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's great to be at the Scuola Normale. And I guess I go straight to the desperate questions of uh, Professor Nakada. Why do we have three families of leptons and quarks? Or uh, uh, why there are two mass matrices, uh, why they are as they are? I guess I turn these questions to Professor Barbieri here, and I move on with the chaos. So let me start with the chaos. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so let me start with the chaos. I mean, impossible in 30 minutes. Uh, when the time is up, you tell me and I stop. So uh, chaos leptonic decays. Let's start from that. It's the nice and simple decay where we can learn a lot. And uh, I stress the important uh, interplay that during the past few years there has been between the theory, lattice QCD calculations with the determination of decay constants, and also the experiments, of course. Uh, that's important for various reasons. One obvious reason is to fix one of these CKM parameters, actually the uh, Kabibo angle, the VUS, and then we can use leptonic and semi-leptonic decays. Now, this is the formula for the same leptonics. You have seen the leptonic before. Again, there's, there's input from the theory, so the form factor, uh, various breaking and long distance, uh, as it's been breaking effects and long distance effects. But there's a lot of uh, important input from the experiments, form factors, rates, branching rate, lifetimes, etc. Now, uh, as I said before, there has been a kind of a revolution during the past few, uh, in the last decade or so, and mostly, but not, uh, not only, because of the round of experiments designed to measure epsilon prime over epsilon. So therefore, superior detectors usually lead to uh, significant improvement also on uh, things for which those experiments were not necessarily designed. So you can see that there were big jumps comparing PDGs between uh, 04 and 08, and then uh, things uh, somewhat settled down. There were changes on major branching ratios, like 5% uh, branching ratios of 5%. So you know, when you say that chaos physics is absolutely clean because the normalization is very precise, well, you have to be careful because there were some normalization modes which were uh, wrong by some 5% or so. So one has always to have... Uh, critical uh, view. Now, these tests, you can make uh, different tests, and one of the obvious tests you do, once you measure VUS very precisely, together with VUD very precisely, as was mentioned this, this morning, is to check the unitarity of the 2 times 2 uh, uh, metrics. Now, it's, uh, it's a very nice test. These tests are important because, in, for instance, when you check this, you're checking, basically, that the electroweak corrections that you apply are, you know, are, are good, to, otherwise they would be off by 40 sigma or something like that, as Bill Marciano usually says. Now, altogether, if you put all this together, you have a nice correlation. You put uh, VUD, you put VUS. There are different ways of determining the things with different correlations. You use uh, leptonic and semi-leptonic. And overall, you, you use a QCD. So it's a nice interplay of nuclear particle physics and theory. It's uh, somewhere where we have progressed a lot during the past years. And uh, we expect further progress uh, from CLOI2, among others in the upcoming years, because uh, uh, the new experiment 
uh, taking data at Frascati, and there's a lot of expectation. It would be nice to arrive to uh, the 0.1% type of overall uncertainty in the US. We are not there, uh, but uh, it can be a plausible gain. Now, uh, as a, you can turn it around, of course. Uh, you have a, a formula with leptonics. You decide uh, you trust the lattice QCD and you extract uh, VUS, or vice versa. You don't trust lattice QCD and you take the ratio between electrons and muons modes, and you can make uh, tests of, unitari uh, of uh, universality in the lepton sectors. Uh, it's not the same RK as the RK which was measured in V physics. Still, it's an uh, interesting uh, object because uh, the ratio is very well defined in the standard model. And uh, now, as you can see, there's been progress a lot. Uh, Chloe, uh, NA62 with the, f uh, with the first phase of the experiment a few years ago. And then you see that uh, one is addressing now half a percent, uh, even better, time res uh, resolution, uh, relative resolution. And uh, one should try, but one should try to do significantly better because uh, um, at the level of the standard model, the precision is at the Promille or so. So it's something that uh, can put some constraints in some, uh, uh, in some aspects. And uh, it's an important measurement that can be pursued, continued in the future. Let me now uh, to move from uh, leptonic, semi-leptonics to hadronic K-on decays. Uh, a K-on talk uh, uh, cannot be given without referring to epsilon and epsilon prime. Those are the parameters describing CP violation in the, in the K-on sector. Now, they, if you look at them in terms of quantities in the standard model, they look ra rather complicated and you have combinations of different parameters, loop functions, etc. The experimental determination of epsilon is very good. The experimental determination of epsilon prime is reasonably good, but there the situation, how to extract fundamental physics from it, apart from a, a quali qualitative uh, uh, statement about the existence of direct CP violation, is complicated by cancellations. So uh, now significant uh, progress has been witnessed concerning again the lattice and so the bag parameter that allows to use epsilon as a constraint, a strong constraint in the fits of uh, unitarity. And uh, uh, so that has been a significant progress in the, in the past few years. And then uh, uh, one finds out at times that small, relatively small, at the level of several percent of things that you have to take into account are often forgotten here and there, and this is an example so, um, uh, about uh, uh, an ex an, a piece which was not taken into account. Now, uh, to my satisfaction, having invested many years of my life measuring epsilon prime or the epsilon, apparently you can use it to extract a, a piece to correct epsilon. So it's a step forward towards the use of a quantitative use of epsilon prime over epsilon. Uh, Overall, uh, uh, epsilon k, there's some tension when you make the fits to the triangle. And uh, we should not forget that when we use quantities from kaons, uh, we, uh, and we, we, we have to go and we move on a triangle, which is the B, uh, D triangle, the unitarity triangle, then of course uh, you are buying other uncertainties like uh, V, uh, C, B, etc. So of course it depends you know, in which frame you are testing things. So we should always consider that eventually it doesn't matter where the error is. What really at the end counts is when you put everything together. Now, concerning epsilon prime, uh, also there, the lattice is making significant uh, progress. And uh, uh, without going into details, uh, I am told that uh, uh, we should wait a bit longer. And the theory may be one day can predict uh, that quantity precisely. That would be great, because in that quantity, there's a lot of information uh, concerning possible new physics, for instance. Let me now move to the. Uh, let me now move to the rare K-on decays. Uh, as said before, you can recast the unitarity triangle and reconstruct it using purely uh, K-on quantities. And one example is given here where you have uh, the height, of the heights of the unitarity triangle can be measured using K0 long to pi 0 on unibar, the rate of that uh, uh, reaction. Uh, you can also use uh, uh, Pi zero, lepton, anti-lepton, uh, either electrons or, or, uh, or muons, but then you are buying long distance effects, which in the case of the pi zero new new bar are not there. Uh, 
concerning the side, you can use K plus to pi plus neutrino, antineutrino, and then uh, also inputs can be obtained from other decays. Uh, now, there's a kind of, a, when, you, when you embark into this, you have to be honest, and then ag agree that you have to decide what you want to do. And in a sense, uh, on the one side, when you measure uh, K to pi nu nu bar, quantities, on the one side you can make a significant test of the standard model, extracting, assuming the standard model and nothing else, and extracting its parameters, uh, of course then you assume there's no new physics, because new physics may affect the loops, and these determinations from the chaos are via loops. Or conversely, you, or, yeah, you can explore the structure of new physics, just taking the standard model as it is, and use these instruments, like a, a rare chaos decays, in order to explore the new physics with different sensitivities uh, with respect to the direct searches and uh, uh, f flavor oscillations and rare decays, they are all uh, slightly different sensitivities. Uh, this was uh, picked up by Gaia this morning. It's, it's, it's an important, uh, I want to stress that uh, uh, no matter what you do, eventually you need the parametri parametric uncertainty of the CKM to be uh, well defined so that you can then you can extend significantly the range uh, that some of these rare decays uh, can offer you. So for instance, in this case, if you would arrive to something like a 1% CKM parametric uncertainty, you would really go and probe, at least with DK0 long to Poisson Univar, 10 TV or so under some hypothesis. Now examples are a lot, there are a lot of examples of how new physics may um, affect uh, this rare decays. I certainly will not delve into the details, but it's, uh, comparatively speaking, uh, you have sensitivities that in some cases may uh, be comparable or even superior to other well-known rare decays. Uh, of course, uh, under some hypothesis, uh, and you need a lawyer in order, on, on your side to uh, make sure you really understand what the theorists have assumed in these papers, so I will not delve into that, but uh, not being a lawyer, uh, but in a sense, uh, the, the main point is that uh, if you look at the very wide and broad experimental window that still exists in this type of decays, under some cases you, have, uh, you can really achieve sensitivity to rather large uh, scales. Uh, this is yet another effect, so basically there's still room for visible new physics effect in uh, flavor change in neutral current scale physics, in spite of all the uh, stringent high energy and high intensity constraints. Now let me uh, review with you the situation concerning K to pi nu bar, as you can see, and as a comparison we put her here the star of level, one of the stars of flavor physics for comparison. And basically you see the theory is, is good, uh, a large fraction of this error, which is less than 10% is of parametric origin. The experiment offers you a large window of opportunity, something like 60% error here, and uh, here you have uh, even uh, uh, the, you know, uh, order of magnitudes away in the case of the K0 law. Uh, as I said before, with chaos, you have to make sure you choose the right, if, if you want to do something standalone, if you think you can have enough observables from the chaos themselves, then you should make a good choice of uh, how to normalize the things. And uh, what is nice, for instance, is that you know, uh, all, all the unitarity triangles, we all know this, is they are born equal. But uh, uh, they all have the same measure of CP violation, which is the Yaskov invariant JCP. Now, one nice feature of pi zero nu, nu nu bar is that if you measure it precisely and you take the square root of the branch relation, that basically gives you automatically, apart from a, a, a numerical factor, JCP. And uh, this is basically free from a theoretical error, I am told. One, two percent. And if you compare the determination of JCP when you make the fits to the parameter, you can find several different errors from 3 to 7% depending on the treatment of the error. So a standalone measurement of this quantity, in my humble opinion, would certainly be uh, justified. Now, why is so good K0 long to pi 0 nu nu bar? The experts all know it, but maybe I can perhaps remind all of us once more uh, basically, once you neglect the small mixing, CP violation from the mixing in the K0 alone, so epsilon K, 
the KL becomes a, a CP eigenstate, yeah? and uh, you can basically write it in terms of K0 minus K0 bar. So what you're actually doing here, all the parts which are uh, related to the charm component, they drop out in the difference of the amplitudes, and that's why um, the uh, pi zero nu nu bar is really sensitive to the short distance loop, the top loop in the, in the standard model. Now the main uh, background is k zero long to pi zero pi zero, but uh, at least, uh, okay, it's a difficult measurement, as you can see, nothing in, nothing out, but at least this is suppressed by CP conservation, and that's not the case for the k plus. And then, uh, of course, you, you have a long lifetime of the k zero long, it makes interesting. Uh, uh, may, it makes the interesting partial bits measurable. So, so concerning uh, the numerology, you can see here, numerology for the branching ratio of k0 long to pi0 nu nu bar. The bottom line is that uh, uh, you get here, uh, this is, uh, we don't need to go through the details, but the point is that the experiment is far away. The best measurement comes from the uh, E391A KK experiment, less than 2.6 and to minus 8. And then the next experiment in line is called Koto and is at the J Park. Uh, J Park, the Koto experiment is shown here. This is the J Park complex. And the slides I have taken, they are courtesy of uh, Koji Shiomi, presented at CKM 2014. Uh, as you can see, again, the Epsilon Prime theme comes back because uh, one of the major upgrades of the Japanese experiment is the use of the cesium iodide, pure cesium iodide from the KTEV experiment. It went across the Pacific Ocean and is now being used in, uh, in J-PAR. Uh, they had, uh, and then the vacuum tank is the, is the one that you can see here from the previous experiment. And uh, they have actually put out, as a preliminary result, a uh, result based on 100 hours of uh, of running in 2013, and uh, the uh, um, single event sensitivity is slightly worse, but it's almost as good as the previous experiment uh, with such a short uh, run. Now they expect something uh, no, being nominal, whatever it really means, intensity sometimes in 2017. Uh, th th this short run was taken with something like 10% of the nominal intensity. The, oh, sorry. Uh, let, me, let me just stress one aspect of this uh, exper experiment. And the experiment, when you embark in something where you have um, very small branching ratios and you have to make crude cuts, very strong cuts in order to get down 10 to the 10 or more order of magnitudes, you better make your, your calculations of the efficiency and acceptance correct because you may otherwise be short, come up short by a large amount. It, just to give you an idea of uh, uh, if, if, if important, very important aspect of the experiment is the way you have to suppress the extra photons. If you want to kill pi zero, pi zero with four photons, yeah, you have to veto the two extra photons with respect to the signal. Now you see that when you do that game using the k zero long to three pi zero, six photons, and you apply the cut in order to kill the three pi zero, you see that your nice statistics of uh, pi zero, pi zero, the CP violating signal, which is the background of what you actually want to measure in the red decay, drops down by almost a factor of 10. So it means these cuts, in order to have a, 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 a valuable signal of a background, already you are losing a factor of 10 in this particular example. Uh, I just pick it up from the public slides, so I mean, it's, it must be obvious. Uh, let me now move to K plus to pi plus neutrino T neutrino. There the situation is a bit more complex as far as the theory is concerned because you have this piece which is the contribution from the charm. Uh, again, you have uh, normalizing, you have to go through the normalization using uh, isospin rotated uh, K plus to pi zero in U. So hopefully isospin breaking is not too much affecting what you're doing here. Uh, if you plug in the numbers, I have taken the formulas from Buras, and then I plug in my numbers, you see uh, you can write down the expectation in different pieces, and there's a piece here in the branching ratio that is basically the interference of the top and the charm, and that's linear. There's no square root that really helps you a lot. So it means that if this charm piece could still be improved, and if the parametric error on BTD can be improved, so much the better for the overall sensitivity that the, that the measurement can provide. Uh, now, when you talk about uh, K-on beams, that applies only to charged beams because uh, 
there's no way you can really stop uh, a K-long. You, you can make it with a well-known momentum, like at the Phi factory, but you cannot really stop it and then observe it. So basically, there are two techniques. One is with stopped beams, and the other is in flight decays. So far, uh, experimentation for K plus to pi plus universe has been done with stop beams and argon, the Bevatron, KK, AGS. And then we have now an in flight technique at the uh, CERN S S SPS with an unseparated beam, which means we have to deal with many unwanted particles like pions and protons that you cannot get rid of before your beam enters the decay volume. Now, advantages of a stop technique is uh, you work directly in the KM frame. Uh, you have a high k on purity, and you have compact detectors. And the advantages for the in-flight is that the k's are in vacuum. There's no scattering and no interaction in the target. Uh, you can have uh, RF-separated beam, a somewhat low momenta, or unseparated beams, uh, which means lots of rate available per proton at high momenta, and then requires extended decay region. So experiments are not tabletop, are not very small. This is the state of the art, as you can see. Uh, there are a few candidates, and uh, from these uh, few candidates, from uh, the Brookhaven experiment, they published uh, a value, which is uh, a mean value is about two times the standard model, but the error is admittedly very large. Uh, let me move to the, how much time do we still have? Five minutes? Six. Six minutes, okay. So I flash you a few slides to tell you where an A62 is. As a collaboration, uh, this is well done. It's done at the SPS. If you wish, it's at the heart of the of the LHC, very close to the center of the LHC. There, uh, of course, if you uh, the technique is is listed here. There's calorimetry to veto extra particles. Very light trackers to reconstruct the K plus before it enters the decay region and the pi plus and full particle identification. One expects. Uh, 40 to 50 events in a good SPS year with a background of less than 20%. And this is the situation a few weeks actually before starting data taking for commissioning. That was in October. You see the last element being lowered down here, a straw tracker, and lots and lots of uh, hectic activity here. Then commissioning has uh, been going on. It will com be completed. Uh, the beam stops on December 15th. And Currently, the experiment, uh, well, not today because there's no beam, but otherwise it writes something like 9 terabytes per day of data. Uh, you see here a list of the detectors. You see now uh, various stations. These are all calorimeters, lead glass calorimeters, in order to uh, capture all photons that would otherwise go outside. Uh, you see here more calorimeters. You see a dipole magnet. You see a ring image in Cherenkov counter. It's not a small experiment, as you can see. It's about 270 meters long. You see now it's much cleaner. That provides immediately more ideas for the future because things have been taken, uh, taken out from here. Uh, you see here the, the, the reach again. You see another station. You see the Krypton calorimeter uh, from the uh, NA48 experiment. You see here the differential Cherenkov counters. That's the online display. This is a timing signal. It gives you a resolution per heat of 280 picoseconds. You see you can clearly distinguish chaos from other particles, which is very nice, so that you can tag the chaos entering the decay tank. Uh, it's a very hot beam, so it needs a very good uh, beam tracker. We call it Giga Tracker because it's 10 to the 9 particles per second. You see a station before the installation. You see a station here just after the installation in the beam. Uh, the, the main thing is that this is a very, very special development with a pixel, silicon pixel with a, a readout with a 70 picosecond time resolution. And then you have to, you put something in the beam, you have to veto everything that goes interacting in that beam. You have nice detectors just downstream of the last silicon pixel to veto these things. You see happy people here, they have delivered the last station of the photon vetoes. And you see the Krypton uh, readout has been completely redone. Uh, it's a massive system of 14,000 flash ADCs. You see here the energy reconstructed up to the beam intensity, some um, uh, population. You see just for your eyes uh, some k on decays reconstructed uh, and then missing mass distributions. Uh, the straw spectrometer has been fully installed. This is uh, operated in vacuum in order to have the least amount of interaction between the particles and the detector, because air or even helium would be too much for what you're trying to do. 
You see here the stations before the installation. You see all the electronics. You see a drift time distribution, and they give you an idea about the, the profiles in w one of the chambers. So this was, as you can imagine, a big, big uh, uh, effort in order to be ready for the run. You see the uh, the reach, the ring image in Cherokee Counter, the mirror, uh, mosaic, the f fly eyes with the photo tubes, the light beam pipe, the big tank, front end electronics the population of these fly eyes and again a few rings from K on decays in the ring image in Cherenkov counter which is coming along nicely. Uh, the resolution is at the level of 100 picoseconds. We have muon detectors installed, a fancy data acquisition system. All right, so what is uh, uh, NA62 trying to achieve? Well, first of all, commissioning the baseline detector, almost all of it, and then uh, we are at CERN again uh, addressing uh, uh, K-on physics after a few years, and the plan is uh, NA62 should accumulate and analyze something like 10 to the 13 good K-on decays before the long shutdown too. Now, that brings me automatically in the last minus 10 seconds to future. Uh, okay, this is, uh, we're very happy because uh, if you use the LHC, somebody has to inject into the LHC, that's the SPS. If you run the SPS to inject in the LHC, you can as well use it for the rest of the time doing some other science, which is what we are doing. And uh, uh, of course, in the future, apart from reducing the error, well, getting there first and then hopefully reducing the error farther on K pi and K plus, one would like really to measure this ratio. Uh, so that you know you can compare kaons and bees. Uh, this is a very nice re relation in the standard model. And uh, it's time to look forward. Some of the people are looking into those possibilities given the time scale of 10 years from now. And that leads to me to my final uh, con con uh, slide is to say that uh, we certainly have a lot of things together to put together, theory, experiments, uh, accelerators, and in 10 years from now we will be at the crossroads. And with this I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, do we have questions for Augusto? Just on your previous slide, you, you have this nice relation between the uh, before, yeah, between the, the decay with uh, K long and K short to pi nu nu, and uh, beta and beta s. Do we have some numerical estimate of the sensitivity you, you could you could yeah. achieve with that? Yeah, the, 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 well, you know, the, the, the point is is really li the limiting factor in this. Assuming that an A62 works as expected and maybe a bit better, hopefully, so that we are already not 10 years from now. Uh, then the limitation will most likely be given purely from the statistics of K0 long to pi nu nu bar. And that really depends on the figure of merit of signal of a background that you can achieve. And that requires a detailed work that I, that I have not done. Thank you. Awesome. So what, what's your take on uh, this uh, possibility to measure the neutral mode at CERN? I mean, there is work going uh, I, on there. Yeah, I think there's. A, it's 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 a good question. The the point is very simple. Uh, if you look at it, uh, the, is um, there are different ways of addressing it, and the the problem is uh, that if you do this way, you most likely are not limited by backgrounds from K on the case. This is a kind of a low energy approach. So you have a neutral beam, and the neutral beam is mostly neutrons. And these neutrons are nasty because they, in, they interact, they bounce around. This is a kind of a low energy neutrons. Now, some study indicates that you have a, a power law. And so if you go to higher uh, k momentum, you get a significantly better signal over background. The problem is that as, long as, as soon as you go to bigger k momentum, then you get the experiments that are huge experiments because you have to collect a, a sizable amount of decays. So to me, uh, this is, there was, of course, a different way, which is uh, to use, uh, um, you need a lot, of, a lot of protons. If you had a lot of protons, like for instance, an, uh, all the protons of the SPS or, or all the protons of the proton synchrotron at CERN, and then if you have some friends in the accelerator system that gives you a bunch of beam, uh, maybe you could use ideas of, uh, of what uh, experiment proposal called uh, uh, Copio had a few years ago. 
But again, I mean, there are two, two, two ways. First is close the gap from here to the standard model. And then, if, if you still have stamina and if you are successful, perhaps you might address the precision measurement of the angle. I have discussed uh, mostly uh, K plus and K long to pi zero, pi plus, uh, neutrino, anti neutrino. So the challenge is, I think, if you thought about you measure both these two with their difficulties, with their problems, or instead K long to pi zero plus and minus mu anti muon. Advantage or disadvantage? Yeah, advantage or disadvantage. The, the pi zero EE, pi zero mu mu, is a nice clean signature, but you have irreducible backgrounds. Those are the radiative backgrounds. And in order to address the radiative backgrounds, you, you have to use either the interference as a function of time to, in order to uh, acquire sensitivity, you, have, you do KS, KL interference. But that immediately brings you outside of the light cone in a sense of the statistics you have to acquire. You would need something like 10 to the 15 decays. So there you should scratch your head and maybe have a, a new proton machine, uh, but very, very high intensity. Nonetheless, to arrive at the level of maybe, maybe for in order to close the gap up to the standard model, that's probably the only way to do it, given a finite amount of time. Because after all, do I understand correctly that if you do one machine, for instance, the FCCP, how it's called, maybe you can do both. Il uh, electron and muon, uh, uh, you get both at the same time. You, I don't know if you can do K plus and K long pi zero neutrino anti neutrino. Well, that's right. I mean, you, you're absolutely right. I mean, if you take uh, this experiment and you switch the beam from K plus to K zero, you are automatically getting, apart minor adjustment, a, a pi zero plus minus, a pi zero mu plus mu minus experiment. The problem is that. You will, will, you will run out of protons before you, your life, huh? unless, you have a new, uh, unless you have a new, new tricks that are not there. Yeah. So it's nice to close the gap, but also you have to redo the KS and things. But if there's a big effect, uh, which is not, if there's a big effect like a factor of two, maybe, yes, that's, that's uh, if you're telling me there's a big effect then, don't tell anybody. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions for Augusto? No, I guess we can think again. Thank, Thank you. you.